Hi, good morning. Hey. So, uh, five minutes are left, right? We got, so yeah. let's see. No, no, five minutes. Okay. We got five minutes? Well, it's almost, it's 11.40. And his talk starts at 11.45. Oh, shit, man. I Talk about East Coast, what, like West Coast time. I totally was wrong on my math. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're like, yeah, we just got like three hours. Meryl and I are going to sit here and BS until the talks start. <laughs> That's what it felt like. <laughs> that would be fun. What do you mean, Wade? You don't know how to use GIFs? When I did a Giphy, it, it doesn't play it. It was bullshit. <laughs> I don't see where you tried. I deleted sounds it because like, I didn't want to show my failure. Gosh. Sounds like someone just hasn't tried. I tried. Someone's not comfortable with failure, kid. Oh, I've, because I failed too much. <laughs> like I failed, it's not in public, out loud, where people can see me. I don't like to be uh, reminded of my failures. Yeah. <laughs> you know uh, what? I failed the sec plus the first time. Turns out one week isn't enough, but two weeks is like, I passed it the second time a week later. So one week, gosh. not quite enough time, but two weeks passable. I'm gonna blame Kenny. Definitely Kenny's fault. Doc, Doc, I'm gonna make you presenter right now. Are you okay with that? Yeah, cool. I'll try All right. All All right, you've been granted access to presenter. Uh, is my screen visible? Oh my God, you're doing it among, I literally just said that, that is hilarious. Oh my <gasps> God. <laughs> it's inception. We have uh, inception going on over here. So we got three minutes till we start, and uh, Meryl and I shut up. <laughs> no, that's a joke. Well, I never shut up. I'm just going to go on mute so you guys can't hear me annoying Wade in the background. And when we come back, Wade is going to be pulling his hair out. He's going to be like, get her off my track. <laughs> oh, my God. You know what my sister did the other day? She totally pointed out that I have an umbrage laugh. She's like, Meryl, you totally do like that mouthless, like, umbrage giggle. And I was like, oh. Oh, that's how horrible. I, what a horrible thing to say to somebody. Like, that's a horrible thing to say to me. I told my mom, and she was like, well, she's a mudblood. And I was like, ha, oh. ha. <laughs> Man, just pulling out all the Harry Potter curses. Shots fired at the Vernon nerd herd. If you do a uh, vata cadabra to my dog, my dog will die. He'll, <gasps> he'll play dead, yeah. Like, play dead? That's awesome. I saw one of those memes that was like, name a movie that would be really short if everything had happened like the way it was supposed to. And mm -hmm. it's like movie number one where Hermione's going to fix his glasses on the train and she goes, I only really know a few simple spells myself. Uh, Kavada Kadabra <laughs> and the credits roll. <laughs> That's the end. And it was so stupid. It's not that funny, but it's really funny to me. <clears throat> Palpatine laugh, but you're absolutely right. That would be way, oh, that would be, or it even just looked like Palpatine. After Revenge of the Sith, not before. After? Right. Ew. Yeah, that's worse. All right, you ready to shut down cameras? Darthok, you can uh, start whenever. Oh, there we go. It's all you, man. Uh, should I start? Uh, we're one minute early, but we might, we can, it's up to you. We're uh, just preparing. You're uh, currently at full screen. If you want to turn your camera on or not, it's up to you. But uh, 8.44, I think one minute early is fine, so go for it. Thanks. Uh, so, hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, today, I'll be presenting on the topic, Among Us, the Zero Trust Model, 
and we will be discussing about the impostures that stay between our network and hide in plain sight. Uh, first, a little about me. My name is Sarthik Raneja and I am working as an information security engineer at a fintech corporation. You can find me at Twitter and Discord. So, uh, a little bit introduction about Zero Trust model. Initially, Zero Trust was created by John Kinderwald during his realization that the traditional security models operate on a, a like outdated assumption that everything inside an organization's network should be trusted. But under this uh, broken trust model, it is assumed that a user's identity is not compromised and that all users act responsibly and can be trusted. The zero trust model recognizes that trust is a vulnerability. Once on the network, users, including threat actors and malicious insiders, are free to move laterally and access or exfiltrate whatever data they are not limited to. Remember one thing, the point of infiltration of an attack is often the not the target location. They move laterally and get to the target location. Why a zero trust model is needed? With the, as we can see with the modern workforce uh, becoming increasingly on the go, accessing applications from multiple devices outside of the business perimeter, enterprises have adopted a verified and trust model. They verify explicitly, which means if someone has the correct user credentials, they are admitted to whichever site, application or device they are requesting. This resulted in an increased risk of exposure dissolving what was once trusted enterprise zone of control and leaving many organizations exposed to data breaches, malware, and as we all can see, ransomware attacks. Protection is now needed where applications and data and users and devices are located. To be competitive, businesses need a zero trust network architecture, able to protect the enterprise data wherever users and devices are. Meantime, also ensuring that applications work quickly and seamlessly. Uh, I came across by researching about zero trust model, and this is the perfect definition of zero trust. That zero trust is not about making a system trusted, but instead it is all about eliminating the trust factor from the organization. Uh, when we talk about impostures, there are mainly three categories of impostures, which can be insider threats, devices, and applications. Insider threats can be both granted and side granted employees. Granted employees can be uh, employees which are fired or which left the organization and now have malicious in intent against the organization. But side granted employees can be which are like angry from angry from management or just experimenting stuff. For example, not all insider threats have the malicious intent. I can share one example I went to. Like uh, I, during my last job, I was testing an uh, ransomware on my device and like my intent was pure and I was tuning an idea, but it went wrong and the, my machine was compromised. So insider threats can be of this type also so zero trust must be there to not have any mishappening on the network devices can be both trusting and infected same as applications can be both trusted and compromised and the like there can be a spyware hiding in our network and we get to know about it like after two or three years we have seen the uh, these kind of attacks in recent supply chain attacks then we come to uh, secure access services model, which is mainly a SASE model. Before diving into the specific, specifics of SASE, it's important to understand a bit of background on this new term. Existing network approaches and technologies simply no longer provide the levels of security and access control digital organizations need. These organizations demand immediate, uninterrupted access for their users, no matter where they are located. As we can see, with an increase in remote users and software as a service applications, data moving from one data center to cloud services and more traffic going to public cloud services and branch offices, then back to data center, 
the need for a new approach for network security has risen. So, what do we mean by a SASE? Uh, SASE is an basically an emerging cybersecurity concept that Gartner described in August 2019 report, The Future of Network Security in the Cloud. With so many similar terms and acronyms uh, floating around, it's important to make sure you understand what our vendor is actually talking about when you are discussing the solutions of the network. The concept of zero trust came about because the old network security model of inside means trusted and outside means untrusted no longer works. The zero trust model moves security away from the like it it asks for the uh, explicitly verification of the user whether uh, they are trusted or not. The concept of came about the zero trust model moves security away from implied trust that is based on network location. Instead, it focuses on evaluating trust on a per transaction basis. Then we come to after zero trust, it evolved to zero trust access model, which is ZTA, and then it further evolved to ZTNA, which is zero trust network access model. Zero trust access is about knowing and controlling who and what is on your a network. Role based access control is a critical component of access management. Only by knowing definitely who a user is can be appropriate level of access be granted based on their role. Is the user an employee, a guest, or a contractor, or can be a, even a malicious guest in our network? Whatever is the role and what network access sites does that role entitles them to. Unfortunately, ZTNA isn't the most obvious naming convention because although it's called zero trust network access, it's really all about brokered access for users to application. So it might have been a clear call to zero trust application access, but better or worse, it's ZTNA. A key takeaway is that ZTNA is an element of the larger ZTA proposition. So uh, I try to explain how SASE actually works. So first, a convergence. SASE is basically a convergence of WAN wide area network. It's the simplest form. A wide area network is a collection of a local area networks or other networks that communicate with one another. A WAN is essentially a network of networks and the internet we use almost every second of the day is the biggest WAN we use. Then we come to a CSP solution, which is a cloud access security broker. According to Gartner, cloud security access broker is an on-premises or cloud-based security policy enforcement point that is placed between a cloud service consumers and a cloud service provider to combat and intercept the enterprise security policy as cloud-based resources are accessed. As we all know, organizations are increasingly turning to CSP vendors to address cloud services, enforcing security policies and complying with regulations even when cloud services are beyond their perimeter and out of their direct control. Then we come to a FWAS service, which is firewall as a service. Firewall as a service refers to a cloud firewall that delivers advanced layer 7 or we can say next generation firewall capabilities, including access control such as URL filtering, advanced threat protection, intrusion prevention, and uh, DNS security. The concept of firewall as a service is not about simply virtualizing appliances. Firewall as a service enables organizations to eliminate firewall and simplify the, uh, we can say, IT infrastructure. Centralized management from a single console enables organizations to eliminate the challenges of change control, patch management, co coordinating outreach windows, and policy management associated with next generation firewall appliances. By delivering consistent policies across the organization where users can connect. Then we come to zero trust. So basically, SAS is the con convergence of wide area networking or WAN and network security services like CASB, firewall as a service, and zero trust into a single cloud delivered service model. According to Gartner, uh, SASE capabilities are delivered as a service base upon the identity of the entity, real time context, enterprise security compliance policies, 
and continuous assessment of risk trust throughout the session. Identities of identities can be associated with people, group of people, devices, applications, services, IoT systems, or edge computing locations. Gartner expects that by 2024, at least 40% of the enterprises will have explicit strategies to adopt SASE, up from less than 1% at the year end of 2018. That's amazing, right? A SASE architecture identifies users and devices, apply policy-based security, and delivers secure access to appropriate application or data. This approach allows organizations to apply secure, secure access no matter where the users, applications, or devices are located. So uh, basically, as I have seen that uh, people confuse that it's ZTNA versus SASE or but uh, ZTNA and SASE. But think of SASE as a higher level design philosophy than ZTNA. They are not separate or competing network security models. Rather, ZTNA is a part of an overall SASE architecture. Note, however, that while security implementation may be short to medium term objective for network architects, SASE is a long term goal. Organizations may decide today and they buy into SASE approach and then move slowly while their network and security starts towards the SASE model. They will take time as designers move to replace outdated security technologies and better integrate those that remain. Note that moving to a SASE model both requires and enables a zero trust approach to network security. Here we have the SASE architecture. Mainly, SASE aim is to blend the services and technologies to build a cloud-aware and cloud-based security network. A SASE model is especially appealing to organizations that evidently use the cloud and cloud services or are on a path to the cloud. This includes distributed organizations, for example, those with branch location and dispersed end users, as well as businesses with IoT and edge deployments. The SASE security model can help your organization in several ways. First, which is flexibility. Imagine with a cloud-based infrastructure, you can implement and deliver security services such as threat prevention, web filtering, sandboxing, DNS security, data loss prevention, and next-gen firewalls policies in a single bundle. Then cost savings, instead of buying and managing multiple point products, Utilizing a single platform will dramatically reduce your cost and IT resources. Then it will also reduce the complexity of the network. You can simply uh, you can simply simplify your IT infrastructure by minimizing the number of security products your IT team has to manage, update, and maintain. Consolidating your security stack into a cloud-based network security service. Uh, Uh, then SASE model also helps in increasing the performance. With the cloud infrastructure, you can easily connect to wherever resources are located. Access to applications, internet, and corporate data is available globally these days. Then zero trust model is add on to the SASE model, or it always includes the zero trust model. A zero trust approach to the cloud removes trust assumptions when user devices or applications connect. A SASE solution will provide complete session protection regardless of whether a user is on or off the corporate network. Then it comes with threat prevention. Like with full content inspection integrated into a SASE solution, you benefit from more security and visibility in your network. Then as we said, the DLP and data protection comes with SASE. Implementing data protection policies within SASE framework helps prevent unauthorized access and abuse of the sensitive data. It is uh, like achieving, it is a myth that achieving zero trust is often perceived as costly and complex. However, zero trust is built upon your existing architecture and does not require you to rip and replace existing technologies. There are no zero or tr such zero trust products in the market. There are products that will work in zero trust environments and those that don't. Zero Trust is also quite simply to deploy, implement, and maintain using a simple five methodology. 
which is uh, identifying the protect surface, map the transaction flows, build a zero trust architecture, create zero trust policy, and then monitor and maintain. Protection surface can consist of identities, endpoints, data, application, infrastructure, and network. Building a zero trust, uh, zero trust architecture includes these major four steps. Ut uh, utilization of micro segmentation. So what is micro segmentation? Micro segmentation is a process of breaking up the security parameters into small zones to maintain separate access for separate parts of the network. For example, a network with files living in a single data center that utilizes micro segmentation may contain dozens of separate secure zones. A person or program with access to one of those zones will not be able to access any of the other zones without the separate authorization. So basically it is like seg further segmentation of access. Then we come to uh, multi-factor uh, authentication. Multi-factor authentication is a basic building block of an intelligent approach to network security. Properly use it, it reflects the guiding principle of the zero trust. Never trust, always verify and verify explicitly. Our MFA requires the presentation of two or more authentication factors, such as a knowledge factor, something only the users know, such as password, pin or pattern, a position factor, something only the user has, such as an ATM card, smart card, then an inheritance factor, something which contains a biometric characteristic such as fingerprint, retina, and face scan. Upon presentation, each factor must be validated for authentication to occur. Then we come to uh, come to principle of least privilege. Principle of least privilege is also no, known as need to know basis. It is a practice of limiting access rights for users to bear minimum permissions they need to perform their work. Under principle of least privilege, users are granted permission to read, write, or execute only the files or resources they need to do their jobs. In other words, the least amount of privilege necessary. Additionally, the principle of least privilege can be applied to restricting access. Rights for application system processes and devices to only those permissions required to perform authorized activities. Just like users, the uh, user devices cannot be trusted without verification. To achieve complete zero trust security, identity centric controls must be extended to the endpoint. That means every device used to gain access to the corporate resources must first be enrolled so that it can be recognized and verified. Device verification should be enabled and organization to determine whether the endpoint seeking to access internal resources makes this security requirements or not. Then we come to guiding principles of zero trust model. It is mainly based on three principles which are verify explicitly, use of least privilege access, and assuming of breach. Verify explicitly is always authenticate and authorize based on all available data points, including user identity, location, device cell, service, or workload. Data classification and anomalies can be included as well. Using uh, least privilege access is limited user access with just in time and just enough access. Risk based adaptive policies and data protection to help secure both data and productivity, productivity of the users. Assuming breaches, minimizing the blast radius for breaches and prevent lateral movement by segmenting access by network, user devices, and app awareness. Assuming breach, as we can see, is all. Uh, always included into uh, corporation cyber resilience programs as well verifying all sessions are encrypted end to end and use analytics to get visibility drive threat protection and improve defenses the zero to security market will grow to uh, grow from 19.6 billion dollars in 2022 it is expected to grow from 19.6 billion in uh, 2020 to 51.6 billion dollars in 2026 as data security solutions are responsible for securing business database and information such as customer details financial information and employee database as well as the other key business data of any organization huge amount of data is generated every day across organization 
in various industry verticals and effective management. An organization database may comprise of sensitive data such as personally identifiable information, personal health information, or intellectual property, as well as payment card and financial information. So, uh, corporations are moving more to the zero trust uh, model to secure their data. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Amin Gilani, who uh, who was uh, the coach for this for this particular talk, and uh, Maggie Ferro to help me making slides, and Stacy for always having my back. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? I'm not seeing any questions in the Discord channel, but what are some of your favorite um, tools, paid or open source, to um, audit or evaluate zero trust, if any? Uh, okay. So, uh, according, uh, like during my uh, experience for zero trust model, I have used various Palo Alto uh, products such as Prisma or their SASE infrastructure and for firewall as a service, we have used next generation firewalls. And then as a EDR, we have used Cortex Excel. Awesome. I have a comment that says no questions here, but great job. Looks like everyone really loved the talk. We have them for just another few minutes if anyone has any questions and wants to put them up in Discord. Why do you why do you like zero trust over other models of I, I know it's not a regulatory framework, but why why is zero trust one of your preferred frameworks? Okay. Uh, like uh, as we are evolving in the technology, our traditional security models trust the users or our internal applications or internal devices. But internal users or gruntled employees or side gruntled employees can go wrong. Rogue. even machines can go rogue and even the trusted applications can, rogue, can go rogue so under the zero trust model we verify explicitly verify again and again and again uh, in regular intervals of time so there is not a factor of trust we eliminate the trust factor yeah i um i was first exposed to zero trust when i started using infection monkey Infection Monkey will actually give you in its reporting output like MITRE alignment as well as zero trust kind of compliance alignment, which is pretty fantastic considering it uses a propagating agent. Anything from you, Wade? I got nothing. I have no experience in zero trust, so it was a lot for me. Um, I'm still trying to catch up on all of it, but it was a good presentation and I enjoyed it overall. I'm a big advocate of zero trust because trusted relationships, um, it's actually a MITRE TTP. It's one of those things that can like, like we in red teaming so rely upon to abuse like, oh, like exactly. you have an Okta session cookie. So you have a trusted relationship to all of these applications or whatever. And it's like zero trust says verify every request, every resource, every person, every time. Like there is no trusted relationship. There is no like just assumed permissions access at any level. It's like everything is gonna be verified every time, which I'm personally a really big fan of from the blue side, even though it makes my red teaming life a little harder. <laughs> That's just have my <laughs> 30 minutes to our next talk, so we have some time to burn. 30, 30 or 20? Is it 20? I thought next one starts at 12.30. It's at 21. It's at, 21. yeah, 12.30. Right. It's going to be like 9.30 our time.
right? Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. I, got I am right. Every time. Everyone is here when you say that. They're always here when you tell me I'm right. This is recorded, so I guess. Uh, see how many times we can get him. Be, there will be evidence. <laughs> uh, I'll be like, right now. So uh, we got one question. How would you get started on adopting Zero Trust? Ooh, great question. Uh, so basically, Zero Trust, adopting Zero, uh, first, the Zero Trust model should be a ideology more than the specific tools. Like management should see the organization traffic incoming and outgoing on the basis of Zero Trust model. So first the uh, ideology should be adopted, then the tools should be tuned on the basis of Zero Trust and the verification and authorization must be there. Good principle to live by. Security is doing the basics well, people. That's basically what Zero Trust says. <laughs> Do Luckily, doing the basics well is hard. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> right? None of us would have a job. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Sartag. That was an amazing way to kick off um, the new speakers track over here. Uh, I don't know if that was your first time speaking or not, but you did a great job. It was engaging. Everyone loved it. I personally loved the topic. Zero Trust is very near and dear to my little hacker heart. Next up, um, coming up here in now less than 20 minutes, we will have Anastasia speaking. Um, Anastasia Mitrofanovska. There you go. You're welcome. That's like the one that I'm going to do all day. Okay. Yeah. The rest is going to be me failing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I leave Let's more? Feel free to roast Wade in his pronunciation of your names in the chat. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I googled Sarthok's name beforehand. All right, I, I am Is not. That your, your big <laughs> <laughs> Be honest. Did you did you did you butcher my name the first time you saw it before you ever heard me say it? Probably. I'm not gonna lie. You're like probably. You're Most, like that sounds like, that sounds like something I would do. Telling you, if uh, was here, you'd be Wade. Is Wade here today? Wade, Wade. I've heard Wade. the name Wade since that freshman year of Spanish because that's the Spanish pronunciation of Wade. So it's is it? It's all right. I'll 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 accept it. I'll accept it. My name is actually different in every language I speak. It's a French name actually, but in French pronunciation it sounds different than in English, and then in Italian it's completely different. It has a vowel on the end. And also in Russian, it's completely different. I don't know what my name is in any other language. I'm not as uh, cultured as you, I'll say. Well, in like in Russian class, if you're not a native Russian speaker, you get the option to either like Russify your English name, which for you would probably be like Vaid, Vad, but like if, or you can pick a Russian name, which for you the closest would probably be Vlad. I'll take both. Those are both pretty good. Vlad is a cool name. Yeah, no one would be able Vlad to find it. <laughs> uh, I think like my name in Russian would be like Marila, but the closest would be Mila if I'm actually going native Russian. But I think I chose like Natasha just to be all jazzy. <laughs> I like, I like, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the first one you said, but I think I like that one the most. Marila? Yeah. That, the you Meryl? say you say it well too. You sound like yeah. you belong in Black Widow right now. So. <laughs> Meryl with an A on the end, Mariela. So the first time I ever spoke Russian, I used an Italian accent, which kind of goes da 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 da, because I didn't know how to pronounce like anything. And now I know that in Russian they basically um, stop at each consonant. So if there's like a vowel on the end of a word, they'll tie consonant vowel to next consonant of the next word, and then pick up the next emphasis at the first vowel in the next word. Which is why instead of being like Marella, which would be Italian, it'd be like Marilla, Marilla, Marilla. That's good. So there's pattern. your little Russian lesson for the day. Yeah. Ooh, there you go. There's a question for you. 
Oh, okay, yeah. So Jason asks to talk a bit more about MITRE ATT&CK and how it relates to Zero Trust. Mm -hmm. So um, MITRE ATT&CK is actually going to be more of a repository um, mm -hmm. of terms, kind of. So it kind of gives you like a common way to discuss things without being like, well, in risk, we call this that. And in red teaming, we call this that. And over here for IT controls, we call this that. So um, MITRE kind of gives you a good alignment place to start. And zero trust is more of a, it's more of a, it's, I don't know, it's not, I don't know how you describe it. It kind of happens again at like the transport layer level. It's, it's more like verifying requests and verifying user access permissions and not having like trusted relationships between like multiple environments and users and this like permissions policies basically. But there's a tool that I use called Infection Monkey an infection monkey is a lateral movement tool, an initial access tool. And what it is, is you would take it, it's basically a self-propagating agent. Its only purpose is to basically break in, like via whatever method, brute force or SMB, or it's got a number of payloads built into it, and then replicate, and then try to break into other hosts it can access from that, and replicate, and break into other hosts from that, and replicate. And at the end, infection monkey will give you kind of a live heat map of all the network topography it was able to touch, and like, from here, I was able to hop back to here, and from here, I was able to go to here. So it'll point out to you all of your configuration problems, letting you go from one host and move laterally in someone's network. And this tool, um, and it's by the good folks over at Gardecore, it in its reporting output, it will tell you the MITRE TTPs, the payload that the payloads use, like the agent used, to compromise multiple hosts. So it'll give you the MITRE TTP alignment. And then additionally, it'll tell you based on everything it was able to accomplish, your zero trust compliance. So it'll break it down by the zero trust pillars and it'll give you like a qualitative, um, like a qualitative assessment to each one, which is pretty fantastic. So if you're kind of not sure where you stand and you kind of want to implement zero trust, um, Infection Monkey is a great kind of diagnostic place to start, in my personal opinion. There's also your technical lesson for today. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my two-minute TED Talk. I need to look up Infection Monkey. I've never even, I don't know, I had oh. the blue team, I've never even heard of it. I can't believe people have still never heard of this. I have a Plural site course on it, Wade. I have too um, much stuff to do. You think I go on Plural site? Uh, thanks, buddy. Maybe um, you should send, no. send me that free voucher and I'll look at it. I will. I'll give you a month free license just so you can go watch my course. Um, no, it's actually such a robust tool and it's so cool. But here's the thing you need to know about using it. And I tell you this in my course. It is not adversarial emulation. It is real malware. It will look like real malware. And when you set it off, it's going to set off, at least it should set off all of your bells and whistles and alerts and alarms. Like it's a noisy test to run, but it's so robust. It's got so much built into it. It's open source. So if you have more custom, like if you ever done any custom payload dev for red teaming or whatever, you can incorporate those into it and have it literally just go fully loaded kitchen sink at all the things. And it will tell you everywhere it was able to touch. And like literally you start at someone's host, like Wade's, then you end up all the way over here on like this admin chair. And you're like, how did it get there? And it'll show you the configuration holes. It's so cool. It's it's such a robust tool and I can't believe more people don't use it, but I call it chaos monkey testing. I'm like, beware everybody. I'm going to set off the chaos monkey today. And they're like, oh God, <laughs> I'm so scared. Have you broke anything using it? Is it like break a lot of things? <laughs> yes, Anyone that's it. The network store with an AS400 that didn't like you to even like ping it. So <laughs> that got a little mad. Be, be, be careful of legacy hardware. You can define uh, subnets for it to leave out in its configuration part. You, you can tell it not to touch certain subnets or um, certain IP addresses. Does it have any relation to Chaos Monkey? Because you know that's a tool too. Right? No, it doesn't. I did not know that was a tool. I just know that like the Chaos Monkey is just yeah. the monkey and they're wreaking havoc on your environment. Chaos Reading. Monkey is a tool used by Netflix in order to randomly turn off stuff in their network so they can make sure that they have resilience. That's awesome. It's like the opposite of stress testing. It's like yeah. DOS testing. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I had to Google to make sure about like, is that what is in chaos one? But yeah, on the fly. All right. 
still waiting on our next panelist. Ugh. I'm gonna have to install Infection Monkey in my lab. It's amazing. Um, hosting it out of AWS, I've kind of had a problem um, getting port 5000 to open so I can access the console when I try to like download like a base Ubuntu image and install it myself. Um, mm -hmm. But if I if you just subscribe to the Infection Monkey AMI like in Marketplace, it works flawlessly. I love it. Okay. And it takes like two seconds. It's like three clicks and you're done. And if you just power it down when you're not using it, I mean, you get charged for the EBS root volume, but it's like 30 cents a month. So if you're not like, I literally power it up, run it, and then power it down. Hmm. CrowdStrike provides a zero trust assessment as well. I think I didn't. So I highly recommend to everybody Oh, CrowdStrike does. I don't know. They don't let me play with CrowdStrike because I'm on the red team. Do not have a lot of experience with CrowdStrike. I will get like, it. We're not going to let you, like, we're not going to give you the tools and the keys. And I'm like, fine, I'll just take them. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. I think my little social engineer just came in here and took my cell phone without me noticing. Do you need it though? Come on. Like I don't just but like I just like to stay on top of my alerts, but I'm just like, I just had it here and she like comes in, hi, and then she's just like slipping it off the counter and leaves. And I'm like, oh, 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 oh. sneaky. <laughs> oh, little punk. Thanks for saying something, guys. <laughs> you saw her lifting it off the camera. the camera. I figured you knew. I did not know. I did not. It's all good. Oh, man. So what is the next conference you plan on attending? Are you going to DEF CON? Uh, you know what? I had I have someone who offered to give me a ride, but I don't have a – if I go, I don't have – I don't currently have a place to stay. And then uh, I've also, of course, like been watching all the Delta variant stuff go crazy. I am, I do have, I am COVID protected. I have had the uh, the shots, but I don't know yet. I really would like to go. It's total fun, and I love socializing with people and meeting new people. But who knows? We'll see. It's a little, a little expensive. From flying from San Diego, though, it's only a hundred dollars round trip for for a plane which is super nice here. and it's like less than an hour flight from reno but yeah. um yeah i don't know i want to go we'll see if i, I haven't can. been keeping track on any of the talks just because i wasn't expecting to go but someone the person who hit me up is like oh you can just pile along with me and uh get into everything so we'll see i may make a last minute move to go and have some fun but i know quite a few people doing all of hacker summer camp basically and so they're gonna get like an airbnb off strip like one in town like a big house and they're all gonna split it like six of them so that they can like be in the hotels for like the cons and, like take a few days and like chill and stuff so i don't the know last like, I, the last time i went i did stay at the hotel that the conference was in which was super nice because when i thought i broke my foot i just stayed in the room the whole time and watched all the talks on the tv that was super cool but I don't know, it's it's an awesome experience, but the world's still in a little bit of chaos. So. <laughs> I highly oh, suggest no. anyone go though. Yeah, I said with the whole I don't know how much I I don't know how much of a PETA the, the whole Delta variant thing is gonna be. But uh I'm I'm hoping we get to maintain the the slight sense of normalcy we've gotten back, but we'll We'll see. So six minutes. Six minutes. If not, we can just have uh, Meryl do a 30 minute talk on uh, this. Your, well, you can do your talk from 
from Ottawa Attack and Fest. 20 minutes. I believe <laughs> on me. social media strategies and stuff. Oh, man. It was very informative. It, I, I think it was informative. Apparently, uh, lots of people were there for it. Like, I, honestly, like, so I attended a lot of the talks in person. And um, considering they put me in the, in there were, there were two, like, main track rooms, basically. And I was in the smaller of the two, which I kind of liked, honestly. I was in that blazer. And, and I wore the blazer because it was freezing in that room all week. And I was like, ooh, was I can't cool. shiver up here because I'll shiver. I'll be like, anyway. <laughs> But um, there was actually a lot of people in the audience, not just, you know, my friends who were like, well, come see you talk. And I was like, you don't have to. It's not necessary. Just just make plans for that hour. Just don't come. <laughs> but I suppose I do still have it ready to go if I, uh, <laughs> if, if, if we were hard up for something. Hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, Anastasia. Hey. <laughs> How do you pronounce your last name? I want to know how close I was. Oh, I don't know if you want to hear it. <laughs> I want to hear it. I want to hear uh, it. It's, it's Mitrofanovska. Mitrofanovska. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> now you wait. Your turn. No, I'm good. <laughs> I literally just had like a weed eater or <laughs> a gardener <laughs> just go past my window. I turned my mic off real quick, but. Uh, so I've given you presenter. You have full yes, rights, I, right? Cool. I started sharing. We still have four minutes, so we can sit and just talk and have fun for four minutes. Sure. Uh, why not? <laughs> we are having so much fun over here. We were we were trying to figure out what Wade's Russian name would be earlier. I told him if he had been in Russian class, the teacher probably would have called him Vlad. It's probably the mm -hmm. I can think of yeah and actually Vlad has different uh like um different way different full names so Vlad can be Vladislav or uh it can be Vadim but it's not Vlad it's like Vadik I guess so yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you get your choice yes yeah. yes I can be called like Nastya Anastasia Stasia Stacy so it's it's too many it's too many uh it's many options yeah it's one, of, it's one of the fun names for sure yeah yeah but it it's not russian like... it's it's ukrainian oh it's ukrainian mm -hmm. yes <laughs> did not know that i definitely thought it was russian because of like you know grand duchess <laughs> uh, slavic names are like similar so yeah yeah they're all very similar mm -hmm. Good stuff. actually you know what's surprising about russian is that there's a lot of cognates to french because of that whole period where they were trying to be Western European and yeah, they yeah. To stop Russian and they wanted to only speak French and then it didn't quite work. And then the next generation rose up and we're like, no, we're Russians and we're going to speak Russian. But by the way, did anyone write any of that down? Because we're missing a lot of words. And so they just filled wow. it in with like, the real spelling of French words. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I don't know if Russians, if Russians uh, speak French good right now. <laughs> <laughs> So they went out and they forgot their French, which is good. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <their own. laughs> oh, IPv6. Yes. I'm not yeah, going to lie. We have lie. no warning on what any of the talks are about, so it's just yeah, a we, surprise for us. It's kind of like luck of the draw over here. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been avoiding the IPv6 train like the plague because I'm like, I do not need one more thing. Do not need one more thing. Yeah, and it's more confusing when you know IPv4, when you know how it, when you know the structure, when you know how it works, and then bam, IPv6, more numbers, and they, and they even have like words in that, and yeah. oh my god, you <laughs> letters in there. It's twice as long. Yes, no, yes. I don't, what, no, 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 no. I don't like it. I'm pretty sure I failed the IPv6 part in Network Plus, so uh, that just shows. <laughs> If I ever encountered an environment that was all IPv6, I would just quit the pen test. I'd be like, no, I'm done. I don't know what, I don't know what I'm doing. Ooh, no. That's good. That's good security then. I'll start implementing that. Then. <laughs> Switching everything to IPv6. Have a lot of learning to do because we don't like change. We're like, you don't have AD? No. Can you implement AD? Because we could mess that up really easily, but we don't want to play with Okta. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, in the future you can add. And can you implement IPv6, please? <laughs> Heck yeah, we have no ID in IPv6. I'm like, I'm out, I quit. <laughs> nope. No. Ooh, I know there's a couple big companies out there that have said they've implemented it completely. Oh. But I think it's just like bang, right? So like Google. Google, That's Facebook, I guess. Yeah. No, okay. this creative training. I need to take it. I need to take it so bad. All right. Well, here we go. Good luck. I'm sure you don't need it. <laughs> Thank you. Right, well, the stage is yours. Yay! Hello, GrimCon. Um, hope you are doing great today, and thank you everyone who came to listen to me. And thank you, GrimCon, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my main goal of this presentation uh, is raising awareness of using IPv6, and that's why I want to talk about it in a context of cybersecurity. So, small introduction first. My name is Stacy, or Nastya, or Anastasia. <laughs> uh, you can choose more convenient for you. Uh, I already have my master's degree in information uh, system security, and I've been working as a security analyst in a SOC team for almost a year. Today, I'm going to cover uh, a bit of IPv6 introduction, types of IPv6 addresses, um, how to get and implement IPv6 at your home environment, and also um, reconnaissance in IPv6 networks. Every device in the internet uh, is identified through its own internet protocol address in order for um, internet communication to work. And actually that can be compared with uh, zip codes and street addresses you need to know in uh, in order to mail a letter. IPv6 is the latest version of the internet protocol and IPv4 is the version that we are all familiar with more. Uh, the addresses look different. Uh, the addresses look different within these protocols. Uh, the IPv6 has 128-bit addressing scheme, what means that it consists of eight groups of four hexadecimal digits uh, with the groups separated by column. And for comparison, uh, the IPv4 has 32-bit addressing scheme, so it consists of uh, four groups of decimal digits with the groups uh, separated by dots. But the key difference between the versions of the protocol is that IPv6 has significantly more address space. To make, uh, to make our lives better, uh, IPv6 addresses can be shortened. And let's take a look on some examples. So first, if there are a string of zeros, then you can remove them. Uh, you can only do this once and uh, your IPv6 device will fill up uh, the remaining space with zeros until it has a 128-bit address. Uh, then if you have a hexadecimal group, that means a group of four hexadecimal digits with four zeros, uh, then you can remove those and leave a single zero. Uh, and again, your IPv6 device will add the remaining three zeros. And finally, leading zeros can also be removed. And eventually, by removing these zeros, we get a nice short IPv6 address. IPv6 is very important for the long-term health of the internet. Uh, there are only about 3.7 billion public IPv4 addresses. And this may sound a lot, but it isn't even one IP address for each person on, our, uh, on the planet. And considering people have more and more internet connected devices, the lack of uh, IP addresses is already proving to be a serious problem. Um, this may not affect those in well-off develop, uh, developed countries just yet, but developing countries are already, already running out of IPv4 addresses. And uh, the expanded addressing capacity of, IPv uh, of IPv6 enables supporting connectivity um, for a huge range of new devices, such as phones, laptops, IoT devices. Also, eventually, unbelievable amount of IP addresses gives 
an opportunity to get rid of network address in translation or net. And that actually means that every device has its own public address. IPv6 public addresses are more known as global unicast addresses, and they are equivalent uh, of the public addresses in IPv4 networks. Global addresses are routable on the internet. Um, but does it mean that IPv6 has no private addressing? Well, as you can see on the slide, it doesn't. In IPv4, internal, uh, in IPv4 uh, internal addresses use the reserved number ranges, and these addresses are not routed on the internet and reserved for internal networks. IPv6 has two internal address types, link local and unique local. Link local addresses are used to communicate between hosts on the same link. They are meant to be used inside an internal network. Uh, they are not routed on the internet or even internal network. They are restricted to a particular physical link, which is an electronic connection between, um, between our devices. Uh, also, link local addresses are self-assigned. Uh, that means they do not require a presence of a DHCP server in the network. Unique local are meant to be used inside uh, an internal network as well. Uh, they are not routed on the internet, but they are routed on the, on the internal network. Basically, they are equivalent to the internal IPv4, IPv4 addresses. Um, but um, according to my research, unique local addresses are not yet commonly implemented. So I mentioned before uh, that with IPv6, we don't need net anymore. Uh, but you may have a question, won't my network be less secure without net? Um, translating addresses does not provide any security benefits. And in many cases, net require an outgoing connection to be present before it will allow an incoming connection. And this um, stateful packet filtering can be enabled for IPv6 too. Also, IPv6 makes possible end-to-end -end connection without intermediate devices, and that can hinder man-in-the-middle attack, for example. I know you've been already thinking, how can I use IPv6 in my home network? Can I implement it by myself? Of course, uh, first way to do that is asking your internet service provider for IPv6. And for example, on the World, uh, World IPv6 launch website, you can check providers that joined IPv6 launching and can provide you with IPv6 address. But what if you don't have a provider in your city that supports IPv6? Um, and by the way, that's exactly the situation I have, because I don't have uh, any IPv6 provider in my hometown. And that's not a problem, because uh, Hurricane Electric exists. Uh, it is a global internet provider that provides IPv6 as well. And you can just fill out the form on a Tunnel Broker website and get yourself global IPv6 with 64 subnet mask free. But what 64 subnet mask gives us? Well, it gives us an opportunity to have a subnet with that amount of addresses. And I know that's impressive. So now is the main question. Uh, with that amount of addresses and subnets uh, that the person or organization can have with IPv6, is it even possible to make network reconnaissance in IPv6 networks? I mark that as yes, but it's not that simple. Uh, the scale of the, of the address scanning task is so large in IPv6 that, att that attackers must be uh, very creative to be good enough. And simply sweeping an entire 64 IPv6 subnet uh, would just be impossible. But that doesn't mean that we cannot use patterns or documented techniques for, uh, for example, white or gray box pen test techniques. And um, some note, white box 
uh, pentest techniques uh, involves sharing full information and system, uh, full network and system information uh, with a tester. In a gray box, uh, only limited information is shared with a tester. And there is also a black box uh, pen test where no information is provided at all. So first thing we need to take into account is patterns. Uh, they are used in infrastructure networks to simplify the management so it can be easy to remember. And what we can use, uh, the first th thing that we can use, it's a low byte addresses in which most of the bytes are set to zero, except for the least significant byte. Also, there are IPv4 based addresses in which uh, the IPv4 address is embedded in IPv6. And I know it looks weird, but that exists and there's nothing we can do about. Uh, also, we can use service port addresses. It's simply a using of TCP or UDP port of the main service running on the host. And also word addresses, which encodes which encode words. Uh, let's move on to techniques. To techniques. Um, if the target is a local network, the following techniques are found to be effective. And I'll cover a bit later uh, local address scanning and traffic snooping. On the other hand, if the target is a remote network, these techniques on the slide may be used. And I'm going to describe in, one, in more details DNS brute forcing, remote address scanning and uh, DNS reverse mappings. Let's start with DNS brute forcing. Uh, it's actually the easiest one. This technique may be employed just by looking for DNS quad A records against commonly used host names. Quad A points a domain name and quad A record uh, points a domain name to an IPv6 address. Uh, for this purpose, we can use common scanning tool called InMap. Uh, it has a nice feature called InMap Script Engine, so we can download DNS brute, for, uh, DNS brute script and use it with, with InMap. Um, firstly, let's deal with some terms uh, on that slide. A DNS pointer record or PTR, PTR provides uh, the domain name associated with an IP address. And in our case, PTR record is exactly the opposite of the quad A record, which provides the IP address associated with a domain name. Uh, the domain name ARPA is a top level domain in a domain name system, DNS of the internet. And IP6.ARPA zone is used for mapping IPv6 addresses to internet domain names. And what is, more, what is the most interesting about this technique is that it can uh, greatly reduce the IPv6 address search space. Basically, uh, we can walk through the IP6 air zone corresponding to a target network and issue queries for PTR records corresponding to the domain names. And if there were PTR records for any host starting with the domain name, the response would contain a code of zero. That means no error. Otherwise, uh, the response would contain a code of four. Uh, we can try PTR scan within map as well. There is another script for that called uh, DNS AP6 AirPoScan. Also, we can just use uh, some of the web tools. For example, this one is a reverse DNS tool on Network Tools website. Before address scanning, you should consider which subnet prefix to choose. A typical site might have uh, 48 or 64 subnets to be scanned. And however, we can, we can try to reduce the search space uh, by guessing likely address plan schemes or using any clues that might exist from other sources or observations. And for example, um, there are a number of documents available online like RFC 5375 uh, that provide recommendations for the allocation of address space. And uh, address plans might include addresses that run from low number upwards, use building numbers in hexadecimal, decimal form, or use uh, VLAN numbers. 
the Scan6 tool from IPv6 toolkit supports sweeping address ranges and can also use all the address patterns. And this tool can be found in default repositories on uh, Debian-based Debian systems. What about local networks? Firstly, we can try to obtain information via traffic snooping, aka sniffing. Uh, this can help in discovering active hosts in a number of ways. Firstly, each captured packet will reveal the source and destination of the packet, of course. Uh, secondly, the captured traffic may correspond to network protocols that uh, transfer information such as host or router addresses, network topology information, etc. IPv6 address scanning in local area networks um, to some extent could be considered a completely different problem uh, than scanning a remote IPv6 network. Um, the main difference is in usage of link local multicast addresses. Uh, this is a replacement of IPv4 broadcast addresses. And multicast is a group of addresses, but not all addresses in a subnet. And such multicast addresses can relieve the attacker of searching for unicast addresses in a large IPv6 uh, address space. So an attacker can simply send probe packets to the to the all nodes link local multicast address and get a reply from all active hosts. Um, but I want to emphasize one more time: uh, this can help with discovering link local addresses only. So it will work only in the private networks. Um, there are a variety of uh, publicly available uh, local IPv6 network address scanners. Uh, current versions of Nmap implement this functionality. Uh, also, a Live6 tool from IPv6 attack toolkit implements this too. And also, it can be found in repositories for Debian-based systems. Also, I want to mention V. Uh, they are computer science PhD students who work in IPv6, on IPv6 scanner for their PhD project. And this one helped me a lot to find a right path for my talk. And I found very helpful the material about the materials about IPv6 security that V shared on their GitHub as well. So I highly, and also I highly, highly uh, recommend to check out the Twitter account because we post the research updates there as well. Let's move to mitigation part. IPv6 address scanning attacks can be mitigated in a number of ways. Uh, first thing that we can do is to limit pattern addresses. Uh, then we can try to employ intrusion prevention systems or to enforce IPv6 packet filtering where it's possible, of course. Mm, we can try to avoid use of sequentially addresses when using DHCP v6. And ideally, uh, the D DHCP v6 server would allocate um, random addresses from a large pool. Uh, we can use the default 64 size IPv6 subnet prefixes and um, in general, just avoid being predictable in the way uh, addresses are assigned. What about block listing? IPv6 hosts are generally able to configure any number of IPv6 addresses within their 64 local subnet. And in the event of malicious activity, you should block list at least the 64 from which you have detected malicious activity. And depending on the specific provider, internet provider, uh, the attacker might have control of prefixes of any length between 48 and 64. So if malicious activity persists after block listing the offending 64 subnet, uh, you may want to block shorter prefixes, hence larger blocks of addresses. In this example, I used IP6 tables, which is IPv6 version of IP tables. And IP tables is a Linux command line utility to, um, to manage the IP packet filter rules. What else uh, we can do or we should know to be able to secure ourselves? Uh, 
First of all, knowing the syntax makes it much easier to quickly know how to deal with a security breach or uh, implement necessary measures. And as you can see, the syntax can be confusing with uh, can be confusing because of uh, the shortening techniques that I mentioned earlier. Uh, hit the off button. Shutting off uh, IPv6 capabilities when you are not using it uh, may seem obvious, but it not, but it may not be that easy because a number of programs have already been configured to work with IPv6, and just as many may already have the protocol turned on automatically by default. So please check, double check, and triple check your environment uh, to ensure IPv6 is enabled only when it is used. Even with large portions of network disabled for IPv6, there is still the threat of unwanted IPv6 visitors. And when that happens, organizations should know how to kill it before it can infect others uh, within the network. This is the situation. This is the situation uh, where knowing IPv6 syntax can be useful, particularly for setting up effective firewalls and traffic filters. What continued IPv6 adoptions means for internet security? Um, attackers tend to set their sights on new targets only when they become worthy of their attention, and the same goes for IPv6. As IPv6 adoption becomes more prevalent, threat actors are increasingly using its addresses as an attack vector. If threat intelligence feeds haven't prepared to analyze IPv6 addresses, they are faced with big black holes in their data sets, and uh, the ability to monitor anomalous web traffic is one of the keys to detecting a breach. Coming to the end, I want to say that device producers should also be aware of IPv6 adoption. This is especially true for IoT devices. The amount of internet-connected IoT devices grows exponentially, so millions, even billions of new IP, uh, IP addresses will be needed. And IPv6 will help with that, but manufacturers should make sure their devices are designed uh, with the capabilities to support, analyze, secure it. And IPv6 may have been a long time coming, but it's too late in the game to ignore. Um, on this slide, you can find links and tools that you might have missed, and also where you can find me to have a chat. Uh, I'm always glad to learn by helping people and resolving interesting cases. And I want to say special thanks to uh, Margaret, Sertag, V, Digital Overdose Community, and of course, GrimCon for support and for the feedbacks. I'm ready for your questions. All right, we do have at least one, and that was how can an, um, oh my gosh, where, wait, I lost it. Everyone, this is my fault completely. It was a bit up. Uh, what are the methods an organization can use to implement IPv6 if that's something mm -hmm. that you can do? Um, yes, we can do that <laughs> uh, in our environment, and there are at least four. Uh, methods for approach that uh, the organization can use to migrate to IPv6. Like um, we can use just native implementation, so just using IPv6 without IPv4 support. Um, we can uh, use IPv6 tunneling. It's just a tunnel for in IPv4. Uh, so roughly speaking, it's something like uh, an VPN. Uh, so you establish a tunnel between your um, end device with IPv6 and the end device, like for example, your web server or something like that. Um, also, we can use uh, Net Net64. Uh, it's just the translation IPv6 address to IPv4 address in case if uh, your server or your device that you are going to connect to uh, doesn't support IPv6. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> so 
that was so awesome. I feel like thank you. <laughs> I'm just sitting here like insights. I, like, good <laughs> God, I've avoided this for so long. But like, this is one of those things, you guys. That if you don't understand it, you just gotta break it down into its teeny tiny, easy to digest bits until it's something that you're comfortable with. Um, what is one of the reasons you would advocate going to IPv6 over IPv4? Um, you mean like completely why, adopting it? Why, like why? Why is it better? Why is it? Oh, uh, actually, the secure part uh, of IPv6 is uh, like the the securing uh, of IPv6 is better uh, because, for example. Um, IPv6 supports end-to-end uh, -end encryption. Uh, like uh, we are familiar with IPv IPsec protocol, and you can use it with IPv6 because IPv6 is supports supported by default. So we can uh, use end-to-end -end, uh, encryption like automatically and even even don't bother about it. <laughs> so yeah. Go ahead, uh, back your slides up to the one where so people can contact you. So we can get oh, you yeah. on. Sure. Handle slides? Yes. Oh, and also I will be active in Discord, Grimcom Discord, like an hour or two. So if you have some questions, you can send me right away. Let's see if we got any more questions. Have you come across any tools that you haven't been able there are any tools that haven't been able to convert to IPv6 that were critical? Like, um, actually, I faced with uh, implementation IPv6 in my home environment. I was trying to use the IPv6 from Tunnel Broker, uh, but uh, and they, when you're trying to implement that in your own environment, they they have the examples for different uh, operational systems and devices how you can implement that. And I was trying to do that on my Mac, and uh, interestingly, that I couldn't do that. Uh, even I didn't get any errors. I even used Wireshark just to find out what was the problem. And the packets would go away to the IPv6 um, server, but I didn't get any replies. And I'm still in, I've been st still investigating what was the problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it may be use, uh, it may be simpler with some Linux devices or Windows. Okay, I, I definitely want to set up, grab, go grab some addresses and set some stuff at my house now that I know that. Yeah, too. but uh, you should probably have a static IPv4 addresses and okay. open a CMP port and open, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the TCP port 40 for the establishing IPv6 tunneling. Okay, with, with besides just that Mac problem, did you have any other big concerns or big problems when setting it up at your house? No, no. It, the main problem is always the syntax. Okay. So uh, I, I think in many organizations, uh, many of us avoid IPv6 because they don't know how to migrate or they don't know how to implement it uh, correctly or uh, how to set up firewalls correctly. So yeah. Okay. I got one good one. Is there any? Um... Is there any configuration that where something can go wrong? So say the sysadmin configures something wrong in IPv6 that would leave a big security. Something that, yeah. it, one that you can just oh, uh, you tell uh, us. Um, actually, uh, your devices, I think, uh, already support link local addresses, even if you don't know that. Uh, so for example, if uh, cyber, uh, if an attacker, cyber actor, uh, manage to uh, connect to your home environment, uh, they can establish, uh, they can find out all of your link local addresses, and they can even establish the IPv6 tunnel without, uh, like, without any any footprints in in okay. your, I don't know, maybe some detection uh, detection systems. Sounds like persistence on a platter to me. Yeah. <laughs> right up your alley. <laughs> See, have you encountered any exploitation of IPVCs, eh, IPv6 in the wild in your work? Not yet. Not for now. 
<laughs> it's it. always golden until the first one. The first yes, one. yes. Exactly. So blue teamer, I have not as well. Meryl, you got you got anything over there? That's what I'm gonna tell you about. That's for <laughs> me to know and you to find out. <laughs> What uh? <laughs> what led you down this IPv6 rabbit hole? Why why did you focus on it? Uh, because eventually we we will use the IPv6. Like there's not any way back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we need to start to learn that now before it it will be like widespread. For example, uh, according to Google statistics, uh, IPv6 implemented for uh, implement I uh, implemented for like 35% for 2021 year and grows like 10% for like each five years, I guess. So it's not it's not a long way. Okay. That's do you good. think in our do you think eventually so like how's that gonna work? Are they just eventually gonna push IPv4 out? Or like are we just gonna like stop like our our ISP is just gonna stop providing it? Like how is this gonna is it going to go away or is um, it going to have it like behind like NAT gateways or? I think that, that would be approached smoothly. Uh, like I said, there is a couple messes like uh, IPv6 tunnels that I mentioned before. So you can use an IPv6 and IPv4 uh, both. Oh, and I forgot to mention there is uh, a dual stack settings for your routers. So you can use an IPv4 and IPv6 simultaneously. Not not without tunneling, just like two two separate routes. Mm. I'm afraid. I'm afraid for IPv4 to go away. <laughs> I'm afraid. It's I'm not gonna happen in the five yeah. years or ten or twenty, I guess. <laughs> I know, but still, one day someone's I'm gonna call for support. Someone's gonna be like, "What's your IP address?" And be like. Um, <laughs> here we go. Yeah, yeah. Just, I just imagine like copying IPv6 addresses into like my Splunk searches or, or oh, virus, yeah. right? Like it used to be so easy. I could just memorize an address real quick and type it. But one day I'm gonna get that super long IPv6 address that doesn't have any, doesn't have any of the truncated shrinking to it. We need to I'm have just, a separate database for IPv6 addresses. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's going to come a day where I'm going to be looking and be like, oh my God, oh my God, I see four octets. Oh my God, there's an IPv4 over here, guys. And we're going to be like, <laughs> I remember those golden yeah. days when you only had four numbers to memorize. So Johnny yeah. did recommend a web app, a Chrome app, mm -hmm. browser plugin, whatever, <laughs> called IPv Foo. Oh, IPv nice Foo? name. <laughs> I haven't heard about it. Foo? It looks interesting. Not not fool. Foo. Foo. <laughs> oh. Foo, like foo bar. Like like foo fighters. Foo fighters, yeah. Yeah, but I'm just <laughs> calling it fool because like we're all fools when it comes to IPv6, except for Anastasia over here. Uh, <laughs> She's I'm still a fool, fool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, if you want to, if you want to learn more about IPv6, I would recommend to not underestimate RFC documents. Oh, that's, yes, that's because I, I have, I, I know documents. not so many people who would actually read them. No, <laughs> no, don't no why? YouTube channel, maybe, maybe this is a good learning opportunity, Meryl. Meryl, you want to do a plural site on uh, IPv6, there you go. Maybe we need to, <laughs> maybe it's time. Only I'm going to have them call her to do it. <laughs> Like, yes, teach me everything you know about IPv6 so I can go make a course on this thing. We are going to have to start working on IPv6 like exploit and post exploit tutorials. That's going to that's gonna need to come Precisely. next. Yeah, teaching people how to break it so we can test it on our own. Oh, the day is coming. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to Anastasia. You can feel free to hang out with us. We have Gabrielle coming up at 1.15 or 10.15 if you're Pacific. Um, I know everyone's all screwy with their time zones. So we have about 12 minutes until 
she shows up. I think I'm gonna drop off because actually it's my working day today. But don't uh, tell my don't tell my boss, please. <laughs> I think we tagged you on Twitter. I'm so sorry. I hope your boss doesn't have Twitter. That's okay. They don't know I have a Twitter. Uh, <laughs> the day all the day my boss is found online, I was like, damn. There, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So have all fun. Right, Take care, guys. So much. That was thank like you. The important thing I've learned awesome. this year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. Right. Yeah, actually. So we're kind of in the middle of a, a purple team thing right now that I'm leading um, because I'm all about that purple team life. And I actually had to be like, we originally had these dates set and then these dates got pushed and then they were going to put push that past this week. And then it got moved back to this week. And I was like, all right, listen, guys, like I have a thing I'm doing. <laughs> Nope, I planned nope, around nope. it and then all you teams changed it up so I have someone backing me up today because that jig was going to be up pretty quickly the second they're like hmm Meryl's leading the purple team but also also at GrimCon weird I just had to get it okay I'm, I'm fine I'm just yeah. uh <laughs> no me too to work later tonight I just shifted my working hours um like but, popping in for a talk or two during the weekday is one thing, but I'm seeing all day is a totally different thing. God, IPv6, man. The next thing. What is going to be the next thing after this, Wade? Where does it end? Isn't there more IPv6 addresses than there are like, it's either grains of sand on the earth or stars in the sky. Oh, well, we don't know how many star. Well, we don't know either number, but we don't know where the universe ends yet. No, so. there, there's some mathematical equations to prove how much matter is. Uh, I don't want. Never mind. No, I'm not going to. I read no, a lot of. I, read, I do a lot. It's of, also uh, ever basically. expanding and also ever being consumed by the giant black hole in the center of the universe. Have you ever heard of the Schwarzschild radius? Things get broken down to the atom. Uh, there's a there's a really good book by uh, John Green called the Anthropocene Review and in part of it or, or no 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 this wasn't in this book he was talking about how the universe is constantly expanding and how they know it isn't infinite because if the universe was infinite there would be stars in the complete night sky because there would have been already stars everywhere that makes sense well unless they've died and like their light has already like it doesn't if it was infinite it would be there would be another star behind it and cause another and another yeah, and another. Well, light can't travel that far. That's why some stars are dimmer than others. We can't see no, stars different. on the opposite end of the universe. We're getting we're getting hardcore here and definitely out of my uh <laughs> my comfort. I'm gonna well, start. Well, astronomical yeah. physics and quantum physics are two of my hobbies. So come at me, bro. I know, right? I started the noob track and now I'm here presenting it. Talk about coming full circle um i will admit I, meryl was the one who uh hit me up to do it i probably wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for her oh i didn't even know that you started here back in the day yeah well i did oh, I, did, I did san diego b-sides which was the last conference before covid closed everything uh-huh uh, wild west hack and fest virtual which where you and i met and then grimcon right after so just like a slew of new me trying to throw myself out there and uh, i guess it worked because now i'm here but yeah i won't lie i only had a few people that i was like hmm, who could i stand to talk with and banter with all day <laughs> like, oh oh great it's gotta be, so, gotta be so so i guess we've had a couple couple phone calls already though so i we are a little warmed up we could that start talking about tacos since you are a san diego native yeah, we could. We are going to do that. We could totally do that next. I was saying, because I think the, the appropriate thing to do here is to say how I owe you one for if, if you all didn't know about the escape room drama that happened <laughs> at Wild West Hacking Fest. I overbooked my team. <laughs> and then, and then someone who I didn't even invite, even though it was already overbooked, looked at me like, I see someone didn't come. Do you need a team member? I was like, well, we're going in, so I guess that's fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> horrible. So Wade got his spot absconded. I felt horrible. Then him and his team whopped me and my team's time anyway. Although, you know what? We'll have to do a real one. 
like the Immersium. We have one here called the Immersium where they like, if it's a pirate ship, they literally have planked the entire room like a pirate ship. They uh, there's there's one in San Diego where there's a zombie on a chain, and the le the longer it takes you, the zombie's chain gets longer and longer, and if they attack you, you lose. If they touch you, oh, no. There's some good ones in San Diego. Nightmare. You come back down. We'll do a couple. I can't even watch like have you seen that Nancy Drew series on HBO? It's like not that scary, but it's kind of ghosty. And I watch that, and then I have to watch like three episodes of like Ladybug before I can go to bed because I'm like. <laughs> I used to be super into all like the murder mystery and that type of stuff. And like, you name it, listen to the podcast. And then I start having dreams that I get murdered every night. And I was like, I gotta stop this. <laughs> Although we're part of the, did are you afraid of the dark generation? You remember that? Goosebumps, yeah. are you Dude, afraid of the dark? I remember as a child hearing the X-Files music go off and me just like crawling into a ball and just, <laughs> super scared yeah. that was before i like got into sci-fi and stuff like that when i was just a child all right we got how, mu how much longer we got we got five minutes so five on minutes. the next break i need you to seriously consider seriously consider first off your favorite type of taco and where your favorite taco in san diego comes from that's that so the, the second one is easy but well what's where, where does it come from there's a, I, 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 we'll talk about it next break. Okay. I'll have to think about it. Next break, the throwdown of the tacos is coming. Taco, 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 taco. <laughs> because Wade and I are both San Diegans and we take our tacos away too seriously. I am not sure if the slides are available anywhere. I don't know if they will be made available after. I haven't seen a resource tab. Mm, barbecue afternoon or pizza night? I'm gonna go with barbecue afternoon because after I have pizza and it's evening, like when I'm like gaming or playing D&D &D and the campaign gets a ton of pizza, I'm like, no one wants to come back after. We all just wanna roll over into food comas and like ride it out, you know? But like you do a barbecue in the afternoon, you generally keep it pretty light cause you've got like really dense proteins with like really sweet sauce. You got a bunch of light little sides you can just munch. And then you still have energy to keep drinking or hanging out or whatever after. But pizza night, pizza night will put me to bed. So Food during D and D, I feel like it's never the best, just because it it brings the focus off the campaign. And as a DM, I hate that. Yeah, like, and then they're like, "Oh, one second, well, I'm gonna move right through there." And you're you got to like, put so much work into this campaign, and no one even realizes the little nuances you put in because they're all chowing down on a pepperoni pizza. It's it's horrible. That's why you have to completely finish and then completely come back to the table, only no one wants to. <laughs> Johnny, are you our people? Are you our tribe? <laughs> if you can see, I do have three a 3D printer. I do 3D print monsters before my campaigns. And then if I get nerdy enough, I'll actually paint them. This Dude, okay. I got invited to play a campaign with a bunch of noobs, like noob noobs, and they like so new they wanted to play Pathfinder instead of actually playing D D. And yeah. I'm like, all right, not only is archetyping and dual classing a pain in the, I don't know if we can cuss on this con, isn't it a pita, but sure, we'll do that. And then one of them gets all gung-ho and so excited and attached to his character, who's a level two, by the way, that he goes out and buys like a $50 little pewter replica of like basically a half orc warrior. And I'm like, you idiot. And he's like, what? And I'm like, you could die at any moment. And literally that day, my first character died and I had my backup character. He's like, you have a backup character? I was like, do not show up without a backup character unless you just want to watch everyone else play. Like, I, I will, as a DM though, when you're playing with new people, you definitely, like, I would work not to kill people. Like, it's their first game. After the second game, everything's down. I killed someone like third, third game, third round, I killed someone on their second game. But the first game, I held their hand. My old DM used to get so mad because we'd like be over a character. Like, I want to play my new character. Can you just kill off my old character? He's like, no, I'm not doing you, that. You just commit seppuku. <laughs> <laughs> he just cut your own throat. Rock falls off cave wall and drops on you. <laughs> Roll for initiative. <laughs> oh, you're a dwarf? Well, that sucks. <laughs> so who's our, who's our uh, next panelist? Our next panelist will be Gabrielle. 
Gabrielle, are you are you in here? I see you uh, lurking in the channel. Yes, Gabrielle, are you here? You're not here. Hello, hey. it's very nice to meet you both. <laughs> Hello, Marielle, it's so great to meet you. Good, Good to meet, meet you. you. What are you discussing on today? We don't actually know what any of these talks are about. Like every talk that comes up, we're like, ooh, what is it? <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, web vulnerabilities. Ooh. ooh, yes. The number one cloud attacks, the, the number one attack service besides cloud that like no one understands. <laughs> web is my bread and butter, literally. It's like <laughs> all things. I'm very excited. By the way, I've followed you on LinkedIn for like so long. I love your content over there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for wearing your cool t-shirt you're wearing today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know I have a mission like every t-shirt, like every every speaking thing I do to wear someone else's t-shirt. But all right, it's Gabrielle's time. 115. She's gonna take it away with some web vulnerabilities. Good luck. You got it. Thank you very much. So hello everyone and thank you for coming to GrimCon and for attending my talk. So first of all, I'm going to present myself. Um, my name is Gabrielle Botbol and I am a Parisian woman living in Montreal. And I work as an offensive security consultant at Desjardins, which is a Canadian financial services cooperative and the largest federation of credit union in North America. I am also a blogger and a podcaster, and I am the Vice President Communications of NorSec Conference in Montreal. And I was recently honored for my career and contribution to the cyber community by being named one of the top 20 women in cyber in Canada. So to realize my project of becoming a pen tester, I relied on an education uh, science concept by Philippe Carré. You can see the definition on the screen. It's called Apprenance. And my project involves six steps such as e-learning, CTF, learning expeditions, internship conferences, and volunteering. And so in order to document this approach, I created a blog to share my experience. And I also built an analysis grid of skills that were resulting from the whole project. And I achieved my goal by being hired as a pen tester in Canada, but uh, my desire to learn remains as strong as it was at the first time. So what is a hacker? So if you look up the definition of a hacker, so unless you go to specialized website, the general definition is pejorative. You will find terms like snoop, for example, and there will be the notion of illegality. But basically a hacker is someone who hijacks the use of a tool to do something else. So it's someone who is curious about how a system works. So um, as you might know, there are different types of hacker. You have white hat, gray hat, and black hat. And here we are going to talk about white hack hackers who are also known as ethical hackers. And at the end, we will have a fun with um, a Kahoot quiz. So what is pen test? So pen test is when you attempt to break into a system to check its safety. So you will aim to find vulnerabilities so that they can be patched. And there are different types of pen test, and I'm going to present some of them. So you have external pen test, so we are going to try to break into the target system from the outside of the network. So there are different methods for doing that. So for example, we can try to find out if an administration interface of the target company system is available from the internet. So for example, if you have uh, the employees of a company X who must use an application to take their holidays. So if the login page of this application is available on the internet, it could be hacked and this will expose sensitive data. So our goal here as pen tester will be to try to connect to this application and this will give us a first access in the client's network. We also have um, vulnerability assessment. So this is uh, when we are going to use an automatic scanner to scan our customer IP address and we are going to um, analyze the findings. We have 
internal pen test. So for internal pen test, we attempt to break into a system from the inside of the network. So once you are at the customer location, you connect uh, with a, uh, an Ethernet cable or to the Wi-Fi and you try to become a network administrator. And so an administrator has all the access on the system. So it's like someone would manage to steal the personal data of all the people working in the company. And we have a Wi-Fi test, so we are going to check uh, the Wi-Fi security. Like, is it easy to connect? We are going to check if the password is strong enough and if the technology used are reliable, because some technology have been depreciated because they were found to be vulnerable. So a secure Wi-Fi will avoid that a cyber criminal can be legitimate in a network like um, any other person connected to the network. So there is also social engineering. So some companies offer phishing campaigns. So we will do what an attacker would do and we'll be able to find out um, how many people read the email and how many linked on, clicked on the link. And so as a result, the company will be able to put a better awareness policy in place. So, uh, for physical intrusion, we are going to try to break into a building. So we can either make scenarios to try to manipulate people to let us in or um, break in at night, for example. And uh, we will have a target to reach in the building. And if you want an example, um, I made an article on my blog named uh, Codename2300 about one experience I had of a physical pen test. Um, I will share uh, the links on Discord afterwards if you, if you need them. So for denial of service attack, um, so different attacks can lead to denial of service. And denial of service happens when too many people try to access an application or a service at the same time. So the application becomes unavailable. So we will test um, uh, them to evaluate the resistance of the system to denial of service. So for a red team, uh, the goal will be to mainly check the ability of a company to detect attacks rather than focusing on finding a lot of vulnerabilities. And so also we can test applications, so for example, web applications, and we are trying to access sensitive data to become an administrator, uh, or, and we will uh, use the most common black hat attacks to do this. So for instance, uh, we have SQL injection, so it's an attack that allows to get information from the database, and the database contains all the information needed to run an application. But I will explain this more precisely later. So now that we have seen the different types of pen tests, I'm going to explain the steps of a pen test. So there are different phases in a pen test because when we test, we do not go straight to the attack phase. We need to plan it with the customer. We need to define the scope and take care of the legal matters. So this is the planning phase. And then we gather information about the target, how does it work, what are the used technologies, and this is the discovery phase. And after we attack it, we take many notes in the process and we gather proof. So this is the attack phase. And finally, we produce a report with explanation on how to reproduce the flow and how to correct it. So. Uh, to go deeper, I can share with you uh, what a typical day as a pen tester look like. So um, first, I'm going to open my mailbox and send an email to the customer whose system I'm testing. And sometimes we have calls to prepare a new project. And we also have meetings with the team uh, to talk about our projects and how to be more efficient in our work. But most of the time, we test or we write reports. So you learn something new every day because every day you see different technologies. But, and, and this is what I really like, I, because I really like learning from my peers or, or discovering new technologies and, and trying new things on these new technologies. So if you're interested in pen tests and you wish to know which skills are necessary, I'm going to present some of them. So you have to be curious. You need to question everything. You need to be creative. You have to be persistent because sometimes things will not uh, work right away, so you have to try something else. Uh, you have to be very organized and you need to love learning and sharing. So share your knowledge with people, 
ask them about what they know because it's always good to learn new things. And something that was really helpful for me when I was um, looking for an opportunity as a pen tester is my blog because this is like a real portfolio of who I am and uh, what I do and I know. So a blog is not mandatory, of course. You can, for instance, write articles on LinkedIn or, or uh, about things you do or things you like and share CTF write up, explain a concept you're passionate about. So it can take many different forms. And what is good also is to go in the wild, meet people from the community, get involved in the community and go to conferences, talk to speakers or attendees and create an association with your friend, for example. So there are many different examples of things you can do. So now we are going to dive into practice with the example of web pen testing. So as you know, web pen testing is a type of pen test and now every organization or business has a website, but those websites can be a nest of vulnerabilities. So in order to keep people safe, you can help them by testing their website. And so in this example, I'm going to explain some web vulnerabilities, present some tools and talk about what I have seen in real context. So, as you probably know, uh, OWASP is a non-profit foundation that aims to improve the security of web applications. And they have a top 10 of the most fun vulnerabilities that you can see on the screen here. And so we will talk later in details about the first one, specifically SQL injection and directory traversal and the seventh one. And uh, I chose to demonstrate those because they are uh, very visual. So for the demo, I used uh, Mutilide that I installed via Metasploitable 2. So you can also install Mutilide alone on a web server, but if you prefer, but this is a vulnerable app, so you have to be careful with this. And also before I show you the demo, it's very important that you're aware that you must always have the authorization of the owner of the website to test because otherwise it's illegal. And so the machine I use on the demo are made for this purpose, so please uh, be careful with this. And so in the video demo, I will show you the vulnerabilities and tools displayed on the screen, but first I want to um, provide uh, briefly some explanation on, on those so that you can completely understand what you will see in the video. So cross-site scripting, which is also known also known as um, XSS, is a security vulnerability that is typically found in web applications. So it's a type of injection which can allow an attacker to um, execute malicious scripts and have it execute on a victim's machine. So with XSS, you can try to steal the admin cookie, get complete control over a browser, or exploit a vulnerable plugin, or perform keylogging. So that would mean that you are able to record every input made on a keyboard. So you have um, three main type of XSS. You have stored XSS, so this is when you are able to store your uh, XSS payload on the database of the target. And this way, um, the payload will be working for every user who would access the page. So for instance, um, if you have a page on a web forum, you are able to leave a message that will be stored on the database for user to see. So if your payload is interpreted, it will be stored in the database as well and will be executed uh, on uh, uh, every time someone will uh, look at this page. So you also have reflected cross-site scripting. So this is when the vulnerability only works on the client side. So the attacker will need to trick a victim into clicking a URL to execute the payload. And dumb-based XSS, so a uh, document object model is a programming interface for HTML and XML document. And it represents the page so that programs can change the document structure, style, and content. So a DOM-based uh, XSS will happen when the application writes data to the document object model without properly sanitize the input. So SQL injection happens when um, an application uses a user-controlled input to create SQL queries without properly validating the input first. So 
a successful SQL injection attack can read or modify sensitive data from the database, um, execute administration operation on the database, such as uh, shutting it down, and in some cases, uh, issue commands on the operating system. So we have three types of SQL injection. We have inbound, so this is when the data extracted with the injection is presented directly in the application web page. So uh, error-based SQL injection will belong to this type. And uh, we have blind, so this is when an attacker is able to reconstruct the database structure by setting uh, payloads and observing the web application response and the resulting behavior of the database server. So for instance, uh, Boolean-based Boolean and time-based SQL injection belongs also to uh, the blind type of SQL injection. And out of band, which is the least common type of SQL injection, is when an attacker is um, unable to use the same channel to launch the attack and gather results. So they would use techniques that would rely on uh, the database server ability to make DNS or HTTP requests to get the data from the database. So, a uh, directory traversal is a vulnerability that allows an attacker to read arbitrary files on the server that is running on an application. And it happens when application plays user input into file paths. So with this attack, you are able to get application code and data and credentials for backend system and sensitive operating system files. And so in some cases, an attacker might be able to write arbitrary files on the server which would uh, allow them to modify application data or behavior and so ultimately take full control of the server. So depending on the operating system behind, the payload will be different as well as the file you will query for. But the ultimate goal of this attack will be to take um, full control of the server. And the most famous payload is the one you see on the screen, which is uh, going to work on a Linux uh, server. So the tools I'm going to demonstrate, so we have a uh, verb suite, so proxy tools and further. Um, proxy, uh, verb suite is a proxy and the main goal will be to uh, intercept and analyze or modify queries. And you have um, uh, OWASP ZAP, which is open source. Uh, verb suite is uh, proprietary. There's a free community version and a paid pro version. And so as we will navigate through the target application, the proxies will detect potentially vulnerable elements and we will be able to analyze them and validate if they are indeed vulnerable. And also you have uh, the further, so uh, for instance, there. So it's a tool that is used to send a series of payloads or, uh, in order to um, uh, brute force administration pages or uh, browse in, in a website. So this can be done with a Burp Intruder or Derp. And so with Burp Intruder, you can try different cross-site scripting payloads on an injection point, for example. Uh, we can also try to brute force an authentication form. And with Derp, you can list the directories of a website with a predefined list of rules. So this is time for the video demo. So I'm gonna start it, but I need to put it in full screen. And I'm just going to uh, force the quality to be high and put it at little. So the first one is stored excesses. So as you can see, this is Mutilide, as I mentioned before. And so uh, we have uh, the famous blog example I mentioned before. And we are going to be uh, to have our input reflected on the page uh, right after. So here we are going to try uh, a, a payload uh, that will generate an alert and show it on the page if it works. And so it worked. So what we can do now is uh, check uh, the code source to see uh, to see how, how how it looks like. Uh, 
because as you can see here, uh, nothing is uh, shown, but it's because the, our code has been interpreted. So can just, and so now you see that it's just as if the developer was uh, has made this on purpose, except this is our code that we just injected. So now this is SQL injection. So we are going to try to bypass authentication. And so we are going to use another uh, very famous payload uh, with the two dash and the end that will come on the rest of the query so that the password will not be checked. And as you can see, uh, we are able, to, uh, we are logged in as an admin. So for directory traversal, so <laughs> so as you can see, the 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 URL takes a parameter, uh, uh, and so we can try to uh, to see if, what we can uh, do if we inject some uh, payloads here. So we are going to inject the payload you actually saw before, and we are able to see. Uh, the, so this is like a list of the users on the system. This is not a uh, password, so to speak, but it's still sensitive. And now for Burp Suite. So I'm going to put the ingest set on, on and click anywhere. And then, so you can see that everything is, um, uh, you can see the, the query, what it looks like and you have a cookie and everything, so you can modify it and send it, and you can just uh, drop it, depends on what you want to do. And now about burp, derp, sorry. So we are going to uh, try to, uh, with a, 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 a word list, you can find many word lists online. And so every time we have a code 200, it means that uh, the page you are available. And so uh, we have the index page, which is okay, but we'll also have a PHP my admin page and this should not be visible because uh, it's like uh, the, uh, a way to, um, to, uh, to so the developer will use this to uh, change uh, things on the application. And uh, so I really recommend to explore Kali Linux because um, this is, uh, a, a Linux version specif specifically made for pen testing. And so you only not only have uh, web pen testing tools, you also have uh, more general uh, pen, pen testing tools. Okay, I'm just gonna put this again. And let's see full screen because I like it better like this. Okay, so now we are going to see how we can write a pen test report. So um, the executive summary is the part where you need to explain for the executive of a company who will read the report. So it has to be high level explanations with no technical details. And so it contains a global posture that will explain uh, why the findings and attack combination could impact the company. And uh, the, the vulnerability report will have all the elements you see on the screen. So you can also use uh, specifically the vulnerability report part for a bug bounty report if you're a bug hunter. And um, the, the, the severity, you have to put the severity in one word. So usually it's low, medium, high, or critical. Uh, the CVSS score, or if you prefer a WASP risk rating score. The detail uh, of the affected item. So for instance, if you have uh, found a cross-site scripting, this would be the spot where to put the link, for instance, to, to the injection point. Um, so after this, you have to give a detailed description uh, with technical details this time on how the flow can be reproduced and an explanation on how to correct it. And uh, finally, uh, you can uh, put the evidence so you have to put the evidence with like for instance a request or response of the application exploitation you were able to conduct so uh there's also uh, an article i made on how to write a pen test report on my blog i can share the link afterwards with you so how about what i've seen in real context so 
I have seen a lot of cross-site scripting. So once I had to test this website that was uh, globally very well implemented, but there was this feature of file upload uh, in which it was designed to be able to download HTML file. So I built an empty HTML file and I just added the cross-site scripting, uh, cross scripting payload I showed earlier uh, in, in the video and uh, that worked. Also, I have seen some SQL injections. So for example, uh, once the tool we usually use to dump the database, which is called uh, SQL map, uh, was not able to find the uh, injection. So I could not dump the database, but uh, automatically, I mean, but uh, we found a SQL function that could show the last request made to the database. Uh, and this was a Boolean based SQL injection. So we had to check every char one by one to find the request and so we made a script that ran all night long and we only got part of the request because the request was thousand chars long but it, it was still uh, very fun to do um, also i have seen strange behaviors in application like for example i had to test this website but when the session was expiring it would redirect me to a connected session of the administration tool of the website. So uh, it was very surprising. And finally, uh, what I often see also is the lack of clickjacking protection. So what I like to do when testing multiple uh, websites for the same company is to try to show all the websites in the same page in, the, in uh, multiple iframes and see which one will be visible or not. Okay, so now it's going to be time for the Kahoot quiz. So, so you have to go to you have to go to kahoot.it, https.kahoot.it. I can actually write it on the Discord for you. And uh, you will see a game pin. And so you, uh, the question will appear here and uh, on, on my screen, I mean, and you will have to answer to the question uh, from your browser. So I'm going to wait a few minutes for you to be able to join. Uh, so you have to be very quick because it's only 10 seconds to answer. So don't panic, but uh, try to answer. Uh, it, it's okay if it's not the right answer. We're here to learn. Okay, I'm just going to wait one more minute. And then I, I will go so that we're not behind on the schedule. Okay, let's go. Okay, so first question, what is Burp Suite? I'm just gonna... Okay. Five good answers. Good job, everyone. It's going to be tricky. Okay, Maril, you're first. Good job. Which of these payloads can be used for cross-site scripting? Hurry up, you only have five seconds left. <laughs> and good job. Many people got the answer. So he who doesn't hack seems to have some knowledge, even if he doesn't hack. Good, good job. Good job, everyone. So which Linux distribution is specifically made for pen testing? You really uh, saw it quickly in my video demo. Yeah, okay, you're very quick. Like he didn't even wait for the, okay, good job, everyone. Okay, 
so there's going to be a fight for the top. True or false, if an application is vulnerable to directory traversal, you will always be able to access slash etc slash passwd. I, I said it on my slide. Yeah, good job. So this is a payload for a Linux server, this one. Okay, so, so Tyro just got on the top and good job everyone keep going how many different main type of cross-site scripting are there are there 10 3 4 or 2 so it's main types yes good job okay it's a little fight for the top but it's still fun So I'm able to extract data by generating error with SQL injection. Which type of SQL injection is this? Is it in-band, blind, out-of-band, or in a rock band? Yeah, good job. Okay, some of you did not have time to answer. It's very, very quick. So the first vulnerability of OWASP top 10 is, so I hope you remember the slide. <laughs> I was quite quick. Yeah, good job. Okay, so Tyro is still on the top, but good job everyone, because everyone is answering questions. So that's cool. So the phases in pen test in, of pen test in order are, so I actually spend a more time on this. So yeah, good job. Everyone got it. And so which of this is not a pen tense type? Is it Wi-Fi internal, external, or blue team? Yeah, <laughs> I'm amazed. Everyone has it. OK, time for the podium. So congratulations, Aiki, for the third place. He who doesn't hack is the second place. And the winner is Tyro. OK, good job, everyone. And thanks for um, taking part in, in this quiz. I hope you had fun. I always have fun watching you. Up. So now I'm going to briefly uh, show you some resources. So these are the resources uh, I, uh, about the vulnerabilities uh, on OWASP I mentioned, so XSS, SQL injection, and path traversal. And also, uh, when one wants to learn Pentest, it's very important to practice. And you can find a lot of very interesting resources. So it can be either directly online or by creating your own lab, like the one I show on my video. So for instance, you can start practicing with Try Hack Me, which is very good uh, if you have no prior experience. And uh, when, you, when you feel comfortable enough, you can switch to Hack the Box. And I also made an article on how to get started with pen testing. So I will send it afterwards on the, on the Discord channel. And so before taking some questions, I would like to take some time to thank uh, Johnny Xmas for coaching me for this talk. It was very nice to meet you. And uh, that's it. I'm ready for questions if you have any. Excellent talk. So uh, let's see, going up, got Johnny asking, how common is it to find stored cross-site scripting out there? It seems like a pretty basic vulnerability and easy one to fix. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, I know it's not, uh, I'm not sure it's that simple to fix because I, I see that people are struggling a lot with it. So what I usually recommend is to have a look at the uh, Tanya Janka's book, uh, which is called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security, because it's actually very well documented. 
And of course, the OWASP documentation is very good help for fixing this. Let's see. Do you see any others over there, Meryl? Any other? Sorry. Oh, no. Uh, I think that was the only question. We got any more questions in Discord? That's the only one I saw. Uh, if we don't, I would like to ask, what is your favorite severity rating classification system? Uh, for now, it's uh, CVSS because it's uh, the one I used to use, but I really like to try out uh, the OWASP risk rating one because it seems very good and it seems to be, you know, uh, more precise. So I, I really wonder how is it in terms of business impact uh, um, specifically. So a lot of people don't understand the purpose in using a purposefully vulnerable like image box app or website. Um, a lot of blue teamers will say, well, that was already intended to be broken. And a lot of red teamers say, why am I trying to break something that I know is already broken? So can you please explain the purpose in using intentionally vulnerable things to practice hacking on? Well, it's, uh, I, I hear that it's, uh, I, I can understand that uh, it's frustrating because it's not always realistic, but uh, also it's very good to practice. So I, I think so when you're beginning, it's, it's good to have some, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable things like this to practice and to hack away. But if you want more real context, you can also uh, uh, participate in bug bounty programs, which are going to be a re real context and you are going to uh, test uh, things from the real life. Yeah, I'll echo that a bit by saying that um, when you're pen testing things, if you have like a payload or if you have a, a post exploit module that you're using and it doesn't work, like in the wild, then like you're asking yourselves one of two questions. Did the website or application thwart the attack or did the module just not work? So when you intentionally launch things that you intend on using at things that you know it's supposed to work on because it's purposefully vulnerable, it gives you validation that if it's not working in the wild, it's probably because there's a mitigation there and it's not your payload or your module that is in fact the problem. So it's useful for custom payload development. It's useful for removing unknown factors from your kill chain in a testing environment before you use it live. And um, it's also useful because if you can obtain a copy of an image or like that's not intentionally vulnerable, but a copy of a, a box image that you plan on testing, you can develop better payloads for that thing because you've got samples of the EDR um, and other solutions and mitigations that might be on it to give you practice getting around those things. So yeah, those are really the purpose that those things serve. If anyone ever gives you any pushback, that's why you should do it. Yeah, that's Jason, a very good point. Jason has a question is what is a good beginner tool to practice using and reading up on to start learning pen testing? Is it Burp Suite? You know, Burp Suite is very good for this. Uh because you you really get to see how a request is formed and the impact of uh when you modify your request what what the result you get so yeah i would say burp sheet is is really nice or you also, if you don't want to pay for the pro version you have the free community version or you can uh, try uh, OWASP zap as well which is very good as well and it's free yeah and burp has an academy called port swigger academy which is very similar to what you find at try hack me um where they will actually teach you in lab version and then let you try it live with you with their tool so um if you want to get started with web app pen testing burp is great i think it depends on the type of pen testing you want to do if you want to get started with wireless if you want to get started with network pivot if you want to get started with c2 if you want to get started with web app those are all going to be different tools like people who are like oh i'm a web app pen tester and i use cobalt strike i'm like well cobalt strike isn't really a web app tool so, you know, the tools that you want to get started with kind of depend on the type of ten pen testing that you want to get started doing. All right, so we're coming up on time. I see Vevek is already in the channel. Excellent. Um, Gabrielle, you do have a request to please drop your blog links into Discord oh, yeah. so people can go read up on the things that you've mentioned. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for calling such great attention to web app pen testing. <laughs> I should see none of these basic vulnerabilities in any of your web apps now that you guys have seen this talk, I hope. All I can say is, look, I beat Meryl in the questionnaire. And you did. God, I meant to hit yellow. <laughs> I was like, right. I was like, dang it. 
Well, and then once you lose one question, you're screwed. Yeah. There's no way you're coming back from that. <laughs> well, thank you for having me and have a great rest of the day. You too. You. Awesome talk. Bye. Thank you. All right. Do we have Vivek on deck? Yes. Yeah, that was a great talk. It is so great to kind of get a refresher on the basics of web app pen testing and some common things that you see and some common ways that you can practice um, abusing those things. Um, it's very important to know the difference in the type of cross-site scriptings that you see. A lot of people think that there's only one, there's actually multiple types, stored and reflected are totally different, how you'd abuse them is totally different. So that was such a great talk. Hey there, Vivek. Oh, we can't hear you, sir. Can you hear him, Wade? Nope. Hey, folks, good morning. Are hey, you yeah. okay? Good morning. <laughs> how are you all doing? Good, how are you? Good, great work so far. I've been an attendee so far in the other device, so it's been uh, really fun watching these talks. Cool. Thank you. So uh, you have presenter. Um, if you want to just put up your screen just for now, just make sure everything's working. We still got five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> can you see the presentation slide okay? Yes, yes we yes. can. All right. I'll just all right, go back to the screen, I think. Okay. All right. Security and incident response. <laughs> Very important. Very important. Yeah. A little bit more up my alley than Mer Merrill's this time. You what? A little bit more up my alley than yours this time. Yeah, I'm definitely going to learn a thing or two about a thing or two. Um, so one of the reasons I loved getting into this field was because I knew there would never be a point in time where I would sit back and uh, know it all. And, you know, I'm good now. I know all the things. But um, one thing I will say is that there's so much snow sometimes that I'm like, oh my God, another thing? Oh my God, now IPv6? Oh my God, and now this? I'm like, I don't have time to learn all these things. Like I go to sleep one night and I wake up and my skill set is obsolete. <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah, I think there are two sets of people, right? Those that enjoy this kind of constant change and the others that just can't deal with it. After a while, they say, you know, I just want to stop thinking about it and learning every second. You got to have that constant pursuit of knowledge to be to be here. It gets right. rough sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do. You need to love it. But at the same time, I'm always just like, God, there is so much. Like, it's, it's so hard to stay on top of it. And I just... The more you learn, then the more the more holes you realize you haven't learned, and it's just oh god, snowballing. And <laughs> the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. You're like, oh. <laughs> also, like the uh, the interested in that, the new people coming in sometimes are are more relevant and and right more times than people that are experienced. So that's another kind of difficult thing to accept that you know in in other worlds, in other you know companies or other realms, you know, 10 years later, you know, you will always be right for the most part and the newbies have to learn from you. Here, it's like, you know, you learn from everybody because yeah, people yeah. that just graduated college have something cool that I couldn't possibly even think about. It's true, it's true. Like when people are like, oh, I wrote this tool last night just because I thought it would be useful. I'm like, oh, oh my yeah. I think I'm over here doing all these things and I'm like, I'm not writing tools. Do I need to do that? <laughs> like, oh man. Yeah. You guys, there's, it's, there's, for, for those of you who think there's no room for you to do anything different and there is nothing that, that hasn't been done already, it's not true. There are new things all the time. Wade and I have been here and we're learning new things all the time. Just go out there and create stuff the, and the community needs it desperately. <laughs> Well, we got two minutes. Do you want to just start a little early or we want to actually wait? I, I like living on the edge, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can wait. We got, Choice. what, uh, 16 people or so on the on the show so far? Yeah, it looks like we got about 16. We've been oscillating between about 16 and 25, so. Sure. These are dedicated people, you know, <laughs> during yeah. the work day, trying to manage work and this, so you got to give kudos to them. 
that there's yep. no brakes built in. So it's like, if you blink once and you miss the talk, it's gone. Right. Better. Till the recording shows up on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> that always takes a few days. All right, well, without yeah. further ado, we give you Vivek, an incident response. All right, thanks folks. Hey everybody, um, those of you that are on the call, I'm excited to share some ICS and OT specific stuff with you. Let me minimize this screen. Um, my name is Vivek Ponada, and here's a quick background of who I am. Um, I've been in uh, industrial control systems all my life. Um, in fact, right after high school, I uh, became a technician, instrument technician, and uh, I graduated with electrical degree uh, later on, but I've been doing ICS um, all my work life. I've been doing OT cybersecurity for the past eight plus years. Uh, most of the past 10 years has been sales and business development. I do uh, dabble a bit on the services and execution. Uh, and, and like many of you um, in the industry that have been around for a while, I've traveled and worked in many countries. Um, I do have a finance uh, MBA as well and a SAN cert for industrial controls. Here's my contact info. And let's dig into the agenda today. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the industrial control systems, the PLCs. Um, uh, we'll talk more about the top 20 uh, PLC coding practices project, and we'll go through some examples. So um, first up, PLCs, folks. Um, nobody is uh, surprised to see Purdue model here. Um, most of the discussion that you see around industrial controls typically starts off with saying, um, how do you protect the um, internet facing devices right so anything in the dmz at this phase you know level three above um, or maybe even the hmis and historians and ews at this level two or three um, even down to uh, level two hmis but you don't hear about securely doing anything at this level one or below because historically there was no protection no focus on security at this level one or below so, in fact, you hear about this term insecure by design because these PLCs, uh, you know, both the hardware and then the protocols, the communication protocols were never built with uh, security in mind. So, uh, if an attacker, a malicious uh, actor is in this area already, you know, having done whatever, uh, you know, lateral movement or direct access through some kind of IoT device. Either way, once they're here, uh, they can operate no differently from a, a maintenance person or an operator because you know the protocols they'll just execute whatever commands are given, right? So they don't really look into you know who's doing the um, initiation of a command. So historically, again, you know, no encryption, authentication, etc. Now we talk about PLCs, but you know what I'm going to talk about today is equally applicable for distributed control systems or you know the SCADA systems as well. Uh, we're just talking about the level one controllers. Okay. All right. So next up is the um, background on this top 20 project. So a couple of years ago at S4, you know, which is a um, OT specific uh, you know, thought leadership kind of cybersecurity conference, it happens every year in January in Miami. Um, Jake Brosky did a presentation talking about how there are things we could do at uh, level one. There are things that we could do to improve the security of PLCs, uh, you know, have a, a better posture, security posture, and also be able to uh, help in, in case there is an issue uh, and, and help in forensics and incident response. He did this presentation um, and then post that a lot of people felt like they should be developed further, you know, beyond the presentation uh, to get like a list that the community can actually use. So um, they then registered on, um, you know, an ISA website uh, and, and solicited people to contribute. About a thousand people, you know, register and several dozens actually contributed for the next year. And after a year, we now have this um, uh, PDF file ready that has the top 20 practices. I'll post this uh, link again in the Discord channel, but you can download this. Uh, there is no need to register. You just download it and use it as you as you see fit. But these practices are written for engineers. These are not written for OT practitioners. Of course, OT practitioners um, you know, could use this and pass it on to the engineers, but the key um, 
reason why we did that was we wanted to, to improve the coding of the PLCs themselves, right? So these engineers that are coding these uh, control systems are whom this is targeted towards. Uh, the goals are, you know, obviously to make the PLC code a little bit more robust or at least less vulnerable. Also, you know, use some of these mechanisms, you know, built-in redundancy, you know, software um, coding buildup, uh, some kind of fallback mechanisms, and also you know, improve the secure by design mechanism. And then assistant documentation and logging, et cetera, you know, when you get to an instant response kind of situation. Uh, so we mapped all these practices as much as possible to the minor attack framework for ICS, CWE, you know, ISA standards 62443, as you would expect, right? So that way, you know, we are following industry standards and frameworks, um, but this list is essentially a practices list. It's not a standard by itself. Um, also, it adds a layer of protection in places that none existed before, so uh, thereby the PLC code itself will be less error prone and makes it harder for an attacker uh, to accomplish what they were trying to. That's the goal, you know, one of the goals behind this project. Uh, let's get into this list. So we have these 20 items here. Uh, we're going to take a few examples and elaborate them a little bit more, but um, I just wanted to pause just for a second here so you can see the list of uh, top 20 practices. Again, like I mentioned, I'll, I'll provide the link. You can download this uh, with more detail there. It's like a 40 page document that has all these different um, practices and explains in detail with some examples. All right, let's take, uh, let's go into uh, this list with a simple one first. So one of the practices, uh, practice number two talks about tracking operating modes. So those of you that are very familiar with industrial control systems, you know, I'm showing a PLC here, you know, with some IO and some power supply. As you can see, um, you have a switch here that typically has uh, multiple modes. One of them happens to be run, the other one would be typically program and maybe remote. So the idea being uh, when in run mode, the code is being executed by the PLC. When it's in uh, program mode, you're able to download code to the controller. And when it's in remote, uh, you can then choose whether to program or run you know, from a distance uh, via software. So the guidance here from this practice is to say that uh, you know, keep the PLC in run mode. And if it's not in run mode, it should be an alarm to the operator. And you know, again, at the end of the shift, uh, make sure the alarm pops back up because if someone were working on this PLC, um, the operator would know, right? And they would acknowledge it. And then end of the shift, maybe they close the permit out and then, you know, enable the PLC to go back to run mode. Now, there are reasons why it's typically left in remote because, you know, this might be in a hazardous area. Uh, the engineer might need to put on their coveralls and hard hat and safety boots and to get to this area to, uh, you know, or drive even further out somewhere remote to, to access the switch, or maybe call a buddy operator and ask them to, you know, put this in, um, in a program or when they need to. But the key is, you know, the malicious attacker doesn't have the buddy operator, doesn't have the access to the PLC, right? So we're trying to avoid the risk of this being in remote and someone over the network being able to move uh, the PLC into program mode and download stuff or cause any dis you know, disturbance to the operation. So the recommendation is to you know, keep this in run mode and always um, alert uh, via an alarm on the HMI if it's not in run mode. Now, you might ask the question, you know, there are some PLCs out there that do not have a switch, so what about that? Again, the goal of this practice is to um, uh, kind of give you an example of what we're thinking, what collectively uh, OT practitioners or cybersecurity focused folks are thinking. Uh, you might have to find alternate mechanisms, right? There might be a password that you can um, put to avoid a download or some other way to track, you know, whether the PLC is in a mode that is not running, that is, uh, you know, able to download to the controller. That's what we're trying to avoid um, or alert at the very least, okay? Next up is uh, practice five, another uh, pretty straightforward one. Uh, you know, you, you might see a trend here that some of these things might seem like common sense for IT folks, but then we're in the OT world where um, our common sense is different. Our, what, we, what we developed uh, code for, programming for, uh, is for process, um, 
functionality and efficiency and uh, reliability, not so much for um, security. So again, this practice talks about using a cryptographic hash or a checksum to verify the integrity of the PLC code. Now, um, some PLCs do have a uh, checksum feature where they um, automatically generate a checksum and you, you can save it. Maybe you can even put it on a register and uh, alarm it if, it if it changes. But if you don't have that feature, you can still perform the checksum pretty easily on the engineering workstation, right? Or you can probably do a hash in the EWS of the binary that you just downloaded. So you know that it's the one true code that you are in control of and no one messed with it. So most PLCs can generate or, or check hashes on their own. So you have to do that from the engineering workstation. So again, the key is to um, ensure that you're able to verify the integrity of the code, okay? Next up is um, practice seven. Again, I'm just going through some of the examples so that you get a feel for what these PLC practices are, are doing, right? This happens to be one of my favorite ones where it says validate and alert for paired inputs and outputs. So the way we define these paired inputs are, these are things that physically cannot happen at the same time. So as an example, a valve cannot be open or closed at the same time, right? Or a motor wouldn't have a start or a stop command uh, and a stop command at the same time. So um, that way, if a malicious attacker is trying to just you know, mess with outputs or mess with inputs, you should have a mechanism to say, this is physically not possible, right? So these two signals shouldn't be coming in at the same time. Now, they might be coming because of a limit switch fault or some kind of MCC failure, but having this alert kind of tells you that there's something going on out in the field that you need to inspect or, or troubleshoot, right? That's the idea. Now, um, you know, if possible, I'm using a ladder logic example here, you know, typically you have this motor, start command, uh, if it goes away, uh, then it's stop, right? Uh, but what we're saying here is configure start and stop separately if at all possible. That way it's two different outputs going to the MCC. And if the MCC is able to take those two separate inputs for motor start and stop, that's ideal. And then disallow the rapid change of output states, meaning uh, if some malicious attacker is able to just force this motor start or stop, um, on and off, on and off, right? Um, you should have some kind of software timeout or something that disables the output, uh, you know, from being toggled pretty quickly. Now, uh, you might ask the question, you know, wouldn't the attacker then find, go back in logic and check where that's being stopped and override it? Yes, it's possible, but again, the key is, we're trying to improve the code, right? We're trying to increase the robustness of the code, not necessarily mitigate every single possible attack scenario, uh, but, make it harder for the attacker, make them read the code even further than they already did so far, or not able to just randomly toggle outputs or bits from a Modbus access they have on the network, for example. All right, let's go into another um, slightly more detailed one. So this is um, uh, validate inputs based on plaus you know, the physical plausibility. Um, this is actually cool because you know, PLC gets a lot of inputs, right? It gets, uh, you know, not only the process inputs, it gets all the pressures, temperatures, limits which feedback, many things, right? Um, so if you monitor the expected physical duration, so as an example, there's a valve, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to go from fully closed to fully open, or a tank with a certain fluid uh, it takes certain time to you know, either completely drain or completely fill up. You gotta have a good feel for what these numbers are in a usual process scenario, and then alert when they're different, right? So if someone was um, attacking the bits maliciously or manipulating the transmitter um, signal, the 420 milliamp signal, or um, you know, coming from uh, level three below, you know, just uh, modify some packets or, or, you know, replay attack of, of using some past inputs to, uh, to force inputs currently. Uh, if you track, if you track this uh, physical duration of what it should be currently in this process, and if it's different, if you get an alert, that's a good way to kind of find out if something is wrong with the process or if someone is manipulating it, right? Similarly, you know, monitor expected the uh, physical repeating activity. So some of these uh, wastewater treatment plants have a diurnal cycle where, uh, you know, you, something's happened in the morning, something's happened at night. Now, if whatever should happen in the morning is happening at night, uh, that's atypical, right? Again, alert based on that, alarm based on that. So the operator has an idea. 
And the last one, uh, if you all remember, you know, the most recent Oldsmar, uh, Florida uh, uh, hop where um, someone not only used a remote access to, to log in, uh, which is a traditional IT vulnerability that we all know, you know, remote access credentials, stolen credentials, but they were also able to um, enter a value uh, for lie, you know, which was ten, tens of thousands of times more than, you know, what the actual uh, lie percentage should be. Right now, if you limit the operator entry for set points to what is practical and physically possible, uh, that wouldn't happen. Right now, there are many mitigations. So some of the uh, practices, some of the other practices also have other mitigations for the remote access, for example, or some of the validation and checks on the PLC code. But in this particular case, um, the, the key is to allow, for example, let's say the whole process can only take 5% lie safely uh, in an hour, you should only let the operator enter up to that 5%, right? You shouldn't, just because there is a number on the HMI that they can enter, um, shouldn't be the reason why they have a, a chance to enter 10% or 20%. So that, that avoids mistakes being made. At the same time, um, this allows the malicious attacker, you know, accessing the same input from anywhere else uh, and entering a number that's not physically possible. Okay, that's another cool way to kind of mitigate some of the external threats. Uh, this is another interesting example where you trap false negatives and false positives for critical alerts. You wouldn't do this for all alerts, but uh, let me walk you through a scenario. So let's say this is, um, um, you know, obviously we have many kinds of programming languages, right? So we have function block, we have ladder logic. Uh, this could be a function block example where you have a bunch of conditions and they all have to be true to get this trigger bit as one, okay? And this trigger bit one can then go on and do other things, maybe start stops and pumps, uh, you know, do some other activity in the PLC. But what if uh, a malicious attacker was uh, forcing this trigger bit to zero? on purpose, right? So that the rest of the actions or the sequence doesn't happen. So in this example, we're trying to create an alert for this kind of false negative, right? So this is supposed to be one, but someone uh, maliciously forced it to zero. So if you build an additional piece of logic where you actually take the output of the same um, AND gate here, and then take a knot of this trigger bit uh, that was forced in, in our example, and then AND it to Get this alarm uh, in a forced condition you know this would be zero that means this would be one and this is already one so you then get this alert that hey there is a false negative happening on this particular trigger bit okay you can do something similar for a false positive as well again the key is you know we're trying to add another layer of protection where you could make an argument that an attacker would not only force this, but also force this. That's possible, definitely. But this code normally doesn't exist, right? So many of these things that we're recommending in these practices list, you know, based on a lot of experience over uh, many years uh, by many um, PLC engineers and practitioners, is that the more um, robust you build a code and the more um, uh, kind of checks you built in, uh, the more difficult it is for a malicious attacker to just randomly get lucky and be able to manipulate something. So this false negative will alert you that, uh, you know, someone is forcing this bit uh, on purpose. Next up, um, we have several practices that I kind of combined to say these are kind of similar where you monitor, uh, whereas the previous practices we talked about we're all about verifying integrity. Um, some of these practices are more for monitoring. So for example, let's take this first one, PLC cycle time. I'm using this example here where, you know, the PLC cycle time is fairly predictable, right? Because it's a deterministic um, uh, computer. Um, the process is fairly stable. Um, the IOs and, and everything that's being scanned, you know, there'll be minor variation, but let's say there's a spike in this. It's uh, possible that someone injected some malicious code that acts once in a while and causes more CPU cycle time. Uh, if you trend it on the HMI, then you know over time what's uh, normal and what's not, right? So most PLCs have the cycle time 
uh, allowed to be a trendable point, uh, defined point, but most HMIs don't have this information. So the recommendation here is to do that so that you can track it. So the operator has a better view for what's, what's normal and what's abnormal. Same thing with uh, PLC hard stops. If a PLC ever um, you know, does a reset or a reboot, you should be able to log that and record it. Um, and also PLC uptime. It's kind of like the um, alternate for the hard stop, right? So uh, when was the last time the PLC started and how long has it been running? Um, again, that should be something that should be logged. And um, same thing with the memory usage. So the P um, the PLC memory usage is fairly constant, fairly stable. And if it's changing for whatever reason, it's likely that someone is messing with, um, uh, with the code or it might be something wrong with the, the device itself or something else wrong in the system. Um, these monitoring ideas or, or these practices are, are crucial during incident response because oftentimes, um, you know, you walk into a plant after an incident and you have no idea uh, what's actually normal, what's good for the process, what's expected, what's not expected. But if you're able to log and trend them on the HMI and then even store them on the uh, workstation or on the on the historian, you then have a way to kind of verify, you know, some of the previous practices we talked about verifying the code and validating the integrity of the binary that you downloaded the code to the, to the controller. Uh, and if you assist this with this kind of data to say this is normal and you know whatever is happening now is not normal so if you have the comparison then you know you can really do a better instant response because you have a, a good feel for what's what's normal what's not abnormal what's abnormal um this project is ongoing it's evolving um, the version one that's published on the plc-security.com website uh, we're always looking for more contributors we're looking for more people to get involved in the project um, if you are an ot practitioner i would request that you um, pass on this information to your ics engineers people that you're working with across the plant floor or in headquarters uh, and you yourself can contribute to the project along with those ICS engineers, either with the PLC knowledge or you know, any of the standards work, uh, the ISA, ISC uh, 62443 or the CWE. Uh, we are in, we're seeing a lot more people interested in uh, natively improving the functionality on the level one devices. You know, the more um, recent devices have some kind of built-in encryption, they have more authentication options, but these practices are meant for uh, even older PLCs. So um, if you invest a little bit of time, you'll be able to improve the security posture and help incident response on even older PLCs with these practices. But the key is to educate these clients, you know, our customers, your customers, on the existence of these coding practices. These did not exist before, right? So if someone asked you, hey, how could I better defend level one? You didn't have a good answer. But now these practices exist and uh, you can pass them on this document. Similarly, you know, if you're buying something new in the OT world, uh, don't restrict yourself to um, level two or above. Um, requirements, right? Um, those you know coming from IT, uh, a lot of uh, IT-like requirements are being passed on to OT, you know, whether it's about patching or virtual um, computers. A lot of um, relatively recent developments in the OT world have been restricted to level two and above, you know, learning from IT. But pass on these requirements, you know, don't just give them this document to say, follow these because this is not a standard, but the concepts behind these practices. Uh, please pass on this uh, document to them, giving them the, the, the background that it's the intent behind these practices. Here's what we're trying to defend. And here are some of the examples of how you do it in an Allen Bradley PLC or a Triconix or a GPLC. So uh, put them in the uh, vendor RFQs and uh, you know, ask for more security at level one and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. That's the end of uh, my presentation. Awesome. Whenever I hear about PLCs, it always just brings me back to like Darknet Diaries talks of like Uber APT hacks and stuff like that. It's the first thing 
that comes to mind. I can't remember the episode, but I literally just listened to it. Uh, how'd you get into this type of security originally? So uh, my background is industrial control systems. Back when uh, I started, I was a controls instrumentation technician. So there was no security focus like 20 years ago, right? Because we just did everything based on functionality, reliability, how to get the process to um, you know improve. But then don't chuckle, but stocks not change the world. <laughs> you know, if, someone was, if someone was doing a, a bingo, then they were like, yeah, they're waiting for it. But the reality is, uh, you know, the, Average Joe, like me, you know, did not think about PLC or industrial security before then. But mm -hmm. uh, since then, the interesting thing is the APT like uh, behavior, um, so far from what we know, has only happened five times uh, mm -hmm. in the industrial security world. So, the past decade, uh, there is a um, there is a group of people, uh, significant experience, a lot of knowledge that say we should not focus on these APTs because so far they've only been five attacks versus thousands of attacks off, you know, ransomware type or mm -hmm. IT like, you know, that happen every second, right? And a colonial pipeline is a good example. Yeah. Now, Old Smart Florida is another example. You see these, you know, remote um, access credentials being dumped on, you know, whatever, some kind of watering hole attack and, you know, got some information or, uh, you know, two-factor authentication not being used, something goofy, something simple that an average IT person would be like, why in the world? Like, this is 2021. Like, why are we not doing these basic things is the question, right? But those things happen routinely. But, um, you know, the APT, like, you know, long range attack needing, you know, access to level one or, or um, some kind of jumping the air gap environment and, and beyond the DMZ, those, those things can happen. But, you know, for the average company, you know, whether it's, uh, I say average, even bigger companies like Colonial or, or JBS or whoever, uh, most of the attack scenarios are not at level one. So they are mostly coming from the internet facing, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, some kind of cloud bucket that's misconfigured or, you know, some kind of IT like issue that, you know, like, you know, yeah. it's happening every second and, and that's, that'll continue to happen in that world. So o OT, um, you know, is, is not immune to OT specific attacks. Uh, we're not saying that at all, but the, the attack surface is much bigger coming in from the IT. We're working from a threat intelligence field, I wonder how many attacks have actually occurred that no, that have just been swept under the rug too, right? Like I feel five is so low. There has to be a decent amount out there that everyone's like, you know what? No one talk about this. Uh, we don't it's want to talk right? right? Yeah, nothing <laughs> happened. We, there's no logs. There's no way to prove it. Well, it, it's interesting you say that because, uh, you know, these are all cyber physical systems, right? So of these five, you know, when you think about crash override or, you know, Havex or uh, even Stuxnet, there is usually a physical device or physical process that got disrupted at the end. And that's how you tend to know. So, mm -hmm. yes, it's possible that, uh, you know, everyday industrial uh, plants go through outages and, if it's because of some kind of liability issue or if it's because of some instrument failure or mechanical issue or mm -hmm. you know, malicious attacker doing something on their own, we wouldn't know unless they tell us. But usually there is a cyber physical element at the very end that's disruptor. So you, you would think you would know, like it's hard to, um, escape from that fact like you would ask the question hey there's a flare you know I, I used to work in houston and there's a flare on the east side of the ship channel like what happened well they have to give you the answer that hey you know we we screwed up you know somebody did some uh, mistake and and so we we had to flare or you know this device failed and so we had to flare or whatever right so um now of course i haven't heard saying oh we were attacked <laughs> and so that's why we were flaring but that's possible you know that might be uh this decade, right? So it didn't happen last decade. It doesn't mean the future will follow what we, what we saw in the last year. The last I think that as a deterrent, just because it hasn't happened, it probably won't happen. It's like, just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it's not going to happen. <laughs> right, right. Well, no one's come after us yet, yeah, but the day is coming. The target pool is lessening yeah. every day. Right. Oh my goodness. Right. But that's the interesting piece. If you look at a lot of vendors selling security products, it's hard for them, right? Because uh, you know, if you walk into a C-suite and say, hey, here's my product that'll, that'll save you from X, but the X hasn't happened yet, uh, you know, how do you get funding for that X, right? So 
that's why you know I, I work for a vendor as well, and uh, what we focus on is uh, you know the current attack surface, right? And you mentioned threat intel, you know, follow the money, right? So what is threat intel telling us? Where are the exploits right now? Or well, they happen to come from um, you know remote access or some kind of VPN or uh, you know some kind of credential theft? Focus on that today. Oh, by the way, while you're at it, if you're improving your security posture, buy a tool or a suite of tools that you can expand into OT that can protect you on these other possible scenarios. That way, you know, you're not starting from scratch. If you wake up one day and you notice maybe in your industry or in a sister industry that something similar, you know, because these PLCs could be used in so many industries, right? From healthcare to transportation, to power, to oil and gas. So just because something did not happen in power or oil and gas, doesn't mean we cannot learn from something that already happened in healthcare or mm -hmm. in transportation. So absolutely. The other common thing I see is that people don't really know their own mitigation arsenal well enough they don't know the capabilities of everything that they have so like oh we need a solution for this and it's like well did you know that the thing you have literally has that capability if you would just turn it on or pay for the extra service or whatever so people are out there not even fully utilizing the benefits of the things they already have and so you might not need to go out and get something or you might have the ability to plug a hole where you just haven't realized it yet or people don't properly deploy things in the first place they don't get those sessions with those like support engineers they don't um you know sign up for the proper onboarding they just want to take it out of the box and plug it in and spin it up and do i see assets in there this is so fun super cool we'll work on tuning that later and then they never do it those manuals are long and boring all right no one wants to read those like guess who's reading them me like <laughs> <Bad teamers. laughs> we are reading waiting the security manuals that's what i gotta do before i wait through the logs yeah y'all are awesome in that uh you know red team always trying to help the blue teamers right about you know what, what the holes are i think the biggest gap we have is time and and resources right there's only so many things like the average controls engineer in a typical refinery that i know of is dealing with a hundred different control systems any given yeah. day a hundred i'm not even joking right and um, you know, they're, they're not looking to um, improve on security. They're just trying to maintain the plant and have the plant reliably operate. So they're not thinking about security every given second. So we need to fundamentally improve the security when we offer these products to them, right? Um, it's so hard, like any user, right? Like if you give them, if you give an average user, taking an IT example, if you give them a Windows 10 box and expect them to maintain it, that's one thing. But if you give them a Windows XP box, and and expect them to you know keep it secure now that's not practical right like you're not yeah. helping them win so in a lot of these situations industrial controls have had that uh, legacy where you know you run these things for 25 30 years and they were never built with security in mind so you know they got they got a piece of cheese so you're trying to you know tell them to protect the cheese like how is that possible right my, my dad is a SCADA engineer for a local utility. And he was like, I got in there and he just, he's put so much security in because he's actually a very security centric person. And um, he tells me about the things that he does. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Cause yeah, like, he's a that's star, not, like uh, very few that we have, you know? Yeah. Cause for you guys, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You guys are probably getting a dozen hits a day from people trying to take you down, you know, just ping them a little bit and see how it's going. So it really is very, very crucial for ICSs right. specifically. The next challenge for him, if you ask him, he'll tell you the same thing. The next challenge for him is where and how can he transition? Like, let's say he gets a promotion and suddenly, you know, there's no one to fill his shoes. So that plan needs a backup plan and they typically don't have it. Right? So he can't leave the plant in someone's safe hands because there's no one to take the mantle over from him. That's a challenge we have. Exactly. That, that is a problem is like people like him are very hard to find. Um, yeah. he'll, so he'll probably have to do some succession planning. That's another thing that <laughs> IT professionals don't do a ton is succession planning. Like, um, you know, when I vacated my last pen testing position, I was the only do it person doing all the offensive and security testing at all. And when I left, it fell onto the InfoSec program manager who, while she had the capability, didn't have the bandwidth. And it took them six months to backfill me. And now that person is still not up to speed. And it's like, you know, the more succession planning you do, like the more planning you do, period, the more prepared you are for when ch changes happen, sudden changes. Right. I mean, you mentioned succession planning, and I'll add 
separation of duties and job rotation. None of these exist <laughs> in the OT world, especially. No, it's just one guy or one gal that knows how this thing works. <laughs> and as long as they're around, you know, you can keep yeah. it, you know, kind of. It's not even written down. down anywhere. It's just in his head. So then when it goes <laughs> down, you got to call him and be like. <laughs> Literally, someone retired and took the whole InfoSec program with them. Like, they didn't write it down. Um, yeah. My tiny unicorn. Um, no, one of the biggest things that gets me is, like, in all of my security, like, academic documentation that we have and, like, all the teachings that I just completed in my master's, it's, like, force vacations, job rotation, like, learn a new capability, sh shadow someone new, force them to take vacations. And then in reality, it's like, don't you dare take a vacation. You need two hours for surgery, you get two hours and have your phone on. It's like, we're not enforcing any of that. We're not doing these secure things. We are not doing any of these things that we, at the very basic, say everyone should be doing because we are so short staffed and we are so hyper concerned with like that one person not vacating their post at any cost. Yeah. Big challenge for sure. All right. Do we have uh, any questions from the audience? I don't know if we see any in the Discord. Someone said amazing presentation. Thank you so much. We all agree that ICS is like a unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess that's in theme with, uh, with the current GrimCon for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think I should get one of those hats. Uh, is it a hat or a tiara or how do you get that? It's like a headband. It's like a little... Oh, headband. Yeah, there you go. You steal it from your I children. Stole from you headband. I stole it. Yeah. I, I think that's one thing that, you know, if we ever get to meet Bryson in person, you know, given COVID and all, you know, we should ask him to distribute more of these. Yeah. I think all speakers should get a unicorn headband, like for... <laughs> For uniform purpose. Unicorn headbands instead of set of uh, business cards. He just hands those out with his name and number on the porn. That'll be great. Oh. A little QR code on the back. Ooh, yeah, there you oh, go. There you go. Now we're cooking with fire. Might as well throw GPS tracking in it too, you know, and then just make it. <laughs> might as well actually. Might as well make that QR code go to a malicious landing page where we have a. <laughs> listening back <laughs> just I'm just kidding, children, don't do that that's very bad and very illegal don't do it well you're then forcing people right you know, if you get one bad yeah. experience you learn from it you're, you're then forcing <laughs> people to deploy all your links on a virtual machine that they can burn <laughs> you're telling them what to do so we do have one comment and it's jason asking you to stick around for the next talk uh which I'm guessing Jason is the next talk, but. <laughs> I'll be happy to. Yeah, I've been really enjoying the conference myself. Uh, I, I couldn't attend one, but because it's always a challenge, right? Which track you're on, but uh, I've, I've seen like three presentations so far. I really loved it. Awesome. So we still got, we got 10 minutes. Would you like to stay in our discussion about tacos? Yes, we are about to have a very San Diego needed you're discussion about tacos. You're, oh, you've course. lived in Houston, so I know you've Absolutely. had at least text me. <laughs> That's right. I've had my fair share of tacos and, and really good opinions about them, too. Ooh, okay, okay. So My favorite taco of all time is still the fish taco. I love a fish taco. Where? From where? <sighs> Don't say Rubio's. No, I mean, their bowls are pretty good. They're like, they're like pretty good if you got to stop. tacos here, not bowls. I'm probably gonna go with like Wonderland Bar. That's a where's that? I don't even know. OB. It's an OB. Ocean right Beach. There at the end of, yeah. Right yeah, there at the end of the boulevard where it curves around. Those I, I, are I ask a simple question morning. because uh, that's what was on Twitter this morning. Someone posted and said there should never be an option to have two tacos. <laughs> the whole thread was about you should get a chance to get one taco or three tacos, but no two taco business. Yeah. Why are there taco flights too? I don't want three of one kind of taco. I want one of like, like you have 12 tacos. I want to try multiple tacos. Naturally. I want like yeah. a tiny sampler of each of your 12 tacos. You go to, so, so San Diego, if you go to San Diego, you have to go to Tacos El Gordo, right? So Tacos El Gordo, the closest, they were going to build one in Little Italy, but I think the closest one it's closer to the border off of H Street in National City. And I've never been there. You've never been there? 
I don't think so. They have they have one in in East County now. That, that's like a brother, but they have Adobada tacos. Those are the best. Those are the best. You know, I, I don't know which ones you like. I mean, so being in in Houston, right? Being in Texas, that there are two distinct groups. So one is the actual Mexican tacos, and the other one is Tex-Mex. So um, they also joke about gringo tacos, where if you go to a place called Torchies, it's in Austin and in uh, in Houston, they have special names for these tacos. These are, you know, five dollar tacos, not your typical. Yeah. Um, you know, one dollar tacos you get, but they have uh, unique names, and and either you you love them or you don't, right? So people that love them because the ambiance, the atmosphere is is wonderful, and you can pick like uh, like she was saying, you can pick a platter of completely different tacos, one of each kind, and uh, that way you get to choose everything, you know, from a weird combination to you know vegetarian to kind of beef, okay. you know, beef and, and fish mix. So the, the world is your oyster. I, I guess that talks about an oyster as well in a taco, but I've never tried. But. I've never had an oyster taco. I've had some weird tacos. Like I've gone straight cabeza and lengua and like you name it. So even, even uh, venturing as far as lumpia, which is like a Filipino egg roll in tacos. That's nice. But uh, I go, TJ, like I, Tijuana style taco is usually what I go for, which is just like little tortilla, a little bit of meat, usually two tortillas and you go in on it. But there's living in San Diego, you just have a plethora of places to go. Oh, yeah. 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 Especially that. Well, I always start with Alpa Store, you know, when I'm when I'm not sure of a new place, I start with Alpa Store. If, it, oh, if yeah. they can make that, because that's the simplest you can make, right? A little bit of pork and a pineapple. Oh, yeah. and if you can make that right, <laughs> okay, that's a good place. Yeah, Similar no, to how I order a margarita pizza to test an Italian place, order an Al Pusto taco to test a taco place. A taco uh, that's, that is a that's that is the key. Uh, <laughs> man, now I'm hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. We don't have a break. <laughs> I'm over here yeah, drinking I'm my second I'm thinking about tacos. So I'm gonna have to Uber Eats myself. There you go. Oh wait, wait, I got an update. One second. So we got Jason going on in the next five minutes. Jason is going recording. Jason, are you in the Discord? Oh, so Jason is here. Oh, he's in here? No, he's not. He's oh, I'm asking. I think Jason is here, but he's recording. There he is. Okay. Just making sure. I I just saw an email come in and I wanted to verify. Now, should I exit this presenter mode and then join as another um Oh, I already I already stole presenter from you. You're fine. You can stay and hang out. You can you have uh, the right script away. You can, you can leave. You can do whatever you want. I'm fine. You can stay okay. with us the rest of the talks if you really want. Gotcha. Uh, I'll probably end and join back as uh just a participant. That way it's cleaner and then I can use my iPad for it. Uh, Thanks for chatting with all. All right, yeah, it's awesome having you. Thank you for showing up. Bye now. Mayo, did you ever go to to Blue Water off of India Street for fish tacos? Blue Water. No, I went to Water Grill. Uh, no, I did go to Blue Water, I think, once. Not like not like often. It wasn't like one of my regular spots, but. Okay. Excellent fish tacos. Not too far away from where Wild West Hackenfest next year should be, maybe. But we'll make a run. We'll have to, because like now I need to know where the good tacos are. I mean, if there's good tacos and I'm not involved, then I'm, you know, personally angry. All right. Three minutes. I have the talk queued up. Jason is in chat. Should we start a little early or are you good? Jason, are you good? Everyone's gonna be like, why did track two finish 15 minutes early? Well, we're like, well, we started each and talk three minutes early until we were off schedule and we're just going rogue over here in track two. Hey, we do, we do track. us, all right? This is what happens when they give us the power, me and you. Ultimate cosmic power. I mean, shame on them, shame on us. All right. So what is this next talk about? What is the title? I have no clue. You didn't look? Oh, I totally would have looked. All right, you didn't look the back? 
always look inside the bag. It's black, by the way, sir. It says only you can. All right, I'm just making. Oh, I'm, I got muted somehow. Did you mute me? Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. How about now? That was yeah, now weird. You're now you're back. People have arrived when uh, something happened. It didn't like me throwing the video out there. It did not. I, it still says it, it cannot be viewed on your device. All right, awesome. Quit muting me. I'm not an attendee. You're muted now. You're muted now. Do it, do it. All right, people, enjoy. All right, awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for choosing to spend some time with me here today. Uh, my name is Jason Allnut, and this is my presentation on industrial control systems related cybersecurity events and malware, and specifically the five listed here on my, my title slide. Uh, before I begin, I, I feel necessary to say thank you to GrimCon for giving me this opportunity to, to speak with you all today. This is my first chance to uh, present at a cybersecurity conference, uh, and I'm just incredibly uh, grateful and excited to be here. So with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I studied electrical engineering uh, in college. I did have a, a concentration or a focus in, in power systems. So uh, ICS and infrastructure is, is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, while I was in college, I, I got a chance to intern at a, a small power plant here in Maryland, uh, which was a wonderful experience and gave me a lot of hands-on uh, experience in the field. Uh, but from there, I went on and became an RF test engineer with a nationally recognized test lab. Uh, and then that led to my current role as a program manager with IEEE. And before I go on any further, I do need to put out the disclaimer that the, the thoughts and perspective and opinions here uh, are solely my own and do not reflect that of IEEE or, or any of my past affiliations. So just want to throw that out there. I'm sure people are used to hearing it, but uh, yeah. So a little bit about this presentation. This is a pet project of mine. I, I'm not a cybersecurity professional. I'm actually an enthusiast and a hobbyist. Uh, and ICS cybersecurity is is something that really gets me going. And I think there's a lot more people like me. So I made this presentation for electrical engineers uh, who you know, might be in, in the um, industrial sector or work on power systems uh, and, and hear about Black Energy 3 or Triton or uh, Stuxnet, but maybe you haven't had a chance to dive in any further. Uh, so hopefully this can be a little bit of a, a primer on, on those for them. Uh, also, uh, same goes for cybersecurity professionals who aren't in the ICS space, right? Uh, there's a lot of opportunities now, um, a lot of jobs opening up in ICS. So uh, hopefully this presentation can be a, a tool for them uh, as well. And then anyone else who will listen. Like I said, I'm a hobbyist, I'm an enthusiast, and I suspect there's other people like me um, who might really appreciate this information and, and sort of the way I've laid it out here, which, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, so what you can expect, uh, I've tried to summarize these, these five malwares and events as best I can. Uh, so there's a slide with some bullet points, there's some images, there's some icons, um, and, and just going to do like a really quick summary of, of each of them. I've also tried to add some additional tidbits and perspective, my own perspective, uh, with my background in electrical engineering and, um, and power systems. So uh, hopefully the people appreciate that. Uh, and then just be, um, you know, just helpful tools, right? So I really tried to, to put things in here that people can, you know, come back to if they want to say, oh, which, which, which event was which, who was involved with what, who were the players, what was important about that or this. Uh, so, so I've tried to put in some helpful tools in here. And, and like I said, you'll see more of that as we go ahead uh, through this. So the first uh, event or malware here is Havocs. Uh, there's a reason why I started with Havocs. It's a little out of place uh, chronologically, uh, but I thought it was a good place to start. And, and again, here, I've tried to put in some images to, to jog people's memory and, and put some, some you know, images with uh, 
wherever they're going to store this in their brain. <laughs> Uh, Havix. Havix is a malware that included uh, an ICS module, which is why it's considered one of the ICS uh, malwares. It was discovered in 2013. Uh, its, its sole intent, its real intent was, was espionage, um, it, enumeration, uh, discovery. It didn't really have any damaging effects or intent as, as far as I know or as far as my research could tell me. Uh, but yeah, it was solely just to, to give uh, uh, attackers, if you will, uh, insight into OT networks, operational technology networks and environments. Uh, there wasn't really a, a target event, site, country. I did see some reports that say United States and, and Europe were the, were the sole focus. I, I don't know if that's how cooperated that is. Uh, but the, the noteworthy thing about uh, Havix is the OPC module, the Open Platform Communication, which is a, a common industrial communication protocol. Uh, I, I'm not very familiar with it myself, but if you participate in any ICS uh, capture the flag events or you know just even research this stuff even a little bit, you're gonna see OPC quite a bit. Um, and Havix included a module uh, that was able to uh, do an OPC scanner, right? And enumerate uh, OT environments based off of, of this OPC uh, protocol. Some common protocol uh, ports uh, that the scanner looked for, uh, I've highlighted here in this third to last bullet point, uh, port 44818, 105, and 502. Uh, I tried to align those with with common protocols that are you know out there. I, I'm not sure how much how relevant that is, but these are are common ports that industrial manufacturers and vendors use, and so that's what really kind of gives this away as as ICS related. The other interesting part uh, about Havix that I like to point out is the uh, intrusion or distribution or propagation of, of the uh, malware. And so I've put some helpful icons here, but phishing emails, which I think a lot of people are familiar with now, uh, Trojanized software, uh, software with like, you know, like it says, a, a Trojan piece to it, uh, and then watering hole attacks. And watering hole attacks, as I was doing this research, uh, kept coming up as a, as a real interesting part of this. So, you know, the idea is that the attackers monitored websites that uh, industrial engineers, or it, <laughs> not industrial engineers, but engineers in, uh, you know, the power and energy sector or, or in industrial environments would frequent. Uh, they infected those websites so that when the engineers went there, they were downloading malware instead of, you know, whatever they were expecting to download or, or receive. So uh, the last part of, of all of these is I do try to align the attribution. Uh, I know that's a taboo subject, but it, it seemed remiss not to include it because it is well documented in lots of places. So do with that what you want. I'm not gonna pay too much mind to it, but I did include it in uh, my little scorecard here that you can see um, on the right. So with any of these uh, events and malware, uh, it's important to bring up the Purdue uh, model. This is obviously very well known among probably the cybersecurity community, very well known around the ICS cybersecurity community, but you know, electrical engineers probably don't really think about this all that much. Uh, and what this is, the Purdue model, is it, it breaks down the segmentation between you know, corporate enterprise IT networks, kind of the traditional IT networks that we all think about uh, with an organization uh, down into the different layers when the you know industrial control engineers you know come into play right your SCADA engineers and your field techs and just all the way down to the devices there in level zero that actually do the work the actuators the sensors the conveyor belts that move and, and whatever else have you uh, so I like to I like to show this because with all of these events in malware uh, they all have a part where you know. Um, a pivot from the IT, the traditional enterprise network into the OT environment took place at some point, right? And so this kind of helps illustrate, you know, how that might happen or, or you know, where that might go. So I hope people appreciate that. Uh, also, I try to include the uh, MITRE ATT&CK ICS framework TTPs for each one of these in a longer uh, version of this presentation. I would try to go into 
you know, some of these different TTB, some of the more common ones and the common mitigation uh, or remedies for them. Uh, that was some great feedback I got from another person out in the industry to, to always talk about mitigations. But unfortunately, I just, I don't have enough time here today, but I did include this. I, I think it's uh, good visually. Stuxnet. Uh, Stuxnet is the most probably well-known uh, malware uh, talked about whenever you talk about ICS cybersecurity. Probably don't need to tell anybody here that. Uh, I know a lot of people probably roll their eyes when they hear it because, you know, oh, here we go again. Uh, but as I was doing this project, this was the most exciting part for me because it's just such a dense topic and it's, it, it has no end, <laughs> it feels like, whether you're talking technically or uh, geopolitically or, you know, just down to the, the individual people and their narratives. It's, it's, it's just extremely fascinating. And it really kind of reminded me of another event um, that if you ever go to a power and energy conference, you're absolutely going to hear almost to the same cadence that Stuxnet is. And that's the 2003 Northeastern blackout. Uh, this satellite picture here shows it, you know, is a blackout happened in 2003, uh, spanned all the way from Ohio to New York, down to Maryland, up through Canada. Um, and it's, it's, it's widely, widely known, widely talked about. It's a great use case. And I think, you know, I wanted to put the 2003 Northeastern blackout and Stuxnet sort of on a similar plateau, if you will, um, as just wonderful use case examples that uh, there's just endless amount of things to learn from. But what was Stuxnet? It was a, a, a incredibly complicated malware. Um, it, its target was the Siemens PLCs that eventually controlled the centrifuges uh, for uranium enrichment process uh, in the Tons, Iran. Uh, what usually gets talked about with Stuxnet is the, the four zero days. Uh, and when I was putting this project together, I thought it would be really fun to go and find uh, the actual you know, write-ups uh, of those CVEs on, on NIST's website. And I've included those links here if anyone else is interested. Um, one, one interesting piece that I just can't get over and I always talk about now is that a, actually a fifth zero day was sort of included in the, in the Stuxnet development. Uh, in, a, in an earlier version, and I found that to be incredibly fascinating. Uh, oh, and I should also talk through the scorecard here. So uh, it was discovered in 2010. Its likely intent was to actually break the uranium enrichment process. Uh, the, the target country, obviously Iran, the target site, although not a nuclear power plant, my icon's a little deceiving there, it was the uranium enrichment uh, plant. Uh, noteworthy tech, Windows and Siemens, and the initial intrusion uh, was USB sticks, right? So USB sticks uh, that were infected with the malware left around the site. Eventually those USB sticks got plugged into engineering workstations. The malware then uh, pivoted onto the engineering workstations. Uh, and then eventually uh, because the PLCs, the Siemens PLCs that were the intended target were actually air gapped uh, from you know, the common network, uh, the, the intent and the hope by the attackers was that the engineers would carry the malware on their engineering workstations over the air gap to the PLCs um, and eventually um, you know, the, the end place where the malware was intended to end up. Uh, the malware would then um, uh, plant itself on a PLC um, and then start to control the converters that controlled the speed of the centrifuges. And centrifuges are incredibly delicate, fragile machines. I mean, they're, they're big spinning, uh, machines, but they're they're kind of fragile in nature, uh, and so any kind of manipulation of them can can eventually end up uh, tearing them apart. Uh, attribution is the United States and Israel. That's well documented and talked about, although never confirmed. Um, again, you know, do with that information uh, what you want. So, what I think is lost. Maybe not lost, but you know we're in the day and age of ransomware, right? Uh, ransomware everywhere, and ransomware when it shows up, it's loud and it's noisy, and it, it makes itself known. Hey, I've I've come and I've encrypted your files, <laughs> pay me money. Uh, but Stuxnet and and some of these other uh, uh, malwares, uh, you know, their real crux was their their subtlety, right, and their patience and their ability to sit dormant and wait because you know their their intent is this, to create this destruction but kind of go unnoticed. And that's exactly what Stuxnet was trying to do. And so I tried to put together, this is one of my big brain visual ideas, uh, this, this sort of visual of just how long and over what period the Stuxnet worm operated 
uh, versus like you know sitting dormant, right? So once Stuxnet made its way onto one of the PLCs, the Siemens PLCs, it actually sat dormant for 12 or 13 days, did nothing. Uh, well, technically it, it recorded uh, and logged what was going on. But on that 14th day, uh, it would then increase the speed of the centrifuge uh, from you know 1,064 hertz to 1,400 hertz uh, for 15 minutes. That's it, for, for 15 minutes. And for that 15 minutes, um, the malware was also able to replay what it had recorded from the previous 13 days and give back to the control center you know, what was a, a normal reading. Uh, but then after that 15 minutes, it would go back to normal and then it would sit dormant again for 26 days. Uh, and then on the, the 41st day there, uh, for 51 minutes, it would decrease the speed uh, from 1,064 hertz down to two hertz. Uh, from what I understand, it, the centrifuges never actually made it to two hertz. That would be pretty noticeable if uh, you know something spinning at 1,000 hertz all of a sudden was just started spinning at two hertz. Uh, but but the idea was that it would it would slow down enough uh, during that 50 minutes that it would create damage, um, and then and then after that 50 minutes, go back into a dormant state wait 26 days and then repeat the process. And if it hadn't already created the damage in the centrifuge, uh, it you know probably would you know on its next iteration. So you're looking at 65 minutes of manipulation over 67 days. And I, I just think that's just the most fascinating part of Stuxnet uh, that I like to, to tell people is you know when these things are in your system, they can play the long game. You know they can play the long con. And, and Stuxnet sure is a, is a great example of that. Again, TTP is much more complicated than Havix, a lot more highlighted here. I, I greatly encourage everybody to, to look these up if you have time. Uh, Black Energy 3. Black Energy 3 and Crash Override are always spoken about in tandem. You'll see why here in a minute, um, but yeah, we'll just go right into it. Black Energy 3 is a malware that led to the interruption of, um, of the electrical power in Ukraine for about a quarter of a million people uh, in December of 2015. Its intent was to turn out the lights. Uh, that's an oversimplification, obviously, but I think it uh, kind of describes it pretty well. Um, the target was Ukraine. Uh, the target site was three electric distribution utilities, uh, distribution being the key word there. Uh, and the best word that I learned during this whole project, uh, Obernergos, which is the name for utilities in Ukraine. So that's a fun one to say. Uh, the noteworthy tech is kind of hard to describe because Black Energy 3, although it's considered an ICS malware, uh, the, the ICS part of it really came down to the target, which were these utilities, uh, which were targeted through spear phishing campaigns. So, you know, campaigns that were targeting these, these IT personnel at these utilities, um, slightly different than just a, a general phishing campaign. And, uh, and then the manipulation by the attackers once they got a foothold in the system. So uh, the, the malware, the Black Energy 3, uh, created a foothold in the Obernergos. Uh, the attackers were then able to enumerate and investigate, do espionage, um, create some, some changes while they were in there. Um, a couple of things that they did was they uh, reconfigured the uninterruptible power supply uninterruptible power supplies uh, for the control rooms, uh, installed kill disk, um, also corrupted some of the firmware for some of the serial to ethernet converters that, that talked from the substation uh, out into the field, or excuse me, the control room to the substations. Uh, and then, you know, on the day of their attack, um, they were able to basically log in, uh, take control, uh, turn some breakers off, uh, create a bunch of havoc, uh, when, when, you know, uh, the uninterruptible power so sources were supposed to turn on, they, they weren't because they were misconfigured. Uh, when power was restored to the control room, the kill disk uh, made the engineering workstations inoperable, or at least some of them. Um, and then even furthermore, uh, the control room wasn't able to communicate out into the field because of the uh, misconfiguration of the firmware of the serial to ethernet converters. So, uh, a, a lot going on there, but again, what I want to emphasize is that Black Energy 3 didn't actually have those pieces in it, you know, coded into it. Uh, Black Energy 3 created the foothold, and then uh, it was actual manipulation by the attackers to, to uh, execute the, the, the attack. Again, it was attributed to uh, Russia and, and the, the APT group Sandworm. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next one. Uh, the TTPs here, uh, much more scarce. I'm not really sure why. I, I just collected this information from MITRE Attack Frameworks uh, site. So, um, you know, do with that what you wish. Uh, but then crash override. So crash override, uh, again, in tandem with Black Energy 3, because again, it was Russia attacking Ukraine, uh, crash override almost one year to the date, uh, which has got to make for a frustrating year. Oh, yes, this. Uh, I always appreciate when people point out the obvious to me, because you know what's obvious to one person isn't always obvious to another person. And I've actually been asked this question, what is the difference between crash override and in destroyer? They mean the same thing. Uh, they're just the, the same event with two different names by two different organizations. Dragos uh, coined this crash override. ESET um, out of Slovakia uh, coined this in Destroyer. But for the most part, they're the same thing. So, so please don't let someone trip you up with that. But yes, uh, crash override took place in 2016. Again, the likely intent was to turn out the lights, target country Ukraine. The difference uh, with crash override uh, than black energy is the target here was actually transmission um, transmission utilities, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but that's, that's a big difference that I like to harp on. Uh, and another big difference is crash override actually included the ICS modules uh, to enumerate and infiltrate and make manipulations to the system on its own. So it didn't necessarily need that attacker remote access to come in uh, and make changes and execute the attack. It's, it's a, considered a malware framework. Uh, and I've highlighted some of the uh, um, communication protocols that were included with, with the malware. Uh, but something that is really great that's highlighted well in industry and a lot of these papers and talks is that it would be very easy to include other protocols into the malware framework. And one such protocol that gets referenced a lot is DNP3, uh, which, which would make uh, crash override a little bit more uh, applicable to North America's grid. Uh, and I don't think it should stop there either, right? DNP3, Modbus, 2030.5, uh, I'm listing some IEEE standards. Uh, but yeah, so uh, just something uh, relevant, you know, if somebody says, like, oh, crash override, that was only in Europe. Uh, it, it could be applicable here in North America if somebody, I guess, took the time. Uh, there was a vulnerability found uh, with, with the malware that I, I, I want to point out here that didn't actually uh, take effect per se from what I understand. Uh, but what they found was that uh, Black Enter, or excuse me, Crash Override was able to put uh, some of the Siemens Ciprotec relays into a firmware update state uh, that made the relays look like they were operational but in fact, we're not operational. They were actually waiting for a firmware update. Uh, and if you, it, well, I guess I didn't mention this, but what with Black Energy 3 and Crash Override, one of the things that was discovered was that Ukraine's uh, electrical grid uh, is has a lot of legacy equipment and a lot of engineers who know how to do manual overrides. And uh, that really um, helped in its ability to come back online so quickly. Um, versus you know, a more digital or automated uh, grid, maybe like we have here in North America. And so if you think about it with these relays looking like they're functioning uh, and a bunch of engineers manually putting the system back online, thinking, oh, I've got protection down the line because that PLC is working, that could create a lot of damage um, if, uh, if, if it really had worked the way that it was intended. Thankfully, it didn't work that way. Uh, but I, I want to bring this up because these are the types of things that engineers need to be watching out for, right? This, this in-between firmware update state that people probably see every day with like, oh, that's just the way it works. Don't worry about it. You know, these are the things that attackers are really going to harp on and, and pounce on as an opportunity. So just wanted to bring that up. Uh, again, Russia, Sandworm. Uh, there's a book by Andy Green Greenberg called Sandworm that's just an incredible read. And so I got a lot of information from that and I just wanted to give kudos. So again, TTPs. Um, oh, the, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Black Energy 3 looked at the distribution system and Crash Override was focused on the transmission system. And that's a big distinction here. I really, I really, the intent of this slide deck in this presentation is to really line these events up next to one another and be able to tell you know what what one uh 
event targeted and what the other one targeted and, you know, kind of pick and choose, you know, what applies to you. So hopefully this helps. Um, I'd love to talk more about this, uh, but um, yeah, if you have any questions, please hit me up. Also, I think it's good to put into perspective, you know, these events compared to some other ones. So I spoke a little bit about the 2003 North American power outage affected about 55 million people, 23,000 uh, megawatts lost lasted four days. If you think about this year uh, with the 2021 Texas energy crisis affected about 5 million people lasted three days. Uh, Black energy three and crash override lasted six hours and one hour respectively. Uh, I'm not trying to downplay these events. I just want to put in uh, perspective, you know, the doom and gloom uh, uh, perspective that a lot of people can have when it comes to these sorts of things. So, you know, we're still battling mother nature and physics and time and all those things. And uh, these events, you know, don't necessarily compare, but I think the potential is there and people can see, you know, the, the capabilities. And this brings me to Triton. Triton is really well talked about uh, because it, 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 focused on the safety uh, system of a site. And that's important because when you, when you talk about these other events, you know, uh, breaking a process, turning out the lights, espionage, you know, the, the damage is pretty menial. I, I, I would assume the people in Ukraine might feel differently. But with Triton here, the intent of the malware was actually focused on the safety instrument systems that controlled uh, the hydrogen sulfide levels at a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia. And that's a big deal because, um, you know, that hydrogen sulfide is, is nasty, hazardous stuff, toxic, flammable. Uh, you don't want it getting released out into the air. And so the fact that this malware was trying to actually, you know, possibly create an environment like that where this gas is, is leaking uh, is really scary and upsetting to think that somebody would focus on that. So that's why Triton gets a lot of, of uh, attention. It, it was a malware that was focused on a petrochemical plant in Saudi Arabia in 2017. Um, it gets its name from the Schneider Electric Triconics controllers uh, that were used um, at that site uh, that, that controlled the hydrogen sulfide levels. Uh, one, one really interesting note, and I know I'm speeding it through here, is that uh, the malware was actually written with Python. And I thought that was really interesting because you don't necessarily hear Python mentioned all that often. Um, and uh, I, it just really stood out to me. It was, it was Python compiled for Windows machines. So clearly these people kind of knew what they were working with um, and, uh, and, and were able to get these, this malware from engineering workstations uh, to the Triconics controllers. Uh, and then what I actually ended up giving them away is the Triconics controllers managed to malfunction and shut down the plant. Uh, and so no damage was actually done um, however, the potential is, is certainly there. Again, attributed to Russia uh, and this research institute. Um, and that's pretty much all I'll say about that. Oop. Uh, TTPs, much more elaborate. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't recommend enough going to MITRE ATT&CK's uh, uh, website and looking these up and looking up the, the mitigations. Uh, it's, it's just a, a wonderful resource for learning uh, and something I'm you know, trying to learn myself. <laughs> so here's the scorecard laid out. Uh, I said at this at the beginning of the presentation, I really wanted to put these events together side by side so you could look and say, oh, who were the players? Well, you know, what were the technologies? You know, this, that, and the other. Uh, what were the years? So I, I hope this is a tool that you can use, uh, at least be a quick reference. Um, I would love to know additions if, if somebody's got some good suggestions. So please, again, hit me up um, and, and let me know what you think of this. And then my takeaways. So I only have three real takeaways. I tried to highlight some pieces throughout that I would love for engineers to, to take away from this presentation and, and be cognizant of. Uh, but these three takeaways are the ones I wanted to leave you with. Uh, the first one is... Um, ICS cybersecurity is extremely fascinating. Uh, I'm a hobbyist, I'm an enthusiast. I think there's a lot of people like me. There's multiple different avenues for entry, you know, whether you're a programmer or a cybersecurity or electrical engineer or whatever. So I think there's a lot to be learned here and a lot of places where you could say, oh, I, I think that's interesting. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that or that relates to me. So uh, second um, is that these events together create just an incredible list laundry list of use cases and examples 
um, and things to be learned and, and applied to your industry or, you know, somebody else, you know, industry. So, um, you know, these events are not all the same. Um, they are not all just ICS events, right? They, they are all unique and there's a lot to be learned. Uh, and I think stacked up together, uh, they, they make for an interesting uh, learn. And then lastly, uh, our infrastructure is incredibly fragile. We're battling physics, environment, time, uh, and cyber threats is a, is a new threat vector that we have to take into account. Uh, and so um, I just wanted to kind of leave people with, you know, we, it needs to be taken seriously and it needs to be expected. And with that, I just want to thank uh, GrimCon again so much for this opportunity. I want to thank Ron Bash uh, for mentoring me with this. Uh, he had some wonderful feedback. Also, Don Weber, who I reached out to, uh, provided a lot of feedback, and I really appreciate that. Please check out these links. Hit me up if you have any questions. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Have a great rest of the conference. All right. I'm gonna leave. Uh, I'm gonna leave this slide up just for a little bit, so anybody can uh, hit them up. Maybe possibly uh, actually scan that QR code. I know I'm not going to, but uh, anybody <laughs> else? Who's feeling ballsy? Someone do us do it and let us know what happens, because I'm too paranoid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's totally trustworthy. I'm sure. Oh, is there 30 more seconds? No, no. There's one second. Did it, did it stop 30 seconds late? Let's see. What? All right. Awesome. What's interesting, oh, you're muted again. So when I press play on this, it mutes you. It doesn't allow me to skip through the actual video. Quit doing that. <laughs> Wait, I is would like, if I... silence woman, this is my show now. It ended at 29.36. <laughs> oh, the QR code is his Google Slides. Do you trust him? He's he's technically not in cybersecurity, so it's probably more trustworthy, but I, I don't trust QR codes. Go, this just brings me to COVID and trusting QR codes everywhere. It was a scary, it's a scary time. <laughs> I love my web scan. I Scan the QR code to see our menu. You have no idea how much I qualmed with that. And I was just like, I had to start looking at menus ahead of time because I was just like, please give me a paper one. Like I'm not scanning your random QR code. No. All right, who's got some questions for Jason? Honestly, that was an awesome talk. Jason, I wish you were in the chat. You seem like a very good presenter and a very- He's in the chat. He's in. Well, I meant, I meant the video chat, not uh, just, I meant in here, not You wish you would be presenting live. <laughs> uh, but that was, oh, well, okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. do you have- Jam pack. So much value. He talks quickly like me. He's like, oh God, I can see that I'm getting low on time, but I have a lot of information I want to impart onto you. So let's go, 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 go. Ooh. There you go. I entered you into panelists. So if you have a mic and a camera, you could you can talk. Wade is all about that outsourcing life. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna close the video. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Okay. I can't see you guys. I wasn't expecting to do this, so ah. I'm not properly dressed or placed. <laughs> uh, I yeah, thanks. I got to figure out how to get rid of the actual video when I try to quit it. It doesn't go. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, the last, the last 30 seconds uh, was more or less just me thanking GrimCon. Um, Everybody who listened to me babble, and um, and then also Ron Brash, who uh, mentored me. He had a lot of good feedback. He's a great resource. He like studied a lot of these things, so it was really great to get his perspective. Um, I'm actually really curious what Vivek th thought. Um, kind of wish my presentation was before his. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I. 
don't know if anybody has any questions. I will say that uh, I recorded this thing like four times and like the first two times it came in at like 50 minutes, 47 minutes. So yeah, there's a lot of extra information in here that I was trying to cram in, but. No, that was perfect. For your first talk, that was really good. I, I saw the time and you're like 30 seconds under. I'm like, oh, he's got it. He's got it good. But for someone who isn't even in the field, that was excellent. Like, Thanks. just to say it again, that almost reminded me like the Dark Neck Diaries readings, right? It yeah. was enough to where anyone who's cybersecurity is really going to appreciate it and enough for anybody to be able to understand it and go further. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that because that's kind of the the middle ground I was targeting. Um, I'd love to do a more technical deep dive. Obviously, that would require a lot more of myself. And I still wanted it to be like entry level enough where like, like I say, you could share this to like your electrical engineering friend and be like, look, this is why these things are important. Like, here's, here's, here's what I mean whenever I reference Stuxnet and they might say, oh, I get it now. So. No, you did awesome. Wow. You did better than me on my first talk. So. <laughs> I wasn't um, privy to Wade's first talk, so uh, I can't comment, but no, I, I definitely like was very sucked in and. Uh, cool. Very cool. It's definitely some yeah, cool information. Thanks. Yeah, and, and my links there, I actually uh, share all my resources, all my citations, and even some like longer write-ups. Um, uh, so, um, you know, if, if, if you do, if you're looking for a place to like dive more in, it's it's all there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fun stuff. <laughs> It looks fun. I've never really had had everything broken apart like that. Like I've always like, oh, I understood that it went after this and it made this do that. And if it's like, you know, you never know why or how. And like, I would I would love personally to know a lot more about that side of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, ICS I think is really different than a lot of the other cybersecurity uh, facets. Um, you know, one of the main things, and I'd love to hear above X take on this, but you know when when you get down to the PLCs and the RTUs, um, you're talking about like a lot of proprietary systems, a lot of um, rudimentary uh, systems. You know, one of the big things they talk about with ICS pen testing and stuff is like you can't just do a normal scan because you'll take everything offline and then you'll shut down a plant and then ruin everyone's day. <laughs> and, I've heard some uh, stories about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so, like, I really appreciate those things, that that, that sensitivity and that challenge, um, and just all those, uh, you know, like I say, pri proprietary technologies and stuff. Uh, it's what I studied in college. So, um, I don't know. I hope other people get excited about it. I hope it doesn't scare other people. I hope other people look for ICS opportunities because I think there's a lot out there. And, you know, there's there's the professionals. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely so much in ICS and ICS is one of those things that it's so hard to do because everyone's doing it different. There is no standardization. There is no uniform standard. There is no gold standard. Like it's, it's so hard. Yeah. What are, yeah. what are some of the training resources really for ICS? Like, I don't even know. Yeah. So CISA has some free training, the cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency um, that I know of. Uh, obviously SANS has a ICS uh, course. Um, I've heard of some other things. I think uh, some of the national labs, like Idaho National yeah. Labs, but I'm not. I'm not sure if those are public or not. Um, they I'll aren't. A little bit more. <laughs> I, I've heard of Idaho Labs and what they've did there, but I've uh, to all to like give me a little background. I've also worked in the power industry for a little bit, and oh, okay. so I they flirted with sending me to the Idaho Labs testing thing, but I heard all gotcha. that, and it sounded super cool, but I never got to go. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not in this space. Like, I, I don't really have the capacity to justify going uh, with my current employer, but um, I have heard of people mention it, and it sounds like it's really good. And um, uh, But there is a lot of, of freely available stuff, too, which is where I got all my information. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. It's out there if you want to find it. <laughs> Someone go for it. No, no. We need we need someone to provide links. Yeah. All right. Uh, so back to the real discussion. What's your favorite type of taco? Oh, um, we have a 
Hispanic restaurant uh, behind my house, and they have what's called tacos mexicanos, which is just like a steak taco, but like they kill it. And I go there just to get those, and they only come in threes, come no on. ones, no twos, only threes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's that's my favorite taco. I'll eat that twice a day, every day if I could. Are you okay with saying where you're located, or where that uh, restaurant? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's it's in Ashton, Maryland. It's okay. um, 30 minutes north of D.C. It's a nice, sleepy little town. If you're in the area, hit me up. I'll meet you at Ellen Driga's. <laughs> not, not, not where you're expecting good tacos, I will give you that. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> uh, we have a pretty big uh, Hispanic culture here in the DMV. And so um, not Tex-Mex, though. It's much more uh, Guatemalan and El Salvadorian culture so a little different. i can get down on some pupusas there's a pupuseria yeah. like right up the yeah. street from my house and just order like 10 and bring them on down yeah yeah that's usually my dessert like <laughs> i get the tacos and they're like what do you want for dessert i'll like just bring me a pupusa that's that's uh that's awesome yeah. We we have a place here in Reno called the Jesse and the Jesse is like one of these new bougie like hipster like places that like used to be a bar and it was kind of converted to a boutique hotel and they have like the best taco restaurant in there. So we asked you did my favorite San Diego taco. You didn't ask me about Reno though. In Reno the I'm not Jesse ex- I'm not expecting Reno for yeah. taco. You, how do how do Reno tacos compare to San Diego tacos? Would you I oh. still have native <laughs> San Diego standards. Fighting words. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> He's lucky he's through a screen. I can't walk over. They all see my hand like, <laughs> like they're in the same room. Uh, so who do we got up next? Up next, coming at you hot is going to be Elise Robinson. She is also pre-recorded. I'm not sure if she's in the chat. All right, well, Jason, we appreciate you hopping on, even though it was last minute. Um, Let's see, I can, I think I can demote you back to everybody else, but I'm not positive. Okay. (laughs) uh, It doesn't look like it, so just turn off your camera. (laughs) I don't want to, I don't want to nuke everything. (laughs) He probably would, like, they'd be like, track two is down, and everyone's like, why? And it's like, I don't know, it's way, blah, blah. I scan. I did Nmamp on the uh, ICS network and uh, just took out a couple power plants. You know, just little stupid stuff. Stupid stuff like that. Actually, people would probably blame me. They'd be like, "Meryl's the red teamer, right?" It was probably her fault. What was it? Not not chaos monkey. What was the monkey? Infection monkey. Infection monkey on the uh, ICS network. I don't know. I don't. I would imagine it can't do much because it's not built for ICS. But I'm sure stuff would break. It. It depends. I mean, it is open source. You can customize it. If someone was really good at ICS payloads, you could you could beef up Infection Monkey and make it your bitch pretty well. I think that's another, when you hear about ICS and stuff like that, you don't hear a lot of testing on it because usually testing's in like at a production network and that testing, you could bring down power, right? Or uh, there, there's nothing in Infection Monkey that's actually going to exploit or post-exploit anything. Again, its only purpose is to move and replicate movement. So it'll brute for, it'll, um, you know, it'll it'll gain its foothold, but then it's just going to copy itself and start trying to discover and move to other hosts. It's not, it's not there to do any any uh, post-exploit activities. Okay. All right, well, we got four minutes to the next one. Let me at Bye. least make sure that I can. Oh, no, that's the wrong button. <laughs> what you got there on your desktop? Let us see it. Nothing too bad. You're like, no. That's no. that's on the Tails system, not not this. Oh, good stuff. Let me see. Dude, my toddler is loving this day because she's getting so much iPad time. I'm gonna That's make right. you a presenter. That it. Me? Yeah, and then I'm gonna take it back and it's gonna give me more options. Okay. There we go, all right, cool. Just to make sure I have the option for the video again. I'm a go-to webinar pro. If anybody wants to hire me after this, you can reach me at Twitter, at waiting through logs. <laughs> at waiting through logs. <laughs> I think we should all test out some of our pen testing skills on Wade's website. She go for it to get loud. I'm gonna deserialize you with a big zero image of me going. 
Waiting through security.com. Go do it. <laughs> you get to see be. my first. The best. It's a GitLab. Oh, it's horrible. It was it was like three hours of me turning stuff on and turning it on again, trying to get stuff to work. <laughs> security you 101. Know you turn it off and back on. I always call support and I'm like, I turned it off and back on and again. I logged out and logged in and I booted in recovery mode. What else do you got? Did you, you didn't clear the cache? Yeah. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, did you empty your Chrome cookies? I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> no, because I don't want to log back into everything. You're like, hell no. I worked really hard building up those cookies. I'm not giving that shit up. Uh, great. Now everyone's going to go to my uh, poorly made website. <laughs> you told them the URL. I just simply stenographered for you, really. So this is really your fault. My, my end goal was to uh, use this as a small business and do deception as a service, but we'll see if that ever happens. <laughs> right, right, it sounded cool. I set it up enough of it. Well? All right, we got, we're a minute early. It last time it took me a second to get everything set up, so we'll go for it. So Elise, here we go. Oh, we can still hear me? Okay, I think when I press play, it's gonna go. All right, good luck, everybody. Hey, y'all, my name is Lise Robinson. I'm excited to be here today. And I'll start off with the introduction and then go into my topic, which is side hustles, your entry into tech. So again, my name is Lise Robinson. I am a cloud engineer and my journey into tech started at 10 years old. And so my parents got me my first computer and uh, it was a Packard Bell. And I distinctly remember it had four megabytes of RAM um, because I wanted to play a, a computer game that was eight megabytes of RAM and needed. <laughs> and so it cost $2,000 and it was huge and clunky and made all kinds of noise. And so I woke up one day and was like, well, I want to know how those websites work. And so I started off with the website. I distinctly still remember it. And luckily it still exists. Um, it's called Lisa Explains It All. It's this hot pink and hot purple website. And you learn about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on it. And... Uh, so I'm plugging through on it, probably using Notepad because I, I really don't think there was too much of anything <laughs> to work with at all back then. And um, so I'm building websites, you know, little little stupid websites <laughs> over the years. And then that progressed to me taking Visual Basic and C++ in high school. Now... I was going to be a computer science major, but I couldn't find an internship to save my life. So I switched to accounting, um, ended up becoming an auditor for a number of years. And so unlike IT, um, accounting is much, much different. Uh, they don't have you jumping through all these hoops and uh, they actually have entry level positions. And so, um, yeah, I kept up with my my web development skills, though I would build websites here and there and and um, go from there. So I've never had to pay anyone to design anything for me. And so that was one skill that I taught myself at 10 years old. Um, then life happened. Um, I moved to Mexico for a number of years. Um, and so fell back on my IT skills. I would do consulting here and there. Um, not much though, because I, I went to I went to have fun and to heal heal my life. And so um,
Hey everyone, I'm gonna try to get Elise in here. It looks like she's actually in the Discord. Um, sorry to pause it. If not, we can restart it. Uh, I'm just gonna wait one second. Anybody got a link to the to the register real quick? Uh, to register for the talk? Huh? To register yeah, for like track two? If we can just get her into the uh, get her into the waiting room and then I can move her over. Yeah, give me two shakes. I think I got it. You got it? So I have all the village links and stuff, but So is she just gonna um, present live then? We'll see. Or should you want me to start the video? We're doing it live right now. Uh... We'll give her a few seconds. Her uh, The actual video is a little bit shorter than the 30 minutes allotted. So. Uh... She's on it. Okay. So anyway, what many of you do not know is that when it comes to working in cybersecurity, sometimes you do something called pivoting, which is where you take your original plan when that goes completely up in smoke and you pivot to something new. <laughs> this is an example of what we're currently doing right now. Um, it was actually super fun. So during um, one of the ops that I ran um, for another company, uh, Red Team Style, they obviously found our malicious domain and blocked it. And so when we went to go do like the purple team AAR with the blue team to like show them what we did and junk like that, um, we couldn't get any callback sessions and I couldn't get anything to work because they'd already duh, blocked the domain and my like lizard brain was like off in space. And I was like, okay, everyone give me two seconds. So I spun up a new domain real quick, random domain and like, transferred a bunch of DNS records and fixed up in digital ocean and got it calling back. And then I had like 12 sessions back to my own machine because I was like trying to get all the things to work and it wasn't working. So that's an example of how you pivot on the fly during an exercise. There's lots of spinning up new domains and stuff. Sometimes blue teams will catch your domain and they won't investigate far enough to find your backend IP. So they haven't actually burned your infrastructure. They've only burned the front that you've chosen to present to your target. So you can just spin up again, a new domain, transfer some DNS records, um, change where your infrastructure is pointing and listening from, and you can still use all the same infrastructure without having to start from scratch. It's glorious. So. Have you ever leaked your uh, your username or your computer name in an engagement? Um, I had the, I had a red teamer do that to us, and I was able to track him down, find his Twitter, and then figured out where he lived. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like like like, did they know it was like me as the operator, or like did they find me red team activity? Period. Wait, say that again. Sorry, I was reading. Like, did, did they know I was the operator or like, did they just find red team operator activity period? Both. Um, they've never known it was me. Um, but fun story, kids, if you're ever going to think that you're going to operate from a managed device um, against a company for whom you're an internal pen tester, 
uh, on a VPN? That answer is no, because if you have one of like three certain EDR solutions, they can still see you going to your malicious domain and building your landing pages and doing all the fun things. So you either need to be inside a VM in a VPN, or you need to be on a completely unmanaged system that is not on your company's network um, building that stuff because they'll totally see it. So one time I accidentally did that. I burned myself because I was like, oh, I'm on a VPN, I'm encrypted, I'm fine. And they were like totally seeing me go there and they were like, haha, we're just gonna burn this. And then like four weeks later, they're like, oh, we, we blacklisted that weeks ago. And I was like, oh, you guys, so much work into this. So don't do that. Elise, are you in, uh, I see your, your user is in the panelists right now. If you have a mic or a camera, you can, you should be able to turn them on. I could also try playing the video again. I was told it may be fixed, uh, not sideways, but. I, I had another uh, another engagement where the the blue team knew the red team was going to do an engagement, and somebody whacked into the red team's computer and found their plans, <laughs> and found their domain before the red team even started, and then we blocked the domain. <laughs> you know what actually happens more often than not, which is even scarier than that, is. Oh my gosh, this has happened on not just one engagement for one company. This has happened across like multiple engagements that I've done, like at least a dozen where we're going in and looking at logs or, um, you know, whether it be cloud logs or uh, like firewall logs or something. And we're trying to see what, how our activity looks to see if we need to delete anything. And because, you know, deceptions yeah. of things. And we actually find legit APT activity and we're like, yeah, that's, 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 is that's anyone scary. paying attention to this? Does anyone see this isn't us? This is this is someone bad and they're like, oh. So sometimes another red team, but a bad one, has beat us to it. But uh no, I've I've never done that. Let's see. Uh she dropped out. I could play the video. Um if she dropped, then yeah, let's do that. Um, I was also told she was just given another another link. My Discord's going off, but I don't know where. I hit. That. I don't see anything. When it just makes a noise and you don't know where, it's scary. I only have like eight hundred unread notifications in Discord, so it's not a problem. Do you know you can put Discord channels in folders? Yes. Dude, I learned that. Oh, I saved my life. All the freaking <laughs> I, here. I did know that. <laughs> I have like all the con servers for like just different virtual cons in one, and then like all the learning servers in another, and then like my like servers I frequent are not in a folder. All right. One so more. Shall we try playing it again? I mean, messenger, one more time. Elise. A message. Uh, is she in the attendees? I don't see her now. Don't see her in staff. We still got Jason in here though. Hmm. Don't see her in attendees. All right, well, yeah, I'll give just... one more minute and then we'll play the video. Yeah, agreed. I don't see her in list of attendees either. Oh, it says she's talking. Oh. She was for a minute. We hear something. There she is. I see her in here. Elise? 
Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I had to restart my computer. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have any sound, so I have to play my own video. I thought you guys were gonna play it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, so we could play it, but it looks like the video is uh, that we have is recorded sideways. So it was like uh, flipped ninety degrees. Oh my gosh! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're all good. So I'm gonna make you presenter, um, which should be right now, and uh, you should be able to play the video on your screen or some, well, however you want to do it. Okay. Let's see. All right, cool. Hey, uh, my name is Liz Robinson. I'm excited to be here today. And I'll start off with the introduction and then go into my top and tech. So again, my name is Liz Robinson. I am a cloud engineer. And my journey into tech started at 10 years old. And so my parents got me my first computer. And uh, it was a Packer Bell, and I distinctly remember it had four megabytes of RAM um, because I wanted to play a computer game that was eight megabytes of RAM in me. <laughs> and so it cost $2,000, and it was huge and clunky and made all kinds of noise. And so I woke up one day and was like, well, I want to know how those websites work. And so I started off with a website. I just think we still remember it, and luckily it still exists. Um, it's called Lisa Explains It All. It's this hot pink and hot purple website, and you learn about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on it. And uh, so I'm plugging through on it, probably using Notepad, because I, I really don't think there was too much of anything. <laughs> to work with that all back then and um so i'm building websites you know little little stupid websites <laughs> over the years and then that progressed to me taking visual basic and c plus plus in high school now i was going to be a computer science major but i couldn't find an internship to save my life so i switched to accounting um ended up becoming an auditor for a number of years. And so unlike IT, um, accounting is much, much different. Um, they don't have me jumping through all these hoops and uh, And so, um, yeah, I kept up with my, my web development skills. So I would build websites here and there and, and uh, go from there. So I've never had to pay anyone to design anything for me. And so that was one skill that I taught myself at 10 years old. Um, then life happened. Um, I moved to Mexico for a number of years. Um, and so I fell back on my IT skills. I would do consulting here and there. Um, not much though, but I went to I went to have fun and to heal heal my life and so um then COVID hit you know and so COVID has changed the whole world and so since I couldn't go out and do the things that I normally did um I was like well you know maybe I should you know get on some more self-learning um I haven't done that in a long 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 time and so um I was like, well, I'm going to teach myself Python, maybe possibly. And so I got on Twitter for whatever reason and started searching about tech stuff. And I'm like, oh, they have a whole tech Twitter. And uh, so I started getting involved in that and doing hashtags and, uh, you know, updating my progress. Um, I don't know if you've heard of 100 Days of Code and AWS certified as hashtags. Um, the dev community is another hashtag. So I started getting popular um, and people started following me and following my progress. And so um, 
The other thing that's huge in the tech industry are certifications, correct? So of course I had none, I was an auditor. And so I was like, well, how can I afford to pay for these? Mind you, I live in Mexico, which um, very, very cheap country. And so one certification is a lot of money, a lot of money. And um, they make it hard for someone that lives in another country to get these certifications. But, you know, barrier of entry, <laughs> barriers of entry. Uh, or the strong survive, right? So um, I fell back on my auditing skills, which is pretty much research skills. And so I was like, well, how can I not have to pay for these things? And I got on Google and Twitter and LinkedIn and a bunch of other places that post good stuff and uh, started searching. And so I started winning all these things. I got uh, event tickets um, to a Twilio event last year. Obama was there and they had all these great topics. Um, I won a scholarship to a boot camp to learn um, Python, all types of free courses. I've won free certifications from Microsoft and, and AWS and Google. Mind you, I have like none of these things. <laughs> but um, what else? Scholarships, um, and then, uh, you know, a bunch of other things that I want to. People are like, how are you winning these things? I'm like, I just search. You know, searching is your friend. If you're going to be in tech, you have to know how to search. Um, and so backing up, like I said, I was an IT consultant. And so I learned more about the cloud. And that's one thing I said I wasn't going to miss. Um, was getting into the cloud. Um, it seems like it's going to stay here for the near future, the far future. And so I started learning more about the cloud. And one of the things that I built when I was in Mexico was a blog, a podcast, YouTube channel, all that stuff to, to portray my Black American woman life in, in Mexico. And so I built the podcast on AWS. And I also built my subscription service for email on AWS. There's all types of tutorials out there on how to do it. And so mind you, I knew nothing about cloud. I knew nothing about how to build these things. And so I taught myself how to do them. Um, and so going back to Twitter and tweeting out my progress, everyone wanted to know how I was winning these things. And I said, well, to search and so that's how my my business my project and how i got tons of interviews was by building news in it that's www.newsin.it and so going into my topic um i hustles your entry in tech um I built it using Python, CSS, HTML, JavaScript, Google Sheets, and at the time it was AWS. I don't use AWS anymore because it was for charging me something I got credits. But um, it became the talk of every interview that I did. I put it on my resume, it's on my LinkedIn, and I also learned how to build a Twitter bot and a LinkedIn bot. <laughs> Um, using a virtual machine, Docker, um, Selenium, Python, and um, of course that starts the interview process too, based off my resume and my LinkedIn. Um, and so my tip and trick is to build something that you're number one passionate about, number two, you know, really nothing about so you can improve your skills. And number three, something that's um, unique and that can get you in front of recruiters and hiring managers. Um, one thing about news and IT is that I built it, I launched it on a Sunday and I have my first customers on, on Monday. And so that opens up more, more dialogue with people because they're like, well, 
How did you find out that this would be something that would be successful? I sure as hell didn't. <laughs> I sure as hell didn't, but people said that they wanted to know, so I'm like, well, let's see how it does. My first, my first website was crap. I launched it and it's crap and that's the other thing. Don't be scared to launch and it's not perfect. Um, you'll figure out how to make it better. Um, and so um, I got lots of publicity too. I was, I was lucky in that regard. Um, I've been in a lot of tech, uh, tech places. Um, and so that opens up dialogue. And the way it opens up dialogue is you are able to tell stories, and I call them stories because um, they are stories. And so when an interview person is able to ask you a question, you already have something to talk about because you've done it before. You don't say, well, you know, I don't have the experience, I've never done it, but you did do it. And um, you're able to talk about it in depth because it's your baby, it's something that you launched, something that you did. Um, and I'll say there's nothing wrong with doing copycat um, projects because I've done a ton of those. Like I built a WhatsApp bot that gives me soft tips. Um, and so when you build those projects too, that's, that's outside of your main project. It also gives you the stories to be able to talk about anything and everything that, that the interviewer wants. Um, now, mind you, mine applies more to cloud because that's what I do. I'm a cloud engineer, so I built my, my projects around the cloud. But um, no matter what, whether it's networking or programming, um, security or whatever, try to find something that is unique and that will you know, <laughs> get people talking about you specifically. And um, you'll have stories to tell. Um, when I went into my interview at my company, um, my boss was very, very intrigued by me. <laughs> Probably because, you know, I, I was a black woman that lived in Mexico at, at one point, and, um, and I was passionate about IT, but also that I built something from nothing and made it successful using all different types of tools that I knew nothing about before. Never had even heard of them. Like I didn't even know what Docker was or at Twitter you could even build a bot. Like what, what the hell is a bot? And I love building bots now. So um, you may find a niche that you want to you want to tailor and be in front of too by building these projects. I wouldn't say stick to, to something that you know. Learn all different types of things because you may find something that you really want to pursue and love too. Um, and with that said, <laughs> with that said, side hustles, your entry into tech, um, be sure to build things that you know nothing about. So you'll have stories, you'll make, you'll make errors, you'll make uh, mistakes, and you'll figure out how to fix them, which is everything in tech. Um, number two, learn how to Google, because <laughs> I Google all kinds of things every single day that I knew nothing about and learn about them. Um, ask for help if you don't know. Um, it's funny, my, my friend's been in IT forever. And I told him that I've never even worked in IT, but people trust me as an expert all of a sudden because I built news in IT. <laughs> um, and he gets mad about it. I don't care. <laughs> I rub him in his face and chant that kid. I'm an expert and you're not. But um, it makes you an expert. And, uh, and uh, yeah, have fun with it and uh, have all the stories to tell about all the mistakes and errors that you made. And uh, you never know, you might not even need uh, entry into tech. It might become your full-time project, gig, a whole business, and you'll say hell with a job. And it is what it is. Again, thank you for having me at uh, this conference. My name is Elise Robinson. And I hope you enjoyed my talk about how to switch into tech. And um, be sure to look me up. I'm at uh, 
degrees in IT, if you're looking for boot camps, um, scholarships, um, discounted pre certifications and events, and free courses, um, check me out at switchedintotech.com if you need help switching into tech. And uh, check out my blog, elisrobinson.com. And uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm always open to talk about tech. Thank you and bye bye. Okay. Do we still have Elise with us live? I in the... am here. Awesome. Hey there. That was so informative. Um, so many people are so impressed by like your varied coding background. Oh, I'm like, where is the chat? I can't see the chat. <laughs> In, uh, it's in Discord, yeah. Um, <clears throat> someone is asking if you use Django or Flask or something else. Um, for my website or just in general? Say for your uh, website, probably. Probably. Or in general, go do say both. <laughs> um, I've used Flask before i believe not i don't think i've ever used django um and no my website does not use either okay out of all the stuff you've taught yourself what do you think was the hardest and how did you overcome that heart that hardness the hardest it's actually a good question <laughs> um i don't know me so, learning the cloud right now is pretty hard <laughs> <laughs> Only because when I first learned programming, I was a child, so I had nothing else going on in my life. But now that I have other things, it's like, okay, I need to pass these exams for work and study and, you know, so I don't crash a server or whatever. So, yeah, I have to say this right now. Okay. Uh, what was your... Go ahead, Meryl. As a crashing a server is bad. <laughs> Just a little bit. Depends on uptime, right? If you need the uptime. If you don't need uptime, then you're good. Then, I mean, maybe you're fine. Yeah, stress test. <laughs> what was, did you have another question that you're reading from the chat, Wade? Uh, nothing that I see. Let me read through it. No, I think we're all good on those questions. Uh, what was, do you think, did you teach yourself to Google or did you use any type of, um, literature or what what do you think really drove you to learn how to use Google because I do feel like that is a huge that's like the first huge task or first huge lesson that a lot of people in IT really learn is how to Google properly and how to like pick out links um, how did you learn that um <laughs> I don't know I guess you have to read through the the literature and figure out what exactly well first of all you have to figure out what the problem is that you're trying to solve of course and then read through everything copy and paste try it if it doesn't work then try the next thing <laughs> so um because you're probably never going to figure out something that's exactly like your problem, but you can figure out something that is adjacent to it and, you know, something that's kind of the same and then go from there, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I often found that, like, in the beginning, I, w I knew what the program was doing, so if something wasn't installing or wasn't working, I'd be like, why is my Kali not installing on blah, 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 when what I should have just done was literally copy the error code and Google the error code. Because if you mm -hmm. Google just the error you get, the standard output, you're gonna find the forums where like dozens of people have commented things that they've tried and workarounds that they found much faster than like, because how web spidering works versus how like humans think in syntax is very different. So that's actually a really good point. And also, just because it's 10 years old does not mean that it still does not work. I've literally found things that were 10 years old and it still works. <laughs> mm -hmm. So don't think it's too, too aged out for it not to work. No, it's still baked into there somewhere. So something that a lot of people don't understand about risk and vulnerabilities is you like generally cannot remove risk. 
you can only mitigate around it. You can pile stuff on top to make it maybe not so bad or not so easily accessible, but vulnerabilities are still in there if you can get around enough of them. <laughs> I mitigate oh, yeah, I know all about risk. I, I used to be an auditor, so nothing that we, we try to mitigate the risk. <laughs> yeah, we all try, but the reason we're horrible at it is the reason I still have a job. Yep, good old compliance. Let's see. Uh, what other? What? What's your favorite technology that you've learned through this adventure? My favorite? It would have to be my first love, HTML. It does so much, and people try to say that it's not a language, and I'm like, well, we wouldn't have all this stuff that we have that now without HTML. So, how do you figure? <laughs> I mean, that's true. HTML is very near and dear to my heart because anyone who had a Facebook profile that they wanted stuff to scroll across it and junk, like or customize. You mean MySpace, but I'll give it to you. Oh, was it? Oh, was it MySpace? Damn. Yeah. That's how old it is. Yeah. Anyone who had a MySpace and wanted it to be fancy knew some HTML. But nowadays, you know, I am largely a client side attack person and I am doing a lot of HTML and a lot of JavaScript like all day. So I used to embed like a games into my into my MySpace via HTML. That's like the first I learned, yeah. Way back when. Yeah, I have to say HTML. That's that's the first language I that I learned. And I mean, nothing would really be usable without HTML. It just looked like Google Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Um, What's your favorite taco? You may have not. You may not have been taco? here. Uh, yeah, since you lived in Mexico. Ooh, this is perfect. Oh, this is perfect. Yeah, we want to know what's your favorite type of taco. Turkey taco. Turkey oh, talk, man. I, I would have to say turkey tacos. Um, there was a spot underneath my apartment when I lived in Mexico City. Okay. And they had turkey on there. And I'm like, turkey tacos? But I, I love turkey tacos. They're the best. They're the most flavorful. And they're just they're just really good. <laughs> that is not a left field. I would have never thought a turkey taco would be so that great. I've been They're to Mexico City to once. Find, but when they do, please try them. But turkey tacos are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, when I went to Mexico City, I didn't even eat tacos while I was there. <laughs> go figure. Oh no, you gotta go to the taco parks. Oh my god. I should have. I went and did all the touristy stuff. I like, saw a soccer game, went to the pyramids, uh -huh, uh -huh. drank plenty of mezcal. And then uh, flew out pretty much. So. Mm -hmm. Oh All my right. gosh, mezcal, mezcal gets you into some trouble. Well, uh, I'll tell you stories next time we're in person. It was bad. <laughs> I was gonna be eating tacos in a Mexico City jail for a second. Oh. <laughs> I want to know that story. Maybe you should okay, just tell so it. Oh, no, I'm not telling the story. <laughs> uh. What what other technologies uh, do you want to learn, or like what's next on your uh, roadmap? Um, I would probably have to say the security side. Like I said, I used to be an auditor, so you know, audit is my first love <laughs> too. And so, basically, getting back on the security side, because um, as of right now, I design the systems and administrate the systems um, in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I want to learn more of the security stuff. So okay. whatever what's that your, is, I don't even know what it entails at this point. <laughs> what's your favorite cloud provider? Um, well, I don't want to say. You don't want to get in trouble, but <laughs> you know what you're gonna say. We all know what you're gonna say. I work with Azure, but um. I love AWS. AWS is so much easier to to play with. Um, so and Google and would Google probably be the, for the win. Dude, I I just started messing around with data lakes in Azure and versus like querying large data lakes in AWS, and it was just so much easier in Azure, which I was surprised. But I I do not have a great experience with cloud, so. Oh yeah, you you can easily get a four thousand dollar bill. Don't um. Don't ask me because I actually know that. But luckily, <laughs> I had credit. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> now AWS is always like, you're approaching your free usage limit. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. It, my bill is always like 11 cents or 23 cents or something like that. One time I got behind four months and I owed them like 56 cents. And they were like, we are going to close down your AWS account. I was like, no, you're not. It's fine. Calm down. I had a DNS tunnel in AWS and they did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was trying to tunnel out of, uh, probably shouldn't say it, out of uh, Wi Fi, out of, uh, like Wi-Fi portals, it worked, oh. but uh, I recommend it if you ever want to have a fun project. That was all AWS. Kenny had a really good comment. <laughs> Auditing is your love. We need so many more people like you. Very true. Who doesn't love auditing? Auditing is the best ever. <laughs> Everybody hates auditors, but that's the fun part. <laughs> See, we don't hate the auditors. We just hate the auditing, but. <laughs> I love auditing because it's like pen testing. I'm like, ooh, you're trying to hide all your dirty laundry under a ton of rocks that you're hoping I don't look under. I am going to look at every off-ordered employee, every process, interview every person until I find the one thing you messed up on. They're like, that one yeah. thing? I'm like, that one thing you messed up on. Oh, oh yeah, I got some I got some colorful stories, some very good stories. <laughs> just hate providing evidence, all right? It just gets real annoying for me to go screenshot everything and come back and over and over and over. <laughs> They're all it never ends. All right. Got seven more minutes. Oh no. Yeah, seven more minutes. This time switch is messing me up still. I know it's all day. I've like had like that three hours. Like I'm trying to kind of trying to tell myself I'm in Eastern time, even though I'm not. Elise, how was the experience working in tech? Were you when you were working in living in Mexico? Were you working in tech in Mexico? Uh, not really. I have a consult here and there. Um, I've never officially worked in Mexico. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I was wondering what how, how big of an experience, how big of a change it was from like working from there to the US because I have some experience working in a data center and we had a lot of uh clients from Mexico and it was it was an interesting experience me having to communicate using Google Translator but <laughs> also uh just a little bit of a cultural difference and stuff like that but oh very very yeah. I can I can imagine. <laughs> this was pre-security Wade too. This was like very this was baby Wade tech when I was uh learning how to set up web servers and uh answering phone calls to set up your DNS resolvers. Uh yeah. Yeah, yeah it was wasn't a fun time. <laughs> it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I am like low key so excited that I never had to start doing that stuff like help desk or networking type stuff because I'm like oh my gosh I don't know if I would have lasted and like made it out of there. You appreciate it. You appreciate this more when you had those type of jobs. I'll, I'll give you that. I also think I have a better uh, repertoire. I guess no. I, better ammunition of talking to people because of that, because of that customer service level, but you already have that, but so you don't count, but <laughs> I, I feel like having that customer service background. Is I like, don't count. <laughs> no, social media queen, gosh. You... Yeah, well I did honestly, so this is a really funny story. So when I started in customer service, I was like the same as I am now. I would like pick up the phone and be like, thank you so much for calling blah, blah, blah. This is Meryl speaking. How may I help you? And like all the sales reps who'd been working in like this startup medical device company for like five or six years and were like super burned out would like, I am the lady I worked for who was the COO and be like, can she tone that down at all? Like, is she going to? she can be that perky all day and i was that perky all day every day for like three years and they were like she was like i'm absolutely not having her tone that down like the customers love talking to her she's the only one here who's happy to talk to people uh, no that that was why they hired me because i had i could fake being happy from, from working at in and out for so long uh you can. i'm not really smiling right now i'm really dead it. I, I, I do miss it i'm not gonna lie but <laughs> It's like, I don't know. It's just for me, it was super easy. And then I found a way to like monetize it. And like, I still use it to this day. Oh, wow. Fun. Good job. You win yeah. so hard. 
Where, what was I thinking? What were you thinking? I've always been like this. I was running around all super enthusiastically trying to convince my parents to get me a bike when I was six. Do your parents ever make you do that? Did you ever have to like create like a PowerPoint presentation to convince your parents for something? Uh, never. I had they to do that to if I had an allowance increase for my Christmas present, for my senior trip to France, like everything. I'm trying to think. I used to ask for a lot of video games. That was about it. But like, I don't know. I got I got my first job when I was like 15. Like, I'm also the oldest kid of four, so I was always I always had something to do to yell at somebody or to like clean something up. If that makes sense. Never I never got to ask them for things. Ah. Uh, well, I was the I was, oldest. And it was just me and my sister. And like my sister would be like, you got to go in there and lock this down for the two of us. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. I got it. Okay. I got it. How, what's the age difference between you two? Uh, four years. Okay. So that's the same as me. I have a sister who's four years younger and then a set of twins who are five or six years younger, six years oh younger. Gosh. Yeah. Twins. Yeah. They're boy girl twins too. That's not. And so like my little brother is actually like huge. He's way bigger than me. And uh, his twin is like the complete opposite of him. <laughs> that is so funny. All right. So on to the next talk. I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing us talking. We have uh, Gufran. I, are you in chat? Let's see. Let me look. Are you there? Did have at least drop off. Do not see, oh, no, I don't see him. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull, I don't want you to show my screen, now I'm good. All right, this, this is our last report. Show us your screen, Wade. <laughs> Just gonna see a screen. <laughs> Just gonna start right. unnapping you over here. <laughs> my computer would break. Luckily, I'm running on tails, now I'm not gonna. <laughs> oh, dang. All right, it's loading up. All right, you're not gonna be able to hear me, so here we go. Enjoy the talk. Hello everyone, my name is Gufran Sali and I am really excited to be talking to you at GrimCon about my topic, which is when opposites attract, making privacy trend on TikTok. Before we begin, I just wanna set the expectations right off the bat. What this presentation is, is a demonstration of how TikTok can be used to meet young people where they are and spread privacy literacy, making sure that they're staying safe and secure online, regardless of the apps that they're using and how to be smarter about their choices. What this presentation isn't, is a commentary on TikTok's privacy and security concerns. I, as a privacy professional, am well aware of those concerns. I understand that there's a lot and it's very complex and there is a lot of issues that even I myself don't understand, but I wanna focus this presentation heavily on how I've been able to utilize this platform to be able to teach people a little bit more about how to keep themselves safe online. The, you know, you know, I can make a whole separate presentation about the privacy concerns of, of TikTok. Um, but a little bit about me, um, your presenter, just so you know me before I start, you know, babbling. I am a self-proclaimed privacy enthusiast. I graduated last year from Syracuse University with a degree in information management and technology. I am an avid listener to Pitbull songs. I'm actually a huge Pitbull fan. Um, so that's why he is on here. It, he's actually a big part of my personality and I just want all of you to know that. And I am also just a regular TikTok user. And I I try not to use the word influencer. It's not my favorite word. I'm a creator and a very diligent user of the app. I have been able to pick up on trends and dances and you know, you know, what's what's the sound that everyone is using or or what's the 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 you know dance that everyone is doing. And that's how you know you're a TikTok user is that you're able to keep up with those trends, even though the app is so huge and there's so many different sides to it. Like I think at one point I was on Lumberjack TikTok and now I think I'm on like, I think I'm on prison TikTok, actually. I don't know. I just, I, it, it changes over time. And I think it also um, changes with my mood. But um, before I, you know, had started my current job, I was actually uh, interning at a financial institution doing IT for them. So I didn't really know anything about privacy. This is all kind of stuff that I learned throughout the pandemic in my first job. And that actually is kind of rolls great into 
you know, my, my next segment of this talk, which is how I got started. So I was feeling extremely overwhelmed. I was learning so much. I was reading so much about data privacy. I was reading like literal laws and policies and regulations and trying to understand what exactly we were looking for in data privacy. And one of my escapes from that, because I got overwhelmed so quickly, was TikTok. Here's a little screen grab of my For You page. You can see I'm just scrolling through and liking videos. Uh, I get the rogue video here and there, so don't mind me if I skip any videos, but I needed a space to be able to creatively kind of push out everything, all the knowledge that was in my mind because it was building up to a point where I was like, this is, I can't handle this anymore. So one fateful Sunday in August, I, I posted my first TikTok and it happened to be about data privacy and it happened to blow up. And I used a popular sound. I, you know, talked a little bit about how to keep yourself a little bit safer in your home and when you're using your computer. And that TikTok blew up. I remember when TikTok was musically and it was just filled with floppy haired boys who were lip syncing. And I was blissfully unaware of any sort of privacy concerns or, or security concerns that TikTok had, or even like of what CCPA, CDPA, GDPR are. I had no idea. And now I was spreading my knowledge on this app that I loved so much. But that's the thing is that I, because I was a user, I was able to be successful in the app. So let me tell you a little bit about my recipe for a viral TikTok. And you really only need three things. Disclaimer, this won't work every time. The TikTok algorithm is a very fickle thing. Sometimes, you know, your most well thought out, most, uh, you know, well researched videos don't do as well as you want them to, but that's okay. Here are three things that you can do to kind of boost your TikToks if you do so choose to create them. I'm not saying you should, um, so that you can reach more people. So the first thing I always use is a trending sound, or if I can use it, if it fits with the, the subject matter. I have to condense all of, you know, my knowledge of data privacy into a 15 second to one minute video. And what helps, what helps the algorithm pick it up is a sound that's already been used by a lot of users. It's just more likely to be shown on more for you pages. Trending sounds could range from, you know, an audio that from from an audio snippet from a song to an audio snippet from a TikTok that someone thought was really funny to anything. It could really be anything. I think a car horn at some point was a trending sound. Pick a trending sound, make sure it lines up with what you want to convey and use it. The next thing is concise fun facts. You never want to get too technical. You never want to use lar like large words or, or jargon that someone might not understand. I am my target audience is 13 to 24 year olds. I don't think they're going to know every single term that I use as a privacy professional. So keep it high level and encourage conversation in the comments. I think that that was my biggest thing is that I would talk about something at a very high level, very rudimentary so that everyone was able to get it. And then I would get questions in the comments and I'd be able to engage. The last thing, a sense of humor. <laughs> I think I have a great sense of humor. Not everyone thinks that I think I do, but TikTok is all about having fun and sharing laughs. Um, and you just need to let go of any sort of seriousness so that people can see that, you know, yes, you're a privacy professional or a security professional, but you can have fun. You can talk about this subject in a way that's fun and, and engaging and you're really able to understand it. Um, so if you bring humor into it, you're golden. I'm pretty sure, you know, they'll respond well to it. I, I, I think they have for me. I, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Who, who knows, really? So I actually wanna go into an analysis of a couple of my most favorite TikToks. So this was the first TikTok that, it's not the first TikTok that I've ever posted, but it was the first TikTok that went viral. It has 700, at this point, it has 798,600 views, 248,800 likes and 763 comments. So I will go ahead and play it. So let me let me explain. Um, so the audio, while inappropriate, um, was actually trending that day. I think I saw four or five back-to-back -back videos that used this audio. And the whole premise of the trend was to introduce yourself to your friend or your significant other's parent and talk about what you can bring to the table. And obviously, I had to talk about my mad privacy skills or my mad security skills. These are so basic. I'm sure that for all of you who are seasoned professionals, this is all kiddie play. But 
I was trying to talk to young people who might not know what a password manager is, who might not know that they should be muting or turning off their Alexa. These are all things that, you know, we don't really think about, at least as teenagers, I never really thought about it, but I wanted to bring it into this. So I had a trending sound. And in the comments, I started to get so many questions, so many like just questions about, you know, how, how what password manager should I use? What else could I be doing? Should I cover my webcam? But I started a conversation with this one video where I used a trending sound and I was smiling and I used very short actions that people could do on a daily basis. And so I think that that's why this video got picked up. Could be for another reason that I might not know of. Some people might like that scarf. I'm wearing it right now. I quite like it. So it could be the scarf, but pretty sure it had something to do with just keeping it simple, keeping it fun and teaching people something. And that's what these videos are about. Oh, it's playing it again. Let me go ahead and skip it. So my next video, this one was a little bit more well-researched, well thought out, uh, and it had 69,200 views, 18,100 likes, and 163 comments. This one, the premise of this one was just talking about the different data privacy regulations that exist worldwide. And I, you will see that I brought a lot of humor into this one. <laughs> So let's talk about this video. I actually did a lot of research on this one because I was already reading data privacy regulations for my job. So I kind of had it fresh in my mind of what the privacy policies were and what I thought of them. Um, granted, this was a long, this was a while ago. I think this was back in October. So I have grown since then a little bit and I would change my ratings just a little bit. But as you can see, I used a, a really fun song, Funky Town. It wasn't quite trending, but a lot of people did use it as background music. I was, I thought I was funny, maybe, I don't know. I, I referred to the US as girly pop, which I don't think I will ever do again. However, a lot of people did respond well to it. Um, I kind of incorporated that humor of like, what What are you doing? Or like, amazing, show-stopping, incredible. Like these are all like memes and trends and, 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 and vernacular that is used by young people. And I incorporated that because it's actually stuff that I use on a daily basis. Um, and I, you know, it was it was well researched, well thought out. It didn't do as well as the other video just because I think that this one was a little bit more long form. This one was a minute long, and longer videos tend not to do as well on TikTok just because you know it's you, know, you want to just you know see a video, like it, be done with it. See a video, like it, be done with it. Um, so I really enjoyed this video. I think that making it was great because I got to learn something, but also started a conversation. I had people in the comments asking about their own countries, asking why I gave readings. You know, they wanted to know where they could read up on it a little bit more, what their individual rights were. So it got people thinking like it's the, the whole purpose of this video was to get people talking about their data privacy laws in their countries. It's not about what I thought, even though I thought what I thought is great, even though it's just my, it's, it's my opinion. I'm a little biased, but you know, it's, I wanted to have people start questioning their own countries and their own states and their own cities and be like, well, what, what's, what's here and what can I know about it and what can I do? And so that was something really cool that I was able to do. And then my last video that I'm going to talk about is a, actually, um, it's about password managers. So this one was a little bit more fun to film. I was just dancing. There's not really a lot of talking. It's mostly just like title text. So let's take a look. This one had 22,900 views, uh, 3,651 likes and 102 comments.
this was one of my favorites to film and actually one of my favorites to edit. I saw that a lot of people were using Shake It by Metro Station, which is the song that was just played to dance. They just were dancing to it, just having fun, letting loose. So that's what I did. I mean, I jumped on the bed at some point, which I probably shouldn't have done, um, but it was it was a fun time for me. Um, a lot of people were using the sound to dance, so it was trending a lot. Uh, you know, the algorithm was picking it up and showing it to more people because the more you like sounds, the videos with that sound, the more it pops up on your For You page. I know that from personal experience. And I thought it was a really cool way to show off the importance of a password manager while also showing off my sick dance moves you know i i was concise i didn't you know they were not very long like three lines per caption and move on you want to keep it short you want to keep it sweet and then there was a call to action at the end where here are some of my favorites that you can look into and here are their prices these are free these are paid and that is how you know the, in the comments the majority of the comments they were just asking me what i thought which ones that i use which ones i recommend um and why i recommended them and it was another way to start a conversation. And that's what these TikToks are for, is to, for, at least for my brand, for my purposes, is to start a conversation and to get people to want to learn more. And I think that, you know, through these three videos and also the rest of the videos on my page, I was able to do that. And it was so much fun, so cool. I got to learn a new skill, like how to effectively communicate my facts, my very technical or very legal filled facts to young people, to people who might not understand these facts um, and be able to start a conversation. You know, uh, so to end it, <laughs> what started as a way to show my friends what I was learning at my job in a fun and creative way, it turned into creating content that was accessible, informative, and started a conversation. I'm honored to be able to use this app and to teach people to be more diligent about what they share online. Privacy is and will always be one of the most important things to us as people, as citizens. Um, we are granted our rights through our privacy regulations and as someone who has been the victim of you know, sharing too much online and seeing the consequences of that, whether that be through falling for scams or or just general kid mean stuff. Um, I had to learn and I wanna be able to use this platform to let people learn. This isn't perfect by a long shot. What I do is different and I still am learning and growing. As you can see from one of the comments from Be More, slight correction, very slight, but it was a good correction. It was something that I needed to know so that I can continue to make these TikToks and make them better. I enjoy this and I think that it is something that should be used more by privacy and security professionals. It doesn't have to be on TikTok. You don't have to use the platform if you don't believe in it. But I think that if you are passionate about teaching people about how to protect themselves, or if you're passionate about cybersecurity, there is a way to communicate that to get people to be more excited about it. I have had so much fun and I'm so glad that people want to stay on cybersecurity TikTok or want to stay on data privacy TikTok. It has made my life filled with color because, you know, again, this field is very, it's a lot, it's draining at times and it can make you feel like, oh, there's dead end to this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but moments like these comments like these make it worth it. So I hope that you've learned something from this, this presentation. And I hope that you know that this process, this, you know, making these TikToks, it's never easy. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of mental space. I myself am currently taking a break from making TikToks because my work is a lot and because it took a lot on my mental health, on my mental health, but I'm having a good time and I'm so honored to be able to do this every single day. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you're able to take something out of this. All right, let's hear it for yet another social media talk at an InfoSec con. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, that was so great. I hope you all learned something. I learned something. Did we have any awesome questions? Yeah, well, a lot of people are saying that you might convince them to install TikTok, which I'm a little afraid of TikTok. I haven't personally downloaded it onto my cell phone because I'm afraid of what it might do. But my mom, who won't even make a Facebook because she's afraid that like the people will find her, like the serial killers, um, she looks up TikToks all the time. I think on like their web browsers. I think that's one of the ones you can actually use on a website. You don't yeah, have you to use it on a phone. It. 
I'm not I entirely sure. Hello, hello, hello. I don't want to make myself at risk, but give me yours so I can watch it. I'm pretty sure my mom does it on the computer, so I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a way. I think she, she had her TikTok username in one of the videos. I think in, it's her name. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's just her name, Gufran Sali. At Gufran Sali, I believe will be it. I'll go ahead and pop that in chat. So we got we got some time to burn. Somebody, uh, should I start a uh, start a game of uh, what's it called? Who's Whatever it is, I'm down. I'm so competitive. Let's do it. I gotta beat you at something today. I gotta beat you with something. Period. Oh, that's 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 a good point. <laughs> I'm all petty that I lost the stupid quiz earlier. The red button is right next to the yellow button, and I don't know whose choice that was, but that was a poor choice. Dude, Steam won't even open. What the f? That's weird. It's like you're running too many applications. You're cut off now. You're done. Nah, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm gonna have to reboot, Meryl. You're gonna be the <laughs> yes, this would become the Meryl show. It already is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like, wait, that was so funny. He's like, no, shh, no, zip it, zip it. Well, I wonder if that's because I... make you presenter. Oh, there you go. All right, if I click on that link, can we watch your videos? We can, man. Right. What link are we discussing? Someone O sent and find the. Uh... Hi there. Um, this is just. I'm looking at my computer. I'm trying okay. to find the video. <laughs> can you hear that? Yes. What oh, is that? That was her videos. I'm trying to find the videos that she posted so then we can actually all watch them together. Oh yeah, let's watch her TikToks. Are you a presenter? Do I need to make your presenter? No, can I'm I... presenter. Can you see what? I, I can see I... it. No, now it's gone. Oh, now I can see it. Can you see both screens or just one? Just one, I see the TikTok one. Okay, good. Now you guys really see my bookmarks. I really wanna hear the one where she's criticizing everyone's privacy program. That looks amazing. Can you, if you can figure it out which it is. Well, she said the, the really good one was one of her first ones ever. So how many videos does she got? Okay. 62,000, 16,000. Oh no, it's this one. No, 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 go, go. Oh yeah, here we go. Wait a second, I just realized we probably shouldn't be playing videos. Why not? Well, I guess it's not during the talk because we'll get um if it goes on YouTube, DMC eight or whatever. The audio sucks because it's just playing through my speakers. Gosh. Well, right. what, are you afraid there'll be like explicit content? That one was definitely explicit content. I was more thinking of DMCA complaints, copyright complaints, because it's all going to be like famous music. We don't own these rights to any of these musics. <laughs> you guys don't need to see my screen. YouTube <laughs> will take that. Well, they're not going to post the in between show banter, right? That's just us, guys. Why isn't Steam working? So I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Ah. So we got 30 minutes till the next show. We could just uh till the next speaker. Davy. Davy. Steam had to update. Everyone in the chat, 
I don't think anyone else has really chimed in, but I mean, what are your guys' favorite tacos? So far we got fish tacos. I don't know what Wade's answer was. It's wrong though. We got turkey tacos. So, you know, these are the options in front of you. I'm surprised no one said like Al Pastor or like Carnitas tacos. Johnny, oh. how you, don't lie. How dare Someone's you? never eat a taco. Be quiet. I would consider, I would consider like a half sandwich, like two pe like a piece of bread folded, tacoed, if you will. Almost. If you a have never had a taco, we need to have an intervention immediately. Right. Immediately. That's going to be a today years old moment. I can't believe someone's never had a taco. Yeah, it's a little... We will fix that at Way West Tack and Fest next year. Like my my little California heart, although it is small and black, it's it's still offended for this for this person. Maybe I'm gonna FedEx them some tacos. All right, I'm installing Jackbox. We're gonna play around a Jackbox. Oh, sure. shut the front door. <laughs> are we playing uh, drop off? We're playing. Are we playing murder trivia? We could. Uh, which one is that? Number three. I, mean, I am horrible at murder trivia, but I like to think that I'm damn. <laughs> murder trivia is a gig. Oh, this one. I don't have the fibers. Don't eat cheese. Uh, so. That's a rough one. Meryl, what's your take on cheese? Are you- well, I mean, I love cheese personally. I mean, cheese is a great accent to a lot of things. I don't like just bite into some cheese by itself. I'm not one of those weirdos who's like, mm, just gonna eat this block of cheese like an apple. Like a charcuterie board or like a <laughs> cheese board, if you will, or do you need- no, you need You've got crackers, you got meats, you got like things like berries and stuff, but like, I don't just like bite into a cheese stick. That's weird. Um, you don't like string I... cheese? No. No, but I just think cheese needs to go on something to taste good. You could have a lot of good tacos without cheese though. A lot of fish tacos, cheese is yeah. optional because you usually have like a white sauce, like a guacamole cream sauce or like a, like a mango or not like a mango, like a fruit salsa on top. So, um, and whatever slaw is usually made with like a rice wine vinegar compound. So there are tacos where cheese is optional. Um, you can just take the cheese off anything too. Although the best cheese that goes on tacos is cotija cheese, for sure. What do you think? You're frozen. I you was reading the pinned message that was just pinned up there to make you're sure it was a still. You're all like. Um, when I think of like traditional street tacos, right? Like TJ street tacos, usually they don't come with cheese. I was trying to like think, really think they about don't. it. Because cheese uh, is expensive and you wouldn't get an expensive ingredient in a TJ street taco. Meat's more expensive than cheese. I think. Yeah, but you can't, if you have a veggie taco, does that even really count? I exactly. see those on menus and I'm like. Oh. Veggie tacos. Yeah. Cat, well, I guess there is. With some pickles. Uh, because cac, cac, a cactus taco, I can't remember. Can't remember the word <laughs> for what? it. What? Cactus. cactus. What the fuck? What, what? Oh, let's, let's talk about putting cottage cheese in your guacamole i'm telling you i okay no i was a doubter at first i have videos of me like i've seen them joke, so help me god if this is a joke i'm not gonna be happy i'm not gonna be happy but i got it from a real mexican okay they were like we don't put lime juice in our guacamole they don't put any lime juice at all and they whip out the cottage cheese and start spooning it in there and i'm like i can see how so it, good. that's some weird it's flavor so today. creamy and so delicious. We just we just lost seven viewers. <laughs> Good. They're all gonna go get some cottage cheese and put it in their guacamole, and they're gonna tell you that it's delicious. And you know what else? Oddly, really. Oh, wait, we got, there's actual questions there <laughs> about the guacamole. <laughs> no, not in guacamole, but in what about the talk? Polls. I'm trying to figure out where the questions are. I see the little question. There's like a little question mark next to their name, which means they have questions. Where? Oh, in not... the go-to webinar or? Yeah. Well, someone said says steak tacos, and someone agrees with me. It's fish tacos for sure. 
I think the fish, ta- uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you fish tacos. Fish tacos are good depending, but I feel fish like fish tacos, tacos like a carne asada taco, I would say is also like the default taco, right? Like, no, I don't like my carne asada and tacos. I like my carne asada and California burritos. What? Yeah, but you're not gonna get a California burrito anywhere besides San Diego. Oh yes, I can. Oh, we have an Alberto's here. Do you really? A real one. A yeah, real one. they actually have California. They have with French fries in it. Uh huh. Uh huh. With French that's, fries. That's pretty rare. Yeah. 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 And it's made. It's made with like because everyone thinks to to make it a California burrito, you're supposed to add all this extra stuff to it. Like real California burritos don't have queso in them. You can add it if you want, but they don't have it by default. Um, Sour they cream. Pico. They don't pico in them. People always don't pico in their California just burrito. Just like French fries, right? French yeah. fries, sour cream, I think is like. Take French fries and sour cream. And that's like, sometimes if you're going to get jazzy, some guacamole and that's like it. Oh, there we go. I figured it out. Oh, perfect. Fish talk. Oh, people are, <laughs> I found how to get into the questions. Can I pop this out? Show Someone tell Wade he's pretty. <laughs> I can't. Ugh, I hate this. So I want to know if your Mandalorian costume is going to be done in time for Halloween. How like how motivated are we to get this done? I'm not that motivated. It's too hot. Uh, so what people don't tell you about 3D printers is like they're super cool, but they are a lot of work. That is not like a an art. It is more of an art. Yeah, like to you have to level out the bed, and that takes a while to learn how to do that um and so like each one of those helmets like the upper ones these ones both take around 72 hours to print this the white one was the first one that i ever printed it's actually technically like eight different pieces and i glued together um yeah they do give us they are headaches just as much as i would say more than regular printers you're saying your bougie toy to make you bougie custom things has bougie instruction yeah, but like they, don't, they, don't the, the white one is huge the white one is it, it look it i put it there because it looks normal size when i put it on my head it's gonna like, like it's it's huge right so <laughs> it's not really correct that but, is huge The black one and the orange one up there are like, this could straight be movie prop status. Um, it probably take around a hundred to a hundred hours of printing to print out all the equipment. And then probably around like 200 hours of painting and sanding, if not more to, to do all that. Yeah, cause it comes out all grainy and liney, right? Yeah, you, but you can do a bunch of stuff to uh, fix that. So you sand it, you add other stuff on it. It's not it's not too hard. It's a good side project, right? For It's my hobby, per se. But then it got too technical when I started updating the firmware. And I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> You're like, now I'm just doing my day job and my hobby. And now I'm pretty mad. Pretty <laughs> yeah. The motors in it blew up because it got too hot in my office. And uh I had to replace those. There's so much like a spray paint, right? People are like, what are you up to today, Wade? You're like, I'm patching my hobby. Be quiet. Yeah, pr- that was it. pretty much it. Let's see, is Davey in yet? What's the difference? Oh, IP4 loopback. I'm looking, I'm actually looking at the questions. What's weird is though that like the question bar is tiny. I could yeah, barely. Yeah, I think I actually got with it and started putting them in Discord. Not nah, someone, YouTube, Workday, Jazzy. I don't know, whatever. Get rid of questions. We can shoot, should I start a poll? Sure. There are no polls associated with this webinar. Never mind. <laughs> you oh, there we go. The pa- no, I don't. I have no power. I have nothing. I have no power. You have no power here. Floor I am Heinzman Spelded. Do you know that movie? Name what, that movie. What What did you say? I didn't hear. I am Heinz with Spellbit. Seven years, I am trainer of Dolphin. No. What is that? Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Uh, dude, I haven't seen that movie since I was like eight. It's not an excuse. <laughs> it is an excuse. That... No, it's not. If it's a movie you've never seen, then it's an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so sorry for everybody. <laughs> Just trying to keep you entertained. This is the pre-con banter. (laughs) The pre-con. 
an actual show? Although we could, we could get a show going. We just make fun of each other and play jackpot games. What's What's interesting? I didn't realize GoToWebinar actually tells you if people are looking at the screen or not. So anyone out oh, there who GoToWebinar, if if your company uses it, they can tell if you're watching it. Oh, that is a. Uh, oh, you're right. Oh, how interesting. That's dangerous. Oh, I'm so glad we don't have that at Zoom. <laughs> You're happen. safe if you use Zoom. Everyone convert. I thought about uh, going and stream bombing the quality time with the BHIS and jumping in there on stream. You should. They threw us on the news one time. I should, but I'm not going to. Oh, Ralph is showing something I definitely don't want to. Web client doesn't have that. Uh oh. Let's see. Click to lower all hands. Davy, are you here yet? Not yet. We have a Davy in the house. Meryl, what's the next big? What's the next big cybersecurity thing you're learning? The next big cybersecurity thing I'm learning. Honestly, this is gonna probably shock you. So um, when I was a pen tester at my old place, we I, could, I didn't need to do a ton of sophisticated stuff to really outfox my blue team. There was really no point because um, I would just be beating up on them for no reason. Like there was so much low hanging fruit that like I did not need to get sophisticated with. I never Kerber roasted my old company once. Um, you know, so I don't have a ton of sophisticated like AD in my arsenal, to be honest. So uh, Active Directory is the next thing that I'm diving into getting really good at effing up. I'm really good at web app already. I'm really good at cloud. Um, some of my, fa I, I love doing the cloud because everyone's like, ooh, the cloud, we don't know where all the holes are. We don't know where all the places are to store things and to look. And I'm like, I know where all those places are. Um, but yeah, I need to do, I, I need to beef up on my network pivot quite a bit. So we're gonna be working on the AD here next and i don't know though i don't know what's going to come after that what about you uh i think i need, i definitely need to start learning more red team right because i'm like blue to the core but so that's a big thing and then another something i've been trying to focus on is deception based technology which is super fun right and like, honey nuts? like what like honey nuts yeah, like honey nets, but also like honey admins, um, like honey tokens and stuff like that. So I've, I've implemented some of them and they've always been super good to catch. Or even like a, a really good one was fake Active Directory objects, right? So like saying that there's a 2003 server at this IP address, the only thing that would ever touch that is maybe the other domain controller like checking in. Nothing should ever touch that IP address. And so uh, that popped all the time during the red team. That was the first thing because it's a low hanging fruit. And they, that's awesome. That was an Ooh. easy one, but other stuff. I feel like I need to know more red teaming to in order to really understand how it all works. And so that's why I kind of want to jump into that stuff. I've always mm -hmm. thought about taking the OCP too. That that's a really good one. Honey docs, canary tokens, right? Canary, red, the Ooh, thinkest. Yeah. Oh, they're they are my favorite. I've uh, done a lot of work with Thinkist and Red Canary, or not, yeah, Canary. Yeah, yeah, I worked Red. a lot with Red Canary too. Yeah, Red Canary too. I have a, a slew of shirts from them. Not fair, I never got a shirt. You never got shirts from them? Well, although I didn't do several con talks involving their product, Mr. Fancy Pants. That's not, I should have asked for a shirt. That's a good point. I didn't ask for a shirt for that, but it was an open source thing. It wasn't a product at that time. Yeah, 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 true. Um, it's actually still a really robust like tool people can use. <sighs> Unfortunately, its exploit modules are so common now, like it's been around for so long that a lot of that stuff has been um, like plugged into signature and heuristics based library based like AV mm -hmm. and EDR solutions. But it is very customizable. If you know your way around some PowerShell, because most of it is PowerShell, it's very yeah. easy to manipulate. I have had a lot of luck manipulating it myself. Um, and it does take me longer because I have to take each one 
like literally go into each folder, go into the atomics, go into the YAML, find it, and then alter it and then run it manually. So I don't go invoke T1573 or whatever. I literally just copy, copy the PowerShell ROM, plug it in because I get a lot more success with that. Okay. Um, does, does it, atomic writing have to be run as uh, admin? Some or, of the commands have to be run as admin, not all of them. Um, do you have to set execution to unrestricted or? Yes, you do have to set execution unrestricted for a good amount of them. Um, mm -hmm. I used to because, use, they used to have a Python automation via Python, a Python script with it that was super easy. That all you would do is you launch the Python script and then you'd give it the actual uh, like indicator ID and it would go run it for you. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, I haven't seen that in quite a I minute. They deprecated it from last I saw. Uh, so sad. Still waiting on Davey. We got seven minutes. Seven minutes. Or else is right. gonna give us a talk about the social medias. The socials? Actually, in case you guys aren't aware, I don't think they've announced it yet. I will be speaking at um, Wild West Hackenfest Deadwood part two of the rules of engagement series is coming. So at Way West Hack and Fest, I spoke on, um, it's called rules of engagement, social media hacking for hackers, which is again, not telling you how to hack someone's social media, but more kind of like the last talk we just saw, helping you hack around the algorithms that govern social media websites to help you get more visibility on the content that you create. Um, for those of you who don't know, before I came over to InfoSec and started hacking, I was actually a very successful social media manager and copywriter for a large hospitality brand. So I do know a lot about this space and um, I, uh, social media is one of the reasons I can directly attribute my success to. So I'm giving everybody all my secrets, show you how to do the things that I did, show you how to gain um, the visibility that I have. And so in the first talk, we kind of talked about like the three major platforms that I think hackers have the most success on, which was YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and some things you can do to jack up the algorithm and get your stuff to the top of their feeds. Um, here in this next one, we're gonna go around content creation, effective social media profiles, and personal branding, and how to create those and the keys that they play. And um, I'll probably be developing these out as more people want me to talk and more people wanna learn about social media, which is crazy. Like it's it's great, but astonishing how many of you really want to learn about like social media concepts. So I think that brand marketing is big too, even if it's just for an individual, right? Like honestly, your brand is well known. Like I think you're the perfect example for this, right? A year ago, it the, I would say you launching your brand has really pushed you forward and made you and helped and helped you. And I'm not saying you're nothing but a brand. You're awesome. But like, <laughs> but I don't, I don't want this to thing, right? Like when people are like, oh, she who acts going to be MC and Grimcom, people aren't like, I don't know who that is. Why do I care? Why is she special? People are like, oh, dope. Because that's, that's the power of a brand, honestly. Um, you can apply this to a personal brand. You can apply it to uh, like a thought leader brand. If you're a solopreneur, if you're a small business, if you're an SMB, um, actually these will generally work for just about any product or service that you care to market to people at large. If it's a message, if it's an actual offering, meaning like it's a paid service that you do, um, you can apply these concepts blanket. You can apply them across multiple industries. I do try to keep a lot of it cybersecurity and hacker specific because you guys are my audience. Um, but a lot of these concepts do carry over quite a bit. So if you missed that first talk, I believe the polished talks are coming soon. If you're not in the Way West Hack and Fest server, hit up the good folks at BHIS. They're adding people all the time. And uh, if you if you are interested in seeing part two after you see part one, uh, part two will be coming Deadwood in September. So September. Davey is here. Davey, can you hear us? I can, yes. Hi, Wade. Hi, Meryl. How are you? Good. Wait, how, are you? how are you? I'm doing well. I am passing you the presenter for right now. So the power is yours. Do not abuse it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Hey. Or you can take it down, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> I'm like, weird, I cut out early because someone took down the, the stream. <laughs> I feel like it was you, huh? I'm like, no. Nah. I'm a unicorn head. I would never do anything that evil whilst wearing the unicorn head. <laughs> Oh, that's gonna be good. 
go ahead and share my screen. Does that work? Go for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. We sure are actually curious working. what the talk title is because they don't tell oh, us. <laughs> Great. Okay. One second. So we're super excited to see it. My my opsec says Davy lives in Texas. Yes, I do. I'm from Dallas, but I'm in DC right now. <laughs> hey, do you love it? I'm considering moving to Dallas. It is a lovely place. It is my favorite place in the world. So anyone that has thoughts on Dallas, uh, I'm happy to kind of convince you or push you uh, into to making that move. <laughs> Probably gonna hit I, you up on the Twitterverse. I opened the In and Out in the Colony in Dallas. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's awesome. We were so excited when In and Out actually like made it to Texas. Yeah. It was this very, very big deal for everyone. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Reed wants to know if it's still standing. Does it? Yeah, still wait, stand? it, it <laughs> dude, we used to go to the Top Golf right there all the time. Oh, it's so fun. That's a perfect wait, you Top Golf and In and Out. That's the way to go. Right? Yeah. You I, golf, I drive. You I don't golf. Anything to me ever? <laughs> I do not golf. I drive. Defcon, I'll, I'll go to Top Golf. I'll go to other places. I do not. I'll mini golf. I'll drive, but I don't actual golf. I need to. I need to work on my drive. If I could just, if we were playing um, teams and I could just crush it off the women's tee like every time, that would be so perfect. You see all this Star Wars stuff? I am nerd. I'd rather stay home and play video <laughs> games than go outside and play real golf. I'll play disc golf. That's a whole other story. But. <laughs> We're gonna go golfing. I'm gonna bring a little camera. The Adventures of Meryl and Wade go golf. <laughs> it's gonna be me just hitting balls off to the side in the water. Wade's just breaking. <laughs> I played well, once. Like, oh, top top golf things yeah. at top golf, so that's that's where you can find me. <laughs> played once and it wasn't wasn't my sport. It wasn't my sport. <laughs> All right, ma'am. You have awesome. about a minute left, but we'll just hand it over to you early. Sure, sounds good. I will. Um, I'm screen sharing but i think uh i don't know if you can still see me right now it's full screen yeah, just we can see that. okay yeah, we can. but we're gonna go away okay <laughs> so um well great in that case i will go ahead and and start uh talking um so my presentation today is going to be on rebuilding trust after a cyber or disinformation attack. Um, so as Wade and Merle said, my name is Davey Nyer. I'm from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, specifically, I'm with the Defending Democratic Institutions team. And what we do is we look at how cyber and cyber-enabled disinformation operations undermine trust in democratic institutions. So we have a very strong focus on the justice system. Um, and, and the courts in the United States, and we work with them to kind of develop countermeasures to, to go um, and address these different cyber and disinformation attacks. But we also do study some of the other democratic institutions as well, um, including media, elections, national security institutions, and of course, uh, private sector companies in, the, um, in our democracy. And so our DDI team uh, is led by Suzanne Spaulding. She was the former DHS Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate, which is now the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at DHS. Um, and we work in close collaboration with the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Um, and so between Suzanne and the national security experts and the ABA folks that we have on this team, really what we're trying to do is uh, study, but then also kind of develop these countermeasures to help us deter and detect and mitigate any fallout from any sort of cyber incident. So uh, just a very quick overview into what I'm talking about today. Um, as you can see, this is just a, a image from one of our uh, pieces that we put out in CSIS looking at how to restore trust in national security institutions as a whole, um, why it's important to kind of rebuild trust and um, how you can actually go about doing that. And so in the context of this speech, um, I think it's just important to kind of at the outset say, you know, why it's important to be talking about rebuilding trust. Um, I think, you know, one of the main things is, is security and really cyber security specifically, um, it, it's going to rely on trust, um, whether it's the constant uh, 
information sharing and communication that we're talking about between the public sector and private entities and the larger American public to any sort of efforts that are trying to get people to engage with companies or or larger institutions after a cyber incident, um, really it's gonna rely on having that kind of trust to move beyond any sort of activity once it's once something bad has happened in the cyber realm. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we're really concerned about, and I think this group can probably appreciate it more than more than others is it is extremely frustrating sometimes when you talk about uh, cyber security and larger security conversation as an afterthought or as kind of a separate siloed conversation. Um, but really that consideration can kind of cut the other way as well. Um, when you're talking about a cyber incident um, or, or some sort of cyber attack, uh, sometimes the immediate inclination is to try to go and see what is the immediate cyber fix, what are the technical vulnerabilities that we need to worry about, without giving as much attention to what are the larger considerations of, of trust of that institution that we need to be thinking about, what are the things that are compromised beyond just that immediate uh, system, whether it's the actual processes themselves or even trust in the actual um, ways that the institution is operating that kind of need to be addressed. And so that's that's kind of what we're getting at with this uh, presentation and, and some of the work that we do at CSIS. Um, and so, you know, what this presentation again is going to focus on is pulling from our work with the justice system. So I'll use that as some of the examples. Um, I'll talk through about some of the things we're doing with the courts, with the judges to rebuild trust in those institutions. But I really do want to emphasize that the takeaways and the lessons um, for how the courts and the justice system rebuild after uh, different types of cyber attacks are really applicable to other institutions um, and other companies as well. So just wanted to kind of say that at the outset. Um, so in terms of just the recent attacks, uh, I just put a few of them up there and unfortunately there's a lot that, that I can pick from there. Um, there's obviously just a lot that we still don't know. So a lot of the initial investigations are going to rightfully focus on what were the technical vulnerabilities that need to be addressed or what were some of the reporting processes um, that need to be changed to make sure that this kind of attack doesn't happen again in the future. But obviously there's still so much that we don't know. So for any of the types of recent cyber attacks, um, there's always that concern about what is the real, the full extent of the information that was accessed, um, especially sensitive information. That was definitely a, a huge thing of concern for the courts with the SolarWinds breach. Um, of course, there's the, the issue of what is the full scope of the attack. So it's really hard to just say, oh, this attack was just for mere espionage, or this was merely just a ransomware attack. That's that's bad enough as is, but um, you know whether it's the issue of latent malware or any other sort of uh, you know undetected part of, of a cyber intrusion that we're just not aware of, um, that's always kind of going to be in the back of the mind and things that we we either won't know now or won't ever know really. Um, and then that kind of leads to the third thing, which really gets at why we need to talk about rebuilding trust, and that is the idea of the purpose of an attack. Um, it's really, really hard to discern what the purpose is, and oftentimes a cyber attack, even a hard cyber attack, um, can play a role in a larger information operation. So when we talk about information operations, the mind immediately goes to something like social media, uh, regular, you know, routine disinformation operations, which is a very, very big part of it. Um, but we also have to remember that these kind of hard cyber attacks also intentionally or unintentionally play a role in larger information operations um, because it gets people to start asking questions about how do we trust our institutions to protect our information or to keep us safe? Uh, what does this do and impact the trust between um, private sector and the American public or private sector and the government? And again, those levels of trust need to be very high, especially when you're talking about any sort of response uh, coming out of, of a cyber um, incident. And so with those kind of concerns in mind, um, there's two kind of initial big takeaways that I want to highlight. One is just, like I said, cyber attacks can be part of a larger information operation. Um, so not forgetting that part and not forgetting the larger scope of what an attack could actually mean or the consequences of it is an important mindset to kind of get into when you're thinking about how to properly build out cyber preparedness plans or any sort of recovery plan after an attack. 
Um, and the second takeaway is that, again, these plans need to be so comprehensive that they're looking beyond the technical solutions. So when we're thinking about growing institutional resilience, what are the other things the institution needs to do to not only make sure that they're a less attractive target for future attacks, but that they're actually able to um, withstand in a, in a, in a very, um, uh, in a in a way that's, I guess, able to, to get the trust of the public, how are they able to grow uh, from any sort of incident that, um, that faces their institution? And so just again, um, like I said, I'm gonna focus on the justice system. Um, the, the DOJ, the federal courts, the state courts um, have all, they, they were obviously worried and kind of on high alert about various disinformation attacks, especially in the run up to the election. That's a lot of the context in which we worked with the state courts in particular, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in a bit. But um, just wanted to highlight again that like even something like the solar winds hack, uh, where the DOJ was breached, and also um, a lot of the uh, the federal courts are worried because their electronic filing and case systems uh, were breached in that larger attack as well. So a lot of things I'm going to go over in terms of what their appropriate response was um, is uh, the things even though they were talking more in the context of pre-election, there's still kind of things that the courts are working through uh, currently. So a few kind of points that I wanted to make before I get into some of the examples that we're looking at um, is really just a few caveats about uh, you know who are the attacks, who are the attackers, who are the adversaries, and, and what are the types of attacks that we're concerned about. So I'm going to be specifically talking about um, instances of Russian disinformation operations against the court, but in truth, it's obviously not just Russia. There's a lot of other countries that are engaged in disinformation and cyber activities, um, and it's not just foreign adversaries. There are a lot of domestic voices as well that are that are unfortunately contributing to the cyber and disinformation. Um, that's going after some of our institutions. Um, the second thing is disinformation operations and cyber attacks really do exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities of our own making. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, whether it's the divisive discourse or even just our institutions not living up to, to our expectations, um, those are things that traditionally make disinformation um, sit well and kind of easily spread. Those are things that bad actors are are looking at that they're looking to target. Um, it's very easy to kind of jump on those societal vulnerabilities and um, start seeding, uh, you know, disinformation, amplifying, manipulating information. Um, so to the extent that we can kind of, uh, you know, take away opportunities for bad actors to spread that kind of disinformation by addressing some of those weaknesses and vulnerabilities of our own making, um, that is that is a huge step in the process. Um, and the last thing is there is this balance between people that are critical of our institutions versus actual disinformation or, or cyber attacks that are intended to weaken our institutions. So, you know, when we're talking about rebuilding trust, we're not saying or going after anything that's just critical of our institutions because that actually is important for our democracy. We need people to uh, constantly be looking to improve our democracy, constantly critiquing our institutions to make sure that they're better. Um, but that's not really what we're seeing with the disinformation that we're seeing from a lot of bad actors that are looking to actually say, not only are your institutions not great and they're not working, but they're irrevocably broken. Um, there's no way of, of redeeming these institutions and fixing them for the better. And so I'll give some examples of that, but that's really the kind of disinformation that we're worried about and the type that we need to kind of build plans around uh, to make sure that we're we're properly rebuilding trust after any sort of major incident. So like I said, there's kind of these harder cyber threats to the courts that you're worried about. So the hacking and leaking of sensitive court documents, altering data, protecting uh, any sort of sensitive information. And it's really easy to see how any of these uh, could actually be used in combination with or as a separate standalone disinformation operation or as part of a larger information um, operation. And um, you know, whether it's leaking, selectively leaking parts of, of real documents and, and putting them with fake documents or um, altering the data in any sort of way, um, it becomes really hard for the courts or, or really any institution to come out and correct the record uh, with real information once the bad information, once the bad or manipulated uh, documents or data has already been leaked to the public. 
Um, but now I wanted to turn really to some of that disinformation that we're talking about. Uh, so I, I like to start with this incident in Twin Falls, Idaho. This is from a few years ago. Uh, it was a situation where there was a young girl who was um, allegedly taken into a basement by Syrian refugees, held at knife point and, and raped. And it was just a very, very horrible um, story. In actuality, it came out later that um, something untoward had happened in this basement, but there were no Syrian refugees, no knife point, no rape. Those were all embellishments that have been added and exaggerations that have been added later, uh, first by rumors and then spread by Russian media. Uh, Russian agents from the Internet Research Agency have been pushing this narrative on state-sponsored media as well as uh, social media. And so here are just some examples of, uh, you know, the, the IRA, uh, IRA tweets kind of going after the prosecutor, going after the judge, really kind of pushing this narrative that the court was against uh, this little girl. They were siding with these Syrian refugees over um, the, the American citizen in this situation. And you, your immediate sense might be, well, why didn't law enforcement or why didn't you know, the courts come out and correct the record? And in this particular case, because there were minors involved, there were certain privacy laws in place, which made it such that um, they, they couldn't come out and, and share the real details or correct the record. Um, by the time they were able to do so, the disinformation had already been out there for long enough, um, making it very difficult to, to actually say what had happened. And by then, a lot of the damage is already done. Um, this is uh, also from that same situation. Secured Borders was a Facebook group that was posting about the situation, trying to start a rally and bring people out into the streets. Again, citizens before refugees, getting people riled up in the city, saying that the courts and the institution were um, siding against this little girl. Um, but again, this isn't you know a group of concerned American citizens that were trying to uh, you know, fix a wrong that had been done by the court. This was a foreign adversary coming in and trying to spread misinformation um, about what was actually happening in that situation. So these are the uh, some four narrative frames that we've seen with Russian disinformation against the courts. Kind of like the Twin Falls case, uh, we see situations where they talk about the justice system covering up crimes committed by immigrants. Uh, we see narratives about the justice system operationalizing a racist and corrupt police state. Uh, we've seen things about the justice system supporting and enabling corporate corruption and how the justice system is a tool of the political elite. Um, these are narratives that, similar to the Twin Falls case, are either spread on social media, uh, state-sponsored media, and in some instances uh, with higher ranking officials within the actual Russian government. And so, I bring up this case of the courts and the narratives that we're seeing for a few reasons. One is, as you can see from the four narratives here, um, they really don't play to any single political side. I mean, there's some that are, you know, you would associate with more left-leaning issues or, or trigger issues or, or right-leaning kind of issues um, that, that would... Uh, Kind of get people riled up on that side and we've even seen in some instances where in, in this one specific case you'll have um you know accounts weighing in on both sides of the issue even though they're coming from groups like the internet research agency um, which is all to show that sometimes disinformation is not intended to kind of prove a single truth but instead to kind of get people to um disengage to kind of feel like the institution as a whole is um, kind of broken or inept um, and, and really kind of get people to not just, uh, you know, not trust maybe this information, but also any other information that's coming out from the courts to correct the record um, or any other uh, verified institutions that are trying to speak on this issue. But the other thing that I really want to highlight here is, you know, not only is this just the justice system. We've seen similar narratives like this for other institutions as well. I'm just focusing on the justice system here. But these are really things that are happening every day. It's not just one case or one-off cases here and there. Um, disinformation and, and democracy undermining threats are constant. And so institutions can't really wait until that one big situation, whether it's uh, something like a Twin Falls, Idaho case, where it's just a big case that everyone's kind of looking at, or some sort of big cyber attack to start building their initiatives that are focusing on strengthening public trust. 
Um, those are things that, you know, even if an institution is uh, not thinking that they'll be caught up in some sort of situation like this, or they're not really thinking about how these larger narratives could play into what they're actually doing. In truth, these narratives are so pervasive and they're kind of already setting a foundation so that even if there is some sort of big cyber attack, it's really easy to kind of drive uh, the narratives around that cyber attack into one of these pre-existing narratives that have already been um, set up you know, well in advance. So a little bit about what we are doing with the courts specifically. Um, in the run up to the election, like I said, we, we did some state court workshops with the National Center for State Courts and the American Bar Association um, in partnership with the Brunswick Group and Exadec. Um, and really the, the point of those, we uh, brought in the state courts, um, we'd have like three to five states uh, come in per workshop. These were two day workshops. Each state team would bring in a, a group of people that included not just um, kind of their, their, their tech and cyber experts, but really their public communications folks, their judges, uh, sometimes the courts, uh, 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 the retired judges, bar leaders, anyone that they thought from their team should be involved in these kind of conversations about addressing and, and rebuilding trust after a cyber disinformation attack. So we ran them through a, a big cyber and disinformation tabletop exercises that kind of, again, brings in that combination of, of uh, an attack that includes elements of both cyber and dis like a hard cyber and disinformation um, attack. The next part was we uh, had a playbook development session where we work with the judges and the other individuals that are part of those state teams to think through what are the appropriate response mechanisms that we need to have in place um, in advance of an attack to make sure that we're properly prepared. But a lot of these states, they didn't have the luxury of just dealing with, you know, how do we prepare for this in advance? A lot of them were dealing with this, um, you know, at the time that they were calling in or had recently come out of a cyber incident. And we're really trying to think through what are the things that we need to think about to rebuild trust in our court? What was lost? Um, you know, maybe it was a specific type of uh, information was accessed, or maybe um, it was a, a disinformation around a certain case, but they really were taking a step back and taking stock of how did that attack really impact the trust and, and levels of confidence in that court and their decisions moving forward. Um, and the last thing that we did, which uh, kind of just helped our study, but really uh, is something that we've just constantly thought about, uh, we've done focus groups with how disinformation uh, kind of sits with different individuals, what their kind of takeaways are, what that means for their trust in institutions. And unfortunately, I mean, it does impact the levels of trust that individuals have. So um, it's not something that we can just kind of ignore and hope it goes away. There have to be active steps taken uh, to make sure that we're addressing any of the disinformation that comes up. So just a little bit on the, the playbook overview that we did with the Brunswick group and with the state courts. Um, I'll skip the first step just because, um, yes, it's great to build resilience before a cyber event happens. And we do walk them through that. But the point of this presentation is more, what do you do after, uh, after something, after there's a big cyber incident? And um, I would say, you know, steps two and three kind of blend together because yes, it's very important to identify the right team and response plan and create that response option. Um, I would say here that when it comes to right team, the main thing is making sure that just because it's a, a cyber incident, it's not just the quote unquote cyber people that are in the room. Um, there's a reason that we specifically have the, the communications team, but then also the judges or the kind of other allies of the courts um, or lawyers that are affiliated with that court coming in, because it is really an all hands on deck situation when you're trying to think of rebuilding trust or, or responding to a cyber incident in the proper way. And when you're thinking about the messaging and the best practices there, um, it's just as important to think about who is doing the messaging as it is what you're actually um, trying to convey to the public. So for instance, going back to the Twin Falls, Idaho case, um, you have a situation where uh, the judges and the law enforcement officials were not able to come out and quickly correct the record because there were privacy laws in place that prevented them from doing so. Um, so to make sure that you're quickly 
addressing that disinformation, some of the things that we tell judges, for instance, is we practice thinking through how can retired judges be brought into the conversation to maybe talk through procedure and process um, in a way that maybe the sitting judge might not be able to. Or how do you find kind of those unlikely allies um, that can kind of speak on behalf of the court and talk about the court's integrity of process um, and integrity of procedure, um, even if you know there might be disagreements on you know specific cases or decisions and stuff. Um, it's always important to have those people lined up and ready to speak on behalf of your institution as you're in that process of, of trying to rebuild and recover after a cyber incident. So with uh, companies that could mean um, maybe you know, other industry experts or competitors that, again, might have vested interest in, in being competition in other regards. But when it comes to dealing with a cyber incident, for instance, um, those could be folks in certain instances um, that you turn to to help with that messaging as you're rebuilding and coming out of um, out of an incident. So these are just um, a few of the specific examples I was pulling out in terms of like the actual communication uh, strategies and, and tricks that uh, you know, we, we tell the judges to do as they're thinking about how to rebuild and come out of a, of a cyber incident. So, you know, things like leading with facts and avoid repeating disinformation or kind of building those relationships with stakeholders, um, training and testing responses. All of those things are, are basically, I'm sure a lot of you have, have thought through that um, as you were, uh, you know, thinking about some of these issues. I will say the last one is particularly important just in terms of speaking clearly and, and easily when communicating with the public and media. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but it's something that we've had to always kind of re-emphasize, especially with um, the legal community, like don't kind of keep the conversation in, in like legalese and, and in the cyber context, don't kind of make the conversation too technical so that um, the public is not able to like engage with the concept or understand what's going on. So that, especially when you're talking about rebuilding trust is a, is a huge issue that we kind of keep emphasizing. Um, but then the last one is, is really important and the, um, the conversation across all the different workshops are somehow kind of steer in this direction. And that is um, how can we use civic education to help equip citizens to withstand disinformation and, and really help us in that um, kind of rebuilding and recovering process. So these are two of our uh, CSIS DDI reports um, that kind of detail the nature of the threat, go into a little bit of detail about um, you know, how you can uh, recover or, or build resilience against some of these threats. Um, but I do want to highlight that in both of them, you know, one of the key takeaways is the threat landscape is constantly changing, especially when you're talking about disinformation or cyber attacks against institutions. And so with that in mind, I mean, obviously, um, there's going to be technical solutions, there's going to be ways that you can try to shore up any sort of vulnerability, but you need to have something that can grow overall societal resilience. Um, you need to have a way that, you know, even if you're doing all of this pre-planning and preparedness to communicate with the public. You have to have a public that's willing to engage with you in the first place. You have to have a public that's receptive to any messaging that you're putting out there um, and, and willing to kind of work with you to bring you know, companies or institutions back um, after any sort of major incident. So with that in mind, I mean, that's how we've kind of landed on this idea that civic education and, and really a reinvigorated civic education that includes components of civic literacy, um, or sorry, media literacy and uh, critical, th critical thinking training. Um, those are all things that can be kind of added to, um, to help society kind of move forward after any sort of incident. This is not something that we alone kind of um, have been thinking about. Um, some major commissions have also similarly landed on these kind of conclusions. Um, the National Commission on Military and National Public, the National Commission on Military and Public Service, excuse me, and the National Cyberspace Solarium Commission um, both have strong recommendations in support of reinvigorating civic education as a way to support some of their um, major foundational uh, recommendations. They think that um, for some of their recommendations to stick and really take hold and be effective, you need to have that kind of uh, informed and engaged citizenry um, available as well. And so, you know, I, in the interest of time, I won't spend too much on this, but really, I mean, from the national security perspective, um, 
we strongly see there as being a way to integrate STEM education with civic education. They must reinforce each other. Um, and, and truly having that resilient uh, society is a way that we grow and, and fight and have that societal resilience against ongoing cyber and cyber enabled threats. Um, one thing that we constantly focus on is, you know, it's not just the important to make sure that we have the best and the brightest innovating and, and working um, in whether it's the tech industry or just larger cyber field in general. It's also important that all those individuals have that kind of civic consciousness, civic awareness as they go about um, their their day-to-day uh, -day lives and, and, and have their careers, especially considering the ways that those companies are kind of at the front lines um, and, and helping us either deal with any sort of cyber incident or are themselves kind of targets of um, cyber attacks. And so um, having that kind of civically aware public, both in the companies themselves, but also receptive uh, in the larger American public is, um, is definitely key. And so I think, you know, of course, that that seems like a separate tangent. You're like, well, that's great. Civic education is important. But how does that you know, help us when we're trying to rebuild or come out of an immediate cyber attack or cyber incident. Um, I did want to just point you to um, our civics uh, strategic dialogue series at CSIS. It's a public event series. Um, here are some of the events that we've had uh, with Justices Gorsuch and Sotomayor. Uh, we recently had um, FBI Director Chris Ray, uh, Microsoft's President uh, Brad Smith, and former DHS Secretary Jay Johnson, and what all of them have kind of um, really pushed in their in their differing speeches was something along the lines of how important it is for their industries and for national security as a whole to have that civically informed um, you know workforce, but to also have that larger um, you know engaged citizenry. And again, it seems like something that wouldn't come top of mind when you're thinking of how to rebuild trust after any sort of cyber attack. But in truth, I mean, civics is something that's been deprioritized so much over the decades um, to the point that, you know, right now, you know, the, the federal spending on STEM is somewhere around like $54 per school child annually versus for civics, it's around five cents per school child annually. Um, and this is in no way to say, you know, we should take away any funding from STEM or that we should kind of stop or, or slow that down anyway, because that is very critical to to um, enhancing our national security. But there are ways that civics can and should be integrated into that conversation, especially for cyber related STEM um, courses. And, and when we're thinking about how uh, companies and institutions um, you know, need to engage with the public later on, I mean, in truth, institutions that are able to be held accountable or are able to kind of um, interact or show that they're, uh, you know, engaged with the larger public, those are the institutions that are able to kind of garner that trust. And, and um, again, that's not something that can happen overnight. And it just kind of reinforces again that this is a conversation that can't happen after the cyber incident. This really needs to be planned out ahead of time um, so that, you know, God forbid, if you do end up in a situation where you're trying to rebuild um, you know, after an incident, you're in a much better position to do so. And so, you know, the, there are four kind of takeaways that I sprinkled in throughout the presentation, um, but I do want to end on this last one, which is how do you train to fight in the light? Um, it's something that Suzanne, our, our director of our project, kind of always ends on. She very eloquently talks about how um, you know, the shelf life of secrets is vanishingly thin. And so that's why we need to fight in the light. And what she means by that is, you know, we're moving into a time where it is increasingly difficult, almost impossible to keep secrets, especially with the types of cyber attacks or, or dis cyber attacks and, and breaches that we're considering today. Um, and even if we do have secrets, they're really expensive to kind of keep in today's day and age. So moving towards more transparent systems really is um, something that companies should think about anyway, but especially when they're thinking about rebuilding after um, any sort of incident. And I'm not talking about any sort of like radical, um, you know, overnight changes that, uh, you know, insist on some sort of transparency, but instead, institutions taking steps to actually um, you know, 
whenever there is a situation where they can err on the side of being more transparent, trying to do so. That's really difficult to do, especially when you're thinking about cyber. There's kind of this, um, this tendency to feel like you need to keep close hold to the nature of the, the attack or, or um, you know, some of the information taken or things like that. But in truth, wherever it is possible to be transparent, that might be the best course of action. Um, if for nothing else, I mean, yes, it does help rebuild trust, which is crucial, but that is also the way that the world is moving in. That's the reality of today's situation. So the institutions, the companies that are able to kind of lean into that and prepare for that and anticipate that better are the ones that are going to, um, to definitely thrive and succeed in the future. So uh, with that, I will stop my screen share. Again, thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing any questions you might have. Man, so as someone who works in intelligence, that like definitely hit me hard, right? And I want to like a comment that someone made to me early on working, he says, there's military grade weaponry being used against the public via social media. And I think this isn't hit on enough in the general sense of the population of how much that's really going on. And it scares me a lot just because of that. But that was an awesome presentation. You mm -hmm. should definitely look at giving that at other places. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we did lose Meryl. Her daughter needed some attention, so it's just me. Uh, if we have any any questions in the Discord, please let me know. Otherwise, I can talk your ear off on just stuff <laughs> for the next 15 minutes too. Um, I uh, posted the two articles that you did that you showed in your presentation in the chat as well, which I'm probably going to go read after this. Um, so there's the link to. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, what do you think is for a normal person? What's the best defense against these type of attacks? So um, one of the things that's kind of concerned us is, you know, when you're trying to talk about like what should be media literacy or what are the things that you need to do, it almost seems like you're trying to force some sort of top down solution of like, this is what you should believe, this is what you shouldn't believe, and this is how you should, you know, uh, think about these things. And, and that's why we've really kind of leaned back on that whole like thinking of a reinvigorated civics that also combines media literacy and cybersecurity awareness, basic cyber hygiene. Um, we're trying to find ways to kind of uh, put all of that together so that, um, you know, people are kind of, they're informed of the basics, they're informed of how to navigate their day to day lives in ways that are secure, like basic things like, you know, don't click on bad links or like don't, you know, constantly like or repost things that you're seeing on social media. Like those are basic things that we can teach to everyone. Um, but it, it kind of just puts that awareness in the back of people's heads. So, you know, you can still believe what you want, you can still search for the information that you want but you're kind of a more informed and engaged citizen. That's the kind of term that we we keep pushing. Um, so in terms of what is the, the big takeaway um, or the big thing that they can do to kind of protect themselves, um, obviously like, you know, until some of those bigger programs are, are established and built out, make sure that you're kind of aware of all the basic cyber hygiene rules and, and actively practicing them. Um, that I'm sure everyone on the in the group would, would yeah. say that, that would not be emphasized enough. Um, and then uh, in terms of the civic side of things, you know, we're not just talking about what are the three branches of government. We're talking about like what are the actual things that um, you know our institutions are doing, and um, you know how are ways that we can hold our institutions accountable. And if you're interested in those kind of things, um, there's the Civics Renewal Network and CivX Now. Um, both of them are really big networks that have education tools that really can kind of meet users uh, where they're at in terms of what they're interested in, what they're concerned about. A lot of different resources from a lot of different organizations that are there. Um, so I really just encourage people to uh, check out the resources there because it really does um, give you a sense of why it's important, again, to have trust in institutions. It uh, gives you a little better appreciation of what's maybe uh, what, why these are areas of concern, um, and and again, just gives you that sense of awareness. So as you're operating and navigating your day to day life, um, you're also just kind of keeping those basic security measures um, yeah. in the back of your mind as well. 
I love I love the way you guys are going at it with the courts as well. It's almost like you're trying to stem the disinformation before it even exists, right? You're you're not just putting a band-aid over it, you're solving the problem before it happens, which is awesome and mind blowing. Like I literally have the conversation of this with like friends weekly about hey, you shouldn't post this and here's why. So it just blows my mind that there's an actual group out there who's preaching it and I had no clue about it. And it makes it honestly makes me really happy that you guys do stuff like this. Um, yeah, I can't even like like I'm emotional. Oh, well, thank yeah, you for, yeah. for being <laughs> interested. And I will say though that one of the unfortunate things is so I mean even how we started looking at this is because um, Suzanne Spalding, who's the director of our program, when she came out of DHS, uh, she was there in 2016. So you know saw what was happening with the elections, the disinformation operations happening there. And so she really thought she was getting out ahead of this. Um, she is a lawyer by training and so really wanted to see, you know, what other institutions that are critical to our democracy could be impacted or, or could be targets of disinformation campaigns. So she started digging around. She saw where there's an opportunity for disinformation, hoping that, you know, she was getting out ahead of this. But unfortunately, I mean, kind of as you were saying, and, and some of these institutions they have been targets for some time they've kind of gotten in the crosshairs of um, other larger democracy undermining narratives so you know people think of the elections being the big times when you see disinformation pop up um, but in truth i mean it's just so easy and cheap to kind of yeah. win the disinformation operation that um you, you're seeing institutions uh kind of they're not they're no longer getting caught caught in the crosshairs they're becoming direct targets and so um you know it, it becomes all the more important that um institutions are prepared for that and again it's not just russia it's now a lot of times domestic voices that are doing it a lot of other nations have taken a page out of that playbook and are similarly spreading disinformation when it's convenient so that's another reason why we kind of lean back on that how do you build resilience side of things um, because it has to be threat agnostic. It's really hard to to detect where it's coming from at all times. Uh, how much research do you guys do into the actual like campaigns and like the, so like the Twitter bots and like actually mm -hmm. tracking them and stuff like that? Yeah, so it, it that's probably the hardest part yeah. just because a lot of the information that we used for even like that uh, the beyond the ballot report that I showed earlier. Um, those were accounts that were verified by the platforms or that the platforms identified as coming from um, the internet research agency uh, a lot of the accounts were those that were published by uh, the senate intelligence committee so we kind of have that 100 percent you know verification that that's who we're talking about in those cases a lot of times we can go and look into different networks um, pretty much thinking that they might be from X, Y, or Z bad actor, but we don't actually have uh, a way to verify, like if it's actually coming from an adversary versus um, a regular American citizen, which again, they still could be spreading misinformation, but the consequences and the way you respond um, could be slightly different based on where, you're com where it's coming from, uh, which is why we always have to say that this is the, the reports that we're uh, showing or the, the the examples we're showing are just to show, um, I guess, the, the types of disinformation that's out there, but we can never really make comments about the full size or scope or scale of um, of these disinformation attacks, just because we don't have eyes on, on what's actually out there. And that's one of the things that a lot in the a lot of people in the research community are trying to push for um, how to get just more timely data from the um, from the platforms themselves. Um, and and ways that we can kind of just do a better job of sharing that information so we can come out with some of these larger takeaways and raise awareness um with the american public yeah. um because, yeah we are we are greatly limited in the um the uh the abilities to kind of fully do a scan of um the narratives coming up against the courts for instance man so uh they're my uh, I live my life by like three basic quotes that my parents always used to ruin me, right? And one was like, uh, when in doubt, gas on. So like, always go for it. And then my mom always used to say like, life isn't fair. So I always just always remember that. But my dad always hammered one into me, which is believe nothing what you hear and half of what you see, right? <laughs> so whenever I read anything on there and I'm like, all right, half of that's true. But, oh, wow. 
You're, I'm going to, I'm going to have a lot of reading. That's probably the, the, the bumper sticker that we should have when we present yeah. things. Just have that, have that healthy sense of paranoia um, as you're reading things. We try to make it such that people are, are just paranoid enough that they're being critical consumers of information, but not too worried that they're completely detaching from being yeah. engaged participants. Cause that, that, that's, that's, that's the that. other bad consequence, right? Like that's, how you ruin a democracy by not having people fully, freely um, engage in society. So striking that balance is is another thing that's just tricky, but um, trying to trying to figure yeah. out a way to do that. Walking that edge, wow, awesome talk, uh, super appreciate it. And uh, I hit you up on LinkedIn. So if you ever do any more, I definitely want to know about it. Um, so we are coming up on the end. Uh, the last talk of the day, our closing keynote is going to be in four minutes. So if everybody wants to transfer all the way over to number to the first channel and that's closing it. Uh, Davey, thank you very much. I appreciate your talk. Uh, hopefully I'll talk to you again sometime because I'm super interested. Uh, everybody else, have a good day and uh, see you over in track one. <laughs>